Back in the day, my job was at a rural elementary school, teaching a bunch of first and second graders. Little humans full of energy and imagination. That's why, at first, I didn't give too much credence to their chatter about the silver ball in the sky during recess. Kids have vivid imaginations, after all. But the consistency of their stories had an unnerving edge. They all talked about how the ball hovered, silent, and then zipped away at an angle that no airplane could manage. But kids will be kids, and I put it out of my mind, until art class the following week. The assignment was simple. Draw something you saw this week that made you happy. Standard fare to let them express themselves. As they eagerly scratched away with their crayons, I walked among them, offering the occasional praise or guidance. That's when I saw the first drawing. Alien creatures with large eyes, elongated limbs, standing beside what was unmistakably a saucer-shaped object. I frowned, but before I could ask about it, I saw another drawing. A different child, a different part of the room, but the same entities, the same saucer. My stomach tightened as I hurriedly scanned the room. There were 14 students, and by the time I had made my circuit, I counted no less than eight drawings depicting the same beings next to similar UFOs. Each was rendered in the childish scrawl of crayon, but the uniformity was chilling. Trying to maintain composure, I asked the class, Wow, you guys really let your imaginations run wild, huh? Can anyone tell me more about these space friends? One of the boys, Jeremy, piped up. They're not from our imaginations, Miss Simmons. They're from the playground. They waved at us. The room seemed to shrink, walls closing in as other kids nodded in agreement. They had long fingers, added Lisa, another student. They didn't talk, but I heard them in my head. They said they're just visiting. My throat felt like sandpaper. I encouraged the children to explain more, grasping for some plausible explanation, maybe a shared dream or some group fantasy but their accounts were stark in their agreement, down to the details like the way their space friends floated rather than walked, how their mouths didn't move, but thoughts were implanted directly into their minds. That night, I couldn't sleep. Every time I closed my eyes, I saw those crayon drawings, the long limbs, the big eyes, the saucer-like crafts. I found myself wrestling with the absurdity and the terror of it, how could children, at their level of emotional and cognitive development, construct such a consistent, intricate falsehood? Plus, none of them knew I was going to give them that assignment, and all of them, without really looking at each other, drew the same thing. By morning, my decision was made. I gathered the drawings and took them to the principal. Mr. Jacobs didn't know whether to laugh or call for a psych evaluation of his teaching staff. Yet, his eyes narrowed as he looked through the stack of drawings. This is... unusual, he finally said, in a voice that betrayed an unease he didn't want to acknowledge. Parents were called, meetings were held. Officially, the incident was chalked up to mass hysteria fueled by childish imagination. The art assignment was repeated a week later, this time yielding an assortment of family portraits, pets, and superheroes. No saucers, no extraterrestrial beings with elongated limbs and large eyes. But something had shifted, something intangible. Recess became a quieter affair. The kids clustered together more closely, their laughter a bit more subdued, their glances toward the sky more frequent. In staff meetings, the event turned into an inside joke, a way for overworked educators to lighten the mood but not for me. I couldn't shake the conviction that something extraordinary had touched the lives of those children, leaving a mark on their consciousness that wasn't going to leave anytime soon. As for me, I found myself scanning the skies more often, at recess, on my drive home, from my backyard, looking for something I couldn't define, 
couldn't dismiss. I never saw anything, but the search itself became a ritual, a silent vigil fueled by a mystery that refused to be forgotten. The years passed, the kids moved on. I eventually left the teaching profession, driven by a need for change, a need to explore beyond the boundaries of a rural schoolyard. But those drawings remain with me, filed away, yet never far from thought, a haunting mosaic of crayon and mystery, of innocence touched by the inexplicable. And as each day ends, as I find myself inevitably drawn to the horizon where sky meets earth, I am reminded of the questions that still linger, unanswered, in the echoing silence of a playground forever changed. About 20 years ago, when I was in my early 20s, I worked as a window coverings installer in Sacramento, California. One day, I was sent with a large load of metal mini blinds to an active veterans hospital off Highway 50. I met the lead maintenance man, who thankfully loaned me a rolling cart to help make transporting my materials and tools a much easier chore. He then led me into the building through a maze of corridors and up a large service elevator. As we exited the elevator, I was pleasantly greeted with a completely empty hospital wing. I was happy to see that I had the entire floor to myself. No patients, staff, or furniture to constrain my mission. I could work quickly, without obstruction or distraction. The maintenance man explained how they just completed some seismic retrofits while pointing to some newly constructed drywall columns that concealed the brunt of their work. He said they took that opportunity to make cosmetic repairs, install new blinds, and give the place a much needed paint job. He then showed me a typical patient room and said there should be one blind for every window on the floor. He told me he would leave it to me and give him a call if I needed anything or when I was ready to leave. Last thing he said, in a concerned, fatherly voice before entering the elevator was, You sure you're going to be all right up in here? I responded, Absolutely, in my best, confident young man's voice. With a departing handshake, he entered the elevator cab. His question, and its tone, oddly hung with me as the doors and the whirl of the old elevator faded into a deafening silence. It was at that moment I was truly able to take in my surroundings. With the elevator to my back, I scanned the hospital wing in a clockwise direction. I was standing in the middle of a long rectangular room. Light and airy patient rooms filled the perimeter of the open room to my left. As I scanned right, the light quickly faded into an inky, opaque blackness that disappeared into a U-shaped corridor which, after a short distance, made a sharp right and another sharp right to end up back where I started. Despite the new paint, the place looked like it exited a time machine circa 1950, with those pea-green ceramic walls and matching asbestos vinyl floor tiles. It was at that moment that I realized this place was really creepy. But enough of that, I had a job to do and I got right to work. First things first, I walked the entire perimeter to get a quick survey of where things were located, popping my head into each room as I passed. As I got to the dark hallway, my bravery waned. Due to the lack of light, I presumed there must not have been any windows to address, but I pushed on nevertheless just to be thorough. As the darkness engulfed me, it felt like somebody plugged me into an electrical socket. I had never before or since felt the energy that surged through my body and immediately picked up my pace. Along both sides of the corridor were black rooms. 
After peeking in one, I abandoned my efforts for the absolute certainty that I was about to come face to face with something I did not want to see. I began to full on run the rest of the distance until I was back in the main hall. Luckily, there was only one room within the dark corridor that had a blind I needed to install. The entire time I was back there, it felt like I had a thousand spectators and I kept my eyes fixated on the doorway until I was done. The rest of my time in that wing, I was nervously on edge. The farther from the dark corridor I got, the slightly more at ease I became. However, I kept hearing distinct footsteps, bangs, knocks, a bucket being kicked and slid across the floor, muffled voices, and a phantom intercom that sounded like an old movie. With 100% certainty, all of these noises originated around me on that wing, despite there being nobody present. With each noise, I would pop my head out into the main hall, or say, hello, in what I'm sure was an uneasy voice. About halfway through the install, I finally stopped reacting, until I heard, hello, and my name, and I froze. Thankfully, it was the maintenance man, and I was super excited to see him. He asked how everything was going, and if anything eventful had happened. Not wanting to sound kooky, I sheepishly brought up some of the noises I was hearing. He abruptly said, Yeah, no kidding, this place is super haunted. I wouldn't work up here alone. He explained to me that the hospital had been an active war hospital, dating back to the 1940s, and there had been thousands of deaths in the operating rooms that lined that dark corridor. He also mentioned that an electrician walked out on them earlier that week after something back there ran up behind him and growled. We joked around a bit to ease the tension, and then he left me alone once again. The rest of the day was surprisingly uneventful, Things seemed to have calmed down, and I felt calmer. I do remember never feeling more relieved to leave a place behind than that place, but also being completely exhausted that afternoon, and crashing out to sleep early that evening. To this day, it remains the strangest experience of my life. Last January, I was between jobs, and I had just recently had a daughter, who was at the time about five months old. My husband had been working through my pregnancy, but lost his job. We were living at my mom's house. I have an education in psychology and some experience as a counselor, so I was looking for the best I could get. But the best I could find right away was a job working as a paraprofessional in the special education department of an elementary school in a nearby suburb. The position was unique to the virus times, being that they needed someone to just sit around in the computer room while the kiddos did speech therapy over Zoom. Don't get me started on how terrible virtual speech therapy is. But anyway, my job was to just walk around the school back and forth between classrooms and the computer room picking up kids, taking them to the Zoom room, sitting there for 30 minutes to an hour depending on the kid, taking them back, picking up the next batch. I was overqualified, we'll say. Some days of the week were scheduled tightly, and other days of the week I routinely had just two appointments. The school was a ginormous horseshoe shape, housing 700 elementary school children. I was located all the way at the far back on one side of the pre-K wing. It could take 15 minutes to walk all the way across the building and back when the kids I was picking up were in the older grades. Every day I would make this walk. In the middle of the school, across from the front office, I would always notice, and try to ignore, this strange rag doll with construction paper over its face, showcased in a display case. No bad vibes from it, but it just seemed out of place and random. 
It was there the entire five months that I worked there, never changing or having anything added to the case. Onward. Well, weird things happened in the computer room where I worked. The doors in the school use a key to lock from both the inside and outside. The doors do not lock automatically. You absolutely 100% have to manually lock them with a key. We are technically supposed to lock rooms when we leave them empty throughout the day, but no one ever did. So I just left my door unlocked when I went to get the kids. I would go get a kid in pre-K, so they'd literally be like two classrooms away, less than a minute to pick them up and walk back. My door would be locked by the time I returned. Sometimes I would be gone longer, but sometimes that's all it would take, just 60 seconds. I messed around with the door in my free time, trying to figure out how it was locking. The only conclusion I could come up with was that somebody was manually locking it when I was gone. I asked the janitor, because he was always around, and he said no, he'd never done it. I asked if it could lock itself, and he said no, it's not possible. So I came to the conclusion that somebody was messing with me, trying to teach me a lesson for not locking my door or something passive aggressively. Well, I don't play that, so I texted my boss, the vice principal, and I asked her to come talk to me when she had some time. I explained the situation to her, and she said that she was sure that nobody would ever do something like that. She also said she would have maintenance look at the door. That was the end of it. I come back after the weekend, and the door is broken, like off kilter on the hinges so it won't even shut all the way. I guess locking on its own won't be a problem anymore. The school did have security cameras in the halls. I wonder if they had any video of me pushing the doorknob down to check that it was unlocked before walking off, returning and having it being locked. Anyway, after that, there was a day where I went to get a kid out of his classroom in the pre-K wing by my office, but they switched up the schedule that day so the class wasn't in there. I shrugged it off, went to go pick up the other kid that also sat in there for this block, and then came back. There was another paraprofessional watching her own kids in the playroom nearby. So I asked her if she knew where the other class would be right now. She said she didn't know, but that she thought she had just seen a kid run in there. Maybe they were going in to use the bathroom. I said, okay, and I went back into the empty classroom. I have the other little kid with me at this point. There's a bathroom at the back of the class, but it's open. I walk over there, confused and check the room. I even look behind the door and there is no kid. I shrug my shoulders at the other little one and begin walking back toward the exit of the room. The bathroom door slams shut behind me. The other little kid jumped out of his skin. I tried to remain calm. The other paraprofessional nearby sees us out in the hallway, peering into the empty classroom, presumably looking very puzzled and a little freaked out. She asks if the kid was in there. I said, no, but the door slammed behind me when I was walking out. I trailed off, looking down at the kiddo with me, who was looking back up at me with his eyes as wide as ever. Probably just the wind, I say. The other para kind of looks at me crazy, but shrugs it off and keeps about her business. The kid I was with, I kid you not, whispers, it was a ghost. And of course, I say, no, no, I'm sure it was just because I messed with the door. You know, the obvious. Incident blows off, a couple of weeks pass by, and I'm in the empty computer room working on art for the walls. It's Wednesday, so it's an early day for pre-K, and all of the littles have gone home, while the real teachers are in a staff meeting. Someone knocks at my office door. Mind you, the door no longer shuts all the way, so I figure they don't want to barge in. I get up from my desk five feet away, and I open the door. Nobody is there. I look down the hallway, and nobody is there. I go sit back down, more annoyed than anything, and it happens again. At this point, I'm kind of fed up. I do practice witchcraft, and I've been doing so seriously for more than 16 years. 
but I have no mediumship abilities or anything like that. I don't deal with ghosts and spirits in my practice, but that's the reason that I'm not scared at this point. I ask the janitor if the place is haunted. Man, this guy doesn't skip a beat. And he says, oh yeah, Rodney? Rodney, yeah, that little boy, he died in there. They named that doll across from the office after him, you know? What the heck? I asked my supervisor to confirm this and she said, oh yeah, no one ever told you about Rodney, huh? I'm like, yeah, well that could have been in your ad. So at this point, I've become acquaintances with the school librarian. I ask her about what's going on. She says all kinds of people have had weird experiences. Night janitors have had things move on their own. One time, the top principal had an alarm go off, showing somebody was down in the basement at 3 a.m. But none of the outside doors had gone off and nobody was on video in the school at the time. I guess another time over spring break, the doll across from the office got ripped up in his display case, his head laying on the ground, which is why he has a construction paper on him now. No one on camera and nothing on the camera of the doll. Another staff member never believed in ghosts until she saw a little boy run into a classroom and then promptly disappear. That's about the extent of things that happened to me there but I became fascinated. Some staff knew of the ghost, some had never heard anything about it. Mostly, staff who worked on my side of the building had experiences. The other side of the building seemed like a whole other world, totally normal, no ghosts over there. I became the weird ghost girl, I'm sure, always asking people if they'd seen anything. I am not the person to pretend like nothing's going on so as not to stir the pot. No way. Of course, I'd never let the kiddos hear me. No one other than the janitor ever seemed to have heard of anybody dying at the school. But people who had heard of the ghost, or had experiences, did have their theories. One day, I asked a paraprofessional from another school in the district, because at a meeting, she mentioned that she herself had attended that elementary school where I worked. She didn't know anything about a ghost, but she did say that while she attended, a boy died at the school, in the wing, where I work. He had the flu and his heart gave out. It's actually a really very sad story that I'll just spare you, but she could corroborate. She said that they hung a drawing of him up in the hallway to commemorate him. Sure enough, among the plaques, there's this framed picture of a swimming hole and a mountain in memory of Ernie, not Rodney. I found a much better job and quit during summer vacation, but I did tell Ernie or Rodney or whoever in the silence of the computer room in the last week of school that if he wanted to, he could cross over, that he didn't have to be stuck at the school. I even had a sacred place out in the country where I believe the veil is thin and that he was welcome to come there with me. Like I said, no psychic abilities here, but I did drive out there on the last day and I put down a birdhouse for Ernie. I really hope that he's doing well. This is a true story of events that have taken place in my home. My brother-in-law tragically took his life in the barn of our family farm. Without going into detail, his death has caused a lot of friction, anger, and sadness for the family he left behind, with a big point of contention being his widow. She decided to have him cremated, but never laid his ashes to rest or had any memorial for him. Needless to say, my husband, the decedent's brother, has had many sleepless nights over this loss, including disturbing waking dreams. This tragedy took place in early March of 2020, and by late March, I began hearing and seeing some strange things. One early evening, while watching TV in our first floor family room, 
While my husband was upstairs and my mother-in-law was next door in her in-law apartment, I heard something that sounded like three faint knocks on the glass door that leads to our mudroom. I got up to see who was there, because it's common for other family members, such as my sister-in-law and her kids who live farther down on our farm, to come by unannounced. There was no one there. I thought it was strange, and I went upstairs to tell my husband that somebody stopped by, but they must have left before I answered the door. I thought about it a few times while I sat back down to watch TV, but I just dismissed the knocks. A few weeks later, my husband woke me up in the middle of the night, not knowingly, but by talking in his sleep and knocking on our headboard three times really loudly. As time has passed and I'm trying to recall what he said, the exact words escaped me, but he said something about his brother. It was almost as though he was talking to him. I lightly shook my husband to wake him up and to tell him what he had just done. He didn't believe me or remember doing or saying anything. As I tried to go back to sleep, the three knocks stood out to me because I had heard three knocks that one evening. Only a few nights later, I was feeling a little sick and I decided to sleep in our guest bedroom downstairs so I wouldn't get my husband sick. With the virus going on and everything, I didn't want to take a chance. I usually fall asleep early, so I was asleep by 9.30 or 10 p.m. Around 11.30, something woke me up, and when I opened my eyes, I noticed something shining on the wall, a reflection from somewhere. I kept trying to focus my eyes, because sometimes the light from outside comes into that guest bedroom, and I wanted to understand what was making the reflection. I got up and opened the bedroom door a bit more. It was ajar already, and I saw a flickering coming from the dining room. I was startled and I got a bit scared at first, but I decided to go into the dining room to check it out. Two slim white candlesticks sit on our mantel on either side of the Picasso that hangs above the fireplace. One of those candles was on and flickering. This had never happened before, and I started to think that maybe this was a sign from my brother-in-law. My husband was still awake, so I went upstairs and told him what I had seen. He was interested to hear the story, thought about it for a second, but then just dismissed it. I did not go back to sleep downstairs that night. I slept in our own bed, sickness and all, because I was a little frightened. I told my mother-in-law the next day what had happened, and out of the blue, she recalled that a few days ago, she got a knock on her door around 3 a.m. She got up and opened the door because, as I said, it's not uncommon for one of the family members on our farm to do something like that, although 3 a.m. would have been uncommon, but still, no one was there. She didn't even think to tell anybody about it, but when I mentioned the knocking before, it gave her a bit of a chill. We talked for a bit about what the significance of three knocks could be. I said three brothers, my husband, his middle brother, and the oldest, who was the one that was deceased. My brother-in-law also had three children. Days and weeks passed and nothing happened. Until one evening, down that hallway to the guest bedroom, the overhead light turned on by itself. I saw it turn on from my seat in the family room. This time, I didn't bother to tell my husband right away because he hadn't seemed to care much about these strange things that were happening. I got up and I turned the light off. Because I was thinking that it was my brother-in-law, I was no longer scared, but frustrated a bit because I didn't know why he would be doing these things for me to see when I wasn't even really related to him or all that close to him even though he lived right next door. The next night, I was getting ready for bed in the bathroom down that hallway and I noticed out of the corner of my eye a flickering. It was about 11.30 p.m. That same candle was flickering again. I went upstairs and woke up my husband to tell him. 
I took a video of it when I saw it this time, and I showed him the video. He came downstairs to see for himself. He thought it was strange, but he didn't want to talk about it, and he went back to bed. Nothing happened again for a while, probably a month or two. Then, one afternoon when my husband and I were watching TV together in the family room, he said, Hun, the hallway light just turned on by itself. I said, see, I told you this stuff was happening. After that day, my husband began to think that his brother could be trying to contact us. He called his other brother and told him all of the strange things that had been happening. That brother dismissed everything and tried to talk my husband out of believing that it was their brother. My husband still believed it despite what his middle brother had said. I saw the hallway light turn on again by itself a few evenings later. I saw the candle flickering a few more times, one night around 8.30 p.m. and the other times around 11 or midnight. Over the past year, my husband woke up three times having these strange waking dreams of talking to his brother loudly in his sleep. Once, my husband sounded like he was having a full conversation with his deceased brother about his nephew passing his driving test. I recall that he said, he's going to fail? And you know what? The next day, our nephew did surprisingly fail his driver's test. The last occasion I heard a knocking on was January of last year. It sounded like it was coming from the laundry room, which is near that glass door where it all started. But this time, it was only one knock. In February of last year, I started to think that having the ashes and doing something to honor my husband's brother was a must to stop my husband from crying most days and everyone feeling overall terrible about the situation. My husband, his mom, and his brother all needed closure, as did I. I spoke with the family member who had control over the ashes and she was not agreeable to giving some to me to make a necklace with. You can make these necklaces with a tiny vessel for ashes. I wanted to do it for my husband's birthday. I was devastated. But to our surprise and comfort, two days before my husband's birthday, he was presented with a beautiful engraved vessel on a chain containing a tiny amount of the ashes to wear as a necklace. It wasn't a gravestone or funeral service, but we were all really relieved and happy to honor him and put some of the hard feelings to rest. I still wondered why I was the one who saw or heard most of these things, but I do feel sometimes that I'm a bit of an empath. I react so strongly to my feelings of sympathy and empathy for living things to the point where I cry, get physically ill, or can't sleep, thinking about these things that bother me that I can't control like people in pain or animals dying. I also thought about why most of these things were happening downstairs in that hallway and dining room. And then I remembered, the dining room used to be their parents' bedroom, and there used to be a different way to enter the staircase to the boys' bedroom upstairs, which was in that hallway area years ago. I think my brother-in-law's spirit was in our house, and in his peaceful spirit naivete, found his energy in places that seemed familiar as a child. His parents' room, the door where he'd come in for milking the cows, or trying to make his way upstairs. I never thought there was any evil or scary intent. I believe my brother-in-law knew some things were left undone, unsaid, and that his family was suffering from the unfair loss of him, and was trying to put our minds at ease. Once we got the bit of his ashes, everything felt much more at peace, and our minds are now at ease. I don't think we'll see or hear anything else, except maybe a little reminder of him from time to time. The hallway light still flickers every now and then. First off, I just want to say that this has been ongoing for years. We were literally 13 to 14 years old when stuff started going down. 
I'm 18 now, and I have a lot more common sense, or I would like to think so. So please try and look at this from a 13-year-old's perspective, and try not to judge our actions too harshly. Also, this gives more context to the adults in our lives not believing us. I have ridden horses all my life, but have never kept them close to home. When the opportunity came to keep them five minutes down the road from my house and with my best friend's ponies, I was over the moon. Little did I know what was to take place over the following years. I will start this with a backstory. The horse I owned at the time came from a rescue that I volunteered at for five years. I was sitting down one day drinking a cup of tea with the owner of the rescue center, as we usually did after a hard day of mucking out fields and dragging barrels of hay to the 40 horses and donkeys that lived there, when she told me about a farm that was just down the road from my house in a little village that we'll call Trophy. She said that her father had built that farm and that he'd be turning in his grave if he found out who owns it now. Immediately, I was intrigued, so I pushed for more info. She told me that the man who owns it now is Elliot, who's a pig farmer. He murdered his brother-in-law, who was asking him to pay back 150,000 in debt. Apparently, he ground him up in a meat grinder and fed him to the pigs. He then moved those pigs two to three hours away for long enough so that when the police eventually tracked them down, any DNA would have been long out of their system. He was actually charged for murder, but ended up being acquitted by the judge due to lack of evidence. What's ironic is that he moved those pigs without a moving permit, which is illegal and suspicious as hell because moving permits are not that hard to get a hold of. So in the end, he got punished for the illegal transport of livestock and not for murder. She told me that although he was eventually found not guilty, everyone in the village knew that he did it. Now that we've got that out of the way, we'll go back to the farm that I would be keeping my horses at. I had known the owners for a while as I used to ride one of Annie's horses, my best friend that I mentioned earlier. Nothing particularly scary happened while I was riding for her, except once. We had decided to ride down a different trail that day, one that went past an unfamiliar farm. We didn't know who owned it and we weren't sure if they were friendly, so we proceeded with caution. All seemed fine as we were riding through the fields until the path came to a stop. There were gates and guard dogs in the way. We assumed we must have taken a wrong turn so instead of passing through the gates, we decided to carry on through the fields and around the outskirts of the farm. Unknowingly, we were now trespassing. The horses started to feel extremely uneasy beneath us. Mine would stop and shoot forward. Annie's started backing up into the brook that ran alongside us. Annie was hanging off hers, deciding whether to throw herself off before they both ended up in the ditch when I looked toward the farm. A man was stood completely still staring at us. I honestly thought he was a scarecrow at first and I had no idea how long he'd been there. He disappeared after about 30 seconds of making eye contact with me. For some reason, it made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. There was something so unsettling about him. A few minutes later, we finally got the horses under control. That's when we heard gunshots behind us. Guns are illegal in my country. Only licensed owners can have them. The only reasonable explanation was that somebody was scaring birds off their crops or shooting bunnies and they hadn't seen us coming. We went into a flat out gallop. We were terrified because if they really didn't know we were there, we could have been caught by a stray bullet. All the while we were looking back to see if any birds flew to confirm our theory. They never did. That shot was meant for us, to warn us to stay away. Later that night, we looked back at the map to see where our wrong turn had been. The gates were where the trail carries on, but who in their right mind would go past a bunch of snarling guard dogs? At any point, that man could have redirected us. Shooting toward us was pretty psychopathic. 
We didn't tell anyone that day, as we thought we would get in trouble for trespassing. But that's only where the problems began. When I brought Eric to the farm, things calmed down. There were odd scenarios that played out. Sheep were stolen, our ponies were let out, and a white pickup truck would be seen prowling the area often. But again, nothing too serious. That was until October of that year, when we would end up riding in the dark as the days were shorter in the winter. This particular evening, we were just goofing around and laughing, like 14-year-olds do, when we heard an owl hooting. It was coming from one of the fields that the scary farmer owned. I began imitating it, joking around, and not really expecting a reply, but it did reply. I found this hilarious and Annie began joining in. This carried on for about five minutes, which in hindsight was definitely a red flag. Any owl would have stopped replying within the first two or three calls, realizing that it wasn't speaking to one of its own. This one always replied and sounded louder every few calls. The longer this went on, the less owl-like this thing sounded. There was a moment where the noise almost sounded strangled. And that was when Annie turned to me and said, that is not an owl. We realized that we had just led whoever was in that field right to us. They could now pinpoint exactly where we were. We turned our flashlights off and ducked, trying to be quiet, which is difficult when you have a 1200 pound animal squishing through the mud underneath you. We decided screw it and we galloped the rest of the field back to the farm. What we didn't realize was that the weight of the horses had left deep hoof marks in the soil, leading straight back to us. We were freaking out as we got back, but the adrenaline began to wear off and we ended up laughing about it while untacking the horses. We were about to lead them to the field when we heard the crunch of broken glass being stepped on from one of the old greenhouses opposite the stables. It was pitch black except for the dull light coming from behind us, so we couldn't see anything. Immediately, we turned all the lights off, picked up a pocket knife that we used to cut hay bags open with, and hid behind the stable door. We waited for 10 minutes with no phone signal to call the police, but didn't hear a thing, scared to even breathe in case it made too loud of a sound. I decided to be brave and make a dash for the horses who were tied up outside, thinking that if I could jump onto one, I could get out of there quicker than whoever I might see. My eyes had adjusted to the darkness, so I could kind of see into the greenhouse. I shouted back to Annie, there's no one here, we're just being paranoid. Again, we laughed it off, trying to shake the terror that we had just experienced. It was only the next day that it became very, very real. The next morning was hot. The ground had baked and preserved the hoof prints we left from the previous night. However, there was something else in between them. Massive boot prints leading from the field we had heard the owl in all the way back to our farm. That was where the nickname Farmer Bigfoot came about. We told our parents, but they decided that we were just making drama out of paranoia and didn't believe us, and that was that. These boot prints started appearing a lot. We would skate on the ice where the fields flooded over in the winter. We noticed the prints a few times, stopping on the edge of the field where we would skate and then continuing in the opposite direction. We didn't ever see anyone watching us though. I lost Annie's phone in the fields one night we went looking for them in the dark. The next morning, footprints. Farmer Bigfoot footprints. Our trail started getting blocked off. First, a huge tree. I'm talking a couple hundred years worth of trunk and branches was brought down onto our trail. It was then set on fire after we cut ourselves a path through it. When we weren't being deterred, they seemed to give up. Until 2018, when huge mounds of rubble started being dumped on our trail. This time, the trail was basically inaccessible. We spoke to a man who lives on the corner, 
who told us that he didn't want to name the farmer who was behind all of this, but that we should report it as it is illegally blocking a bridle path. We tried to report it, but the council won't go near him because he's too scary of a man. This guy told us that we were being watched and to be careful. Now this freaked us out. But us being stupid kids, we stayed from 5 p.m. till 9 p.m. clearing a path through the rubble. We also wrote F.U. in stones just for effect. The next day, there were three more piles of rubble and our path was covered over. We were at a loss, so we decided to talk to one of the neighboring farms that keeps horses. Without telling us a name, she said, you have to be careful messing with him. Around here, he's known as the man who makes people disappear. And that's when it clicked. This whole time, we'd been messing with Elliot. Farmer Bigfoot was Elliot. The same Elliot who fed his brother-in-law to the pigs. No wonder the council wouldn't go near him. Again, we tried to tell our family, but nothing came of it because they thought we were just being dramatic. Things continued happening. Bones were left on top of the rubble piles. Again, I'm guessing this was to scare us. A whole herd of sheep were stolen. The horses kept being let out. The owners of our farm would never say who they suspected, but we all knew who it was. The white pickup would turn up almost every week. We started leaving breadcrumbs on our Snapchat stories, thinking if it was weird enough for people to screenshot, we'd have multiple witnesses if anything happened to us. We told friends that if we disappeared, make the police look at Elliot. We were terrified. It quieted down after a while, until September of last year. We had just ridden, and I was leading both horses back to the field on my own. It's down a dirt track about a two minute walk from the stables. I walked through the wooded area on the track, and immediately this smell hit me. It was vile and I knew what it was immediately. Death, literal rotting flesh. It was enough to make you gag. I put the horses out and immediately ran back to Annie to come and investigate with me. The farm owner, we'll call him Ryan, overheard me and went into the house to grab a flashlight. Annie has a weak stomach, so as soon as the smell hit her, she threw up. It was so strong and so disgusting. Ryan soon joined us and said, someone has definitely been in here. That just added to our fear. Annie had recovered from her vomiting fiasco and rejoined us in a search. Ryan then said, I really don't know what we're going to find out here, girls, but I don't think it's going to be an animal. Our fear meter was now at the max, but morbid curiosity drove us forward. After an hour of searching, we decided to unstack a pile of wooden pallets. And that's when we saw bags of white flesh. They were clear Ziploc bags. Maggots crawled inside the bags, but there were no holes, implying that whatever meat was in there had been rotting for a good while before it was cut up and put in the bags. It was the most surreal experience. After more vomit from Annie, we decided to call it a day reassured that Ryan would now deal with whatever the hell this was. We assumed that he would have called the police. We got home and cried to our parents, but again, they dismissed it. How the hell are we being dramatic when we just found chunks of rotting flesh in the woods? Anyway, Ryan is hands down one of the loveliest men on the planet. We always felt safe around him. But what we found out days later was extremely questionable. He didn't call the police. He buried the meat. He didn't throw it out. He buried it. What the fuck? We assume now that it's because he's old and vulnerable and he didn't want to get involved in anything that might put him or his family at risk. I still have no idea why Annie and I didn't phone the police. I'm guessing because we didn't want to cause trouble for Ryan. And no one else believed us, so why would the police? This is, unfortunately, I guess, where my story concludes. I know, how unsatisfying. 
I'm no longer at the farm, but I still have horses. My parents now believe everything I told them. I think maybe because I've kept telling them for the past five years. In hindsight, they wonder why the hell they didn't move the horses out of there. Annie and I are still best friends, and we reminisce from time to time about how we were stalked by a murdering farmer for nearly three years. We will never know what that meat was, or if Elliot had anything to do with it, nor will we know why he followed us all those years, trying to stop us from riding down our very own bridal path. But honestly, I'm not sure I want to know. I'm really just telling this story as a way to vent, because I'm in a situation where I really just feel stuck. I've tried just about everything, so I guess I'm just gonna start from the beginning. This story is two years in the making, so I'll try to be as thorough as possible. In 2019, I graduated with my master's degree and moved to a relatively rural area for my PhD. Thinking we'd make an investment, my dad and I purchased a house. The intent was to rent it out once I completed my PhD. This house was only a block away from a dive bar where my dad was able to make some pretty good friends. He introduced me to everyone and everyone let me know that I would be so happy in my new house because my next door neighbor was the absolute nicest guy you could ever meet. So we met the neighbor and he did seem nice enough. He suggested that we exchange numbers, just in case I ever needed anything, and I thought that was a good idea. What's the worst that could happen? A few days later, my dad left to go back to his home in another state, and I was left to my own devices. Literally the day after he left, it started. My neighbor texted me while I was away and let me know that he left a gift for me on my front porch. In this text exchange, he started using pet names like Sweetie and Cutie. I went home and he had left a hand-painted feeding dish for my cats in my mailbox. At this point, I wasn't that alarmed. He was just being nice, I thought. The next day, he sent me more texts with pet names and I took the opportunity to make sure he knew that I was not interested in anything romantic. He replied back with a rambling text about how all a person ever needs is friends and he would just like to be friends with me. After that, he would send me texts frequently. Everything from inviting me fishing to telling me that he left more gifts on my porch. I would often not reply or I would tell him that I was busy. I didn't want to be rude, but I also had no interest in any sort of relationship with him other than being neighborly. One night, I got a text from the manager of the bar down the street, letting me know that if my neighbor knocked on my door, I shouldn't answer. She then told me that my neighbor had walked down to the bar with a hatchet and told the bartender he was hearing voices that got louder as he got closer to the bar. He threatened to kill someone with the hatchet if the voices didn't stop. They called the police and the police took the hatchet from him but made no arrest. The manager of the bar picked me up and I spent the night at her house. She told me that the police said my neighbor was heavy into meth. After that, I tried to keep my distance even more, but things got weirder. One day, I went out to my car and I found a dead squirrel in my driveway. The squirrel had very clearly been run over and moved to right in front of my driver's side door. I just stepped over it, got in my car and left. When I returned home, the squirrel was gone. Shortly after, I received a text from my neighbor that said, someone or something put a dead squirrel in your driveway. Don't worry, I moved it for you. I felt like this was a weird way to word this, and I suspect he's the one who put the squirrel in the driveway. Another time, I walked out of my house to see that he had placed an unspent shotgun shell on the bricks in front of his yard. He came out and told me that it was to serve as a warning for anyone walking between our houses. For the next couple of months, I did my best to avoid him. He would text me inviting me over and I would come up with an excuse or just ignore him completely. 
I wanted to remain cordial since he was my neighbor, but it was getting very annoying and I was uncomfortable. He would text me as soon as I got home, telling me that he was watching me come and go from my house. On Halloween, he handcrafted a large casket and wrote, here lies the last son of a bitch who played mind games, November 2012. I mean, what the hell, right? All this time, he's still sending me texts. Eventually, I got really fed up and I just stopped responding completely. Less than two weeks after I stopped responding, he threw a 50 pound flower pot at my front door. You know, those big concrete planters? Yeah, one of those. I called the police who advised me to get a stalking no contact order. A few days later, I was watching TV when a notification popped up that my neighbor was trying to cast a video to my screen. I declined it, twice. I filed another report with the police. During this time, I started the process of getting a stalking no contact order. I saw three different victim advocates who all told me different things. I went out of town for a conference and during that time, someone had attempted to break into my home. I had an ADT security system, so while they didn't succeed, I was aware of the attempt. After the conference, I came home to the entire world shutting down because of the pandemic. I was trapped in my home 24 seven with my stalker neighbor next door. Luckily, court proceedings for protection orders didn't stop. Right before court, he sent me a text telling me that he was sorry for what he'd done that he could tell when he saw me outside that he made me uncomfortable. Then he went on to tell me that he could tell my hair had gotten longer and I looked beautiful. I went to court and provided all of the evidence I had, the timeline of everything that had ever happened, the texts he'd sent me asking if I wanted a massage, the texts I sent him telling him that the way he was speaking to me was inappropriate, the text saying he knew he made me uncomfortable, I told the judge that I suspected he had attempted to break into my house while I was out of town. The kicker is he didn't deny any of it. Actually, he told the judge that he took full accountability for everything. He said he was in recovery and was trying to turn over a new leaf. He didn't oppose to the protection order at all. So in March of 2020, I actually received the stalking no contact order. Everything was pretty quiet for a while. I mean, he did some weird things, but that's because he's a weird guy. It wasn't anything that made me fear for my safety. That is until he started using again. At this time, we found an unspent shotgun casing in my flower bed. It was consistent with the one he had previously used to send a warning. This occurred a couple of months after I started dating my boyfriend, and I suspect it was a warning to him. After this, and for a variety of reasons, my boyfriend moved in with me. He moved in pretty quickly, but everything turned out fine. We're still together and happy as can be in our relationship. New Year's 2021, I was awoken to yelling. I turned on my security cameras and I got footage of him sticking his head out his window, screaming obscenities at my bedroom window for seven full minutes. It doesn't sound like a long time, but when your stalker is screaming threats and obscenities, seven minutes is a lifetime. He called me a harlot. He said, happy effing new year. He said he was going to blow up his house with his gas line. I called the police who responded. They told me that because he never said my name, they can't prove it was a violation of the protection order. The officer said, and I quote, there's nothing illegal about yelling in your own house they left without even speaking to him. All I could do at this point was do my best to avoid him. I parked on the street because my driveway is pretty close to his front porch. I got used to living with my curtains drawn. I always made sure my cameras were charged, all five of them. Yes, because of him, I spent over a thousand dollars on cameras. Every inch of my yard is covered. Since then, he's been seen by me and by other neighbors talking to people who aren't even there going outside and screaming nonsense. Things like, I have Cheerios on my necklace and other things. I'm not even joking. This basically brings me to last week. In the morning, I was getting ready for the day when I heard screaming. Someone is gonna die over this sweatshirt. 
I turned on the cameras. I got footage of him walking around the alley behind my house, screaming. Are you effing proud? How about I get my shotgun? I'll get everyone all fired up. I called the police. Once again, they didn't charge him with a violation of the protection order. Instead, they gave him an ordinance violation for disturbing the peace. The police told me that it seemed like he's off his meds again, and that was that. They left. Last night, I was awoken to hammering outside my window at 1 a.m. He was cutting down his privacy fence, horizontally. I called the police for a noise complaint and they just told him to stop. As I write this, he is outside continuing to horizontally cut down his privacy fence. That means the privacy fence only stands about three feet tall now. This was the one thing that made me feel relatively safe about hanging out in my own backyard, and now that's gone. All of this to say, I'm freaking tired. I just want to live in a house where I can be sure that my neighbor won't try to kill me, where I can feel confident that he's not going to try to break in. My boyfriend and I are trying to buy a house and to move, but it's difficult. I'm a PhD student, so I don't make very much money. Renting won't work because I have four cats. Plus my partner's cat and dog, although we have a place secured for them if necessary. And finding a place to rent with so many animals is difficult, if not impossible. I refuse to rehome them. So maybe it's partially my fault that I'm stuck in this situation. My dad has agreed to co-sign on another mortgage and I've gotten a second job. We should be able to save up enough money within a few months, but until then, I'm stuck. I just don't know what else to do. I'm tired. I'm angry, so I figured I would tell this story to vent. This isn't even everything that happened. It's just something to give you an idea of what's been going on. I'm just so exhausted. I thought this might be a good place to discuss the strange goings on in my woods with a larger audience. I'd like to preface this by saying that I am highly educated and scientific. I've never been a believer in the supernatural, Bigfoot, or things of that nature. That being said, I'm at a loss for the things my family has encountered on my property over the last seven years, and I would love to hear your suggestions. Here's my story. Seven years ago, my wife and I purchased a property and 11 acres of woods in a rural part of northeastern Minnesota. The woods were connected to larger acreage, fields and woods, of about 160 acres. And although sparsely populated, the land is near a fairly busy state highway. There are some housing developments in the area but they're three to four miles away, and the majority of the land all around our property is farm, fields, woods, and rivers. It's remote, but with towns so close that I wouldn't call it wild by any means. I'm mentioning this because I've heard many Native American legends of things in the deep northern woods of Minnesota and Canada, but the area in which we live is not that. Rural, yes, but not the endless north woods. As I said earlier, I'm not a believer in the supernatural, and I've never been afraid of the woods or the outdoors, even though I have a healthy sense of caution and respect for large bears, moose, wolves, other potentially dangerous wildlife. I'm also an avid hunter and mountaineer, and I've experienced many nights in the wilderness. I've had numerous encounters with dangerous animals and situations, so I'm not easily spooked. Knowing my state of mind is important to the story, because many so-called supernatural encounters can be explained by people with an already high level of belief, anxiety, or fear. But that's not me. Well, that all changed after the first few weeks of moving in. The house and land had been abandoned for a couple of years due to foreclosure, so a lot of work needed to be done to get it back into shape. Wildlife had grown accustomed to no human presence, 
and black bear frequently roamed the yard at night, along with many other woodland creatures. We also found a lot of animal bones scattered throughout the woods, and coyotes were abundant. One night during those first few weeks, we had a rainstorm, and I was worried about a broken downspout potentially causing a basement leak. It was about 10 p.m., so I grabbed my headlamp and headed outside to deal with the situation. Behind our house is a fairly large swampy area that divides the woods. I had my back facing this area while fiddling with the downspout, when suddenly I had this intense feeling of dread. It's really hard to explain. It was like my body knew that something was back there. It was very unusual based on the circumstances. Never having felt this type of fear before, I tried to stay calm, and slowly I turned around to point my headlamp back toward the swamp. What I saw was something I still can't explain. Eyes. Numerous glowing reflecting eyes staring back at me. These were not eye reflections that you would typically see with a deer or other animal, since they were at different heights. And when I pointed my headlamp spot beam directly at where you would expect a head to be, there was nothing there but weeds and trees. When I turned the headlamp off, they were still there, and glowing as if a light was being shined. They did not move. They just stared through me. Needless to say, I bolted and ran as fast as I could back into the house and explained it away as deer or raccoons, even though I knew it couldn't really be either. Later that summer, I was sitting out on our screened-in porch that partially faces the swamp and connected woods to the west. It was approximately 11 p.m., when I began to hear what sounded like a bear fighting with or attacking a cow. Since there was a small farm to the southwest of my property, I assumed that perhaps a cow had wandered into the woods and been attacked by a bear. I really didn't know if this was something a bear would actually do, but it was my only guess based on the sounds I was hearing at the time. It was clearly some kind of roar, like a bear, but then followed by a frantic sounding cow mooing thing. This went on for over an hour and it was perhaps one of the most horrible sounds I have ever heard. Even though it sounded so strange and almost supernatural, it didn't frighten me since I had this rational explanation in my head. Even weirder, this same series of sounds happened again the next summer. These first few years, I never really investigated the area of the woods that the sounds came from, since it wasn't my property. A couple of years later, I had the chance to purchase this area and 70 acres to the west, which consisted of the woods that connected to mine, as well as a few tilled fields, more woods, and ponds. As part of purchasing this land, I spent a great deal of time walking around on it to get a good understanding of its value and layout. As part of my walk, I was able to get a much better look at the farm set up to the south. The farm did have cows, as I suspected, but to my surprise, the area that they were kept in was a long distance from my house, much too far for me to hear them, and the fencing was also extremely well built and electrified. Looking at it, there was just no way a cow was wandering off from that farm. I didn't really think about this fact until recently. After acquiring the property, I proceeded to put up tree stands at various locations along with trail cams in order to prep for the upcoming deer hunting season. One spot was the hilly woods where I heard those sounds many years prior. Again, I did not connect these two things until now. The area was very odd, as whenever I hiked through there, I always saw some new strange thing. One time, my son and I found an old game snare tied to a tree, with what looked to be dried blood on the tree bark. Another time, we found at least a hundred-year-old tree, with a barbed wire fence completely spiraling the entire trunk 
growing in and out of it at different intervals. I've also found many tree trunks with very large scratches or claw marks, not resembling an antler rub. Perhaps a bear? We'd almost always find dead animal bones in this area, and even this winter, I found a couple of deer legs snapped and picked clean. My sons have found numerous animal skulls there as well. As I was saying, I put a game camera in this area since I had seen tracks and sign and I wanted to get a sense of the best places to hunt. I've placed one there many seasons and have yet to capture a single thing on it. Nothing. My son has posted there a couple of times for hunting season and has mentioned the strange sense of quiet. He's used to the forest sounds coming back after sitting still for long periods of time. But in this spot, there are never any sounds. He has mentioned hearing something walking around though. Another incident occurred one hunting season when I was entering this area en route to another stand. When I saw a violent thrashing in the foliage moving fast and crossing from right to left, but moving away from my position. I, of course, encounter deer and bear all the time, so I'm familiar with how they move when they're spooked. But this was something different. Whatever this thing was made a high-pitched trumpeting, combined with a bellowing sound that was like nothing I had ever heard from an animal outside of an elk, which we don't have in this area. It wasn't bounding, and there wasn't the raised white tail or large dark mass to indicate a deer or bear. There really didn't appear to be a body at all, just whipping and falling leaves and branches along with the deafening sounds. A year after this incident, my son went out hiking in the woods to try to find me since I was out doing some forest management. As he walked through this area, he thought he spotted me coming through the woods fast, but quickly noticed that the walk and clothing were nothing like mine. Whoever it was was also a lot taller than me, and he described him as extremely thin. He said the person he saw didn't notice him at all, and seemed to be walking in a straight line, like they had tunnel vision. Seeing someone in this part of the woods and their direction of travel didn't make sense at all there really wouldn't be a reason to be there or to be headed that way as it leads to deep ravines and an uncrossable river. After he found me and explained what he saw, I quickly went over to investigate to see if we had a trespasser. I hiked for quite a while, but I never found anything or anyone. If someone was there, they either got picked up on the road or vanished. That same year, my son had a friend over and they went for a late afternoon walk in the woods. As it began to get dark, they made their way back by walking on the edge of the field that's next to this area of the woods. As they passed, they said that they saw a figure a little ways off in the trees. Whatever it was, it was near one of the hills in this patch of forest and it seemed to be making some kind of hand gestures. It began walking slowly toward them. When they called out, Hey, hello? He, or it, stopped still and said nothing. It was at this point the boy sensed something wasn't right and bolted back toward the house. They rushed into the house and told me what they saw. I, of course, laughed it off as their mind playing tricks on them. My son described the figure as very tall, like 10 to 15 feet, but with skinny arms, and his body was dark all over. Not hairy, per se, but dark. They even thought it was an animal at first because of the weird way that it looked. He couldn't really describe it very well, other than gaunt or skinny and strangely dark. Me being the curious and protective father I am, was worried about it being trespassers or druggies or something, so I told them I would go take a look. They brought me to the area and pointed to where it was standing, and I headed into the woods. Since it was winter and there was snow on the ground, I thought it would be quite easy to locate the tracks of whatever this was. 
and find out where it came from or where it went to. When I got to the spot, there wasn't a single track or disturbance in the snow. There was no way an animal or a man could have been in that area and not left tracks. They had either made it up or their minds had played tricks on them, or so I thought. To this day, my son and his friend still swear that they saw it clear as day and I can definitely attest that their fright was real. My wife has also experienced strange thrashing sounds and other feelings of dread or being watched in this part of the woods and generally refuses to go over there anymore. All of this brings me to today, where I had a sudden realization that all of the strange sounds, sightings, bones, and events seemed to all be centered around this one area. I am just at a complete loss as to what it all means. It's all too strange to really bring this up and discuss it with people I know around here, but I wanted to share my story and see if anybody in this community might have any theories or ideas on what we might be dealing with here. I'll continue to investigate on my end, but I would love to know what you think. I had just settled into my comfy sofa, the long day's tension still clinging to my muscles. My hand found the remote, eager for some mind-numbing television. I pressed the power button, and the screen flickered to life. What I saw made my heart drop into my stomach. There, on the screen, was me, or someone who looked exactly like me. Same hair, same eyes, same nervous habit of tucking a strand of hair behind an ear. She was in a well-furnished kitchen, laughing with children who looked a lot like how I'd imagined my own kids to look. Confused, I jabbed the channel up button. The scene shifted. There I was again, this time in a business suit, shaking hands with another woman in what appeared to be a swanky office. Channel after channel, the story was the same. My mimics living out countless lives, each more divergent from my own. I watched myself as a firefighter, a surgeon, a painter, a prisoner, all coexisting within the confines of the glowing screen. My mind reeled. This couldn't be real. Was my TV hacked? Was it some kind of prank? A marketing stunt for a new reality show? But as I looked closer, I realized that each version of me was subtly different. Distinct expressions, unique body language, varying tones of voice. These weren't cheap manipulations or deepfakes. They were living, breathing iterations of myself, unaware that they were being broadcast to an audience of one. The original, the outlier, the fake. I didn't know what to call myself anymore. Frantic, I grabbed my phone snapping pictures of each channel as if collecting evidence of a crime I couldn't yet comprehend. I sent a few to my sister Jenna, waiting anxiously for her response. Are you playing some weird game with me? She texted back. No, I replied, my fingers trembling over the screen. This is happening right now, I'm freaking out. Her reply took longer this time. All I see are regular channels, Nora. News, sitcoms, documentaries. Are you sure you're okay? I wasn't sure. Not anymore. As days passed, I couldn't bring myself to turn off the TV. I was drawn to it, compelled to witness these alternate lives unfold. They were hauntingly fascinating, but also deeply disturbing. What did they mean? Were they alternate realities, glimpses into parallel universes where other versions of myself existed? And why was I the only one seeing them? My life began to unravel. Sleep became a distant memory, meals forgotten, social commitments ignored. The TV was a puzzle I couldn't solve, its enigmatic channels a labyrinth I couldn't escape. And then one evening, something changed. I flicked through the channels again, my eyes red, 
my attention wandering despite myself. And I stopped. There I was, or she was, rather, sitting on a similar sofa in a similar room. Her eyes met mine, a flash of recognition, or was it confusion, passing through them. For a brief moment, our lives converged. We were the same person, separated only by the glass of the television screen and whatever inexplicable force had entangled our realities. Then she did something I didn't expect. She picked up a remote and pressed a button. My screen went black. I sat there, stunned. My fingers trembled as they aimed the remote at the dark screen. Hesitant, I pressed the power button. Regular channels greeted me. News, sitcoms, documentaries. It was over, but the implications were not lost on me. That version of myself, that other Nora, had somehow ended the broadcast. She had the power to switch off her TV, and in doing so, switch off mine, to disconnect our entangled lives. I still don't know how or why it happened, and each time I turn on my television, I do so with a mixture of dread and anticipation, wondering if the fractured broadcast will return, and what it would mean if it does. I've gone back to my normal life, but the questions remain. Was I a spectator, or was I part of the spectacle? Did I witness a glitch in reality, or was I the glitch? Sometimes, late at night, when the world is quiet and still, I swear I can feel the eyes of the other Noras out there, all of us connected yet isolated, each pondering the same unsettling thought. When we looked through that screen, were we staring into a distorted mirror, or peering through a window to somewhere else? And if we were, what would happen if one day that window were to suddenly shatter? I can only wonder, and keep wondering, as I aim the remote at the TV and press the power button, my finger hesitating for just a moment longer each time. It had been a long day at work, one of those days where every tick of the clock feels like a jab to the ribs. All I wanted was to slide into the subway seat, zone out, and make it home. The doors whooshed open, and I stepped onto the train without even glancing up from my phone. But when I did look up, the world seemed to freeze around me. Every face on the train was mine. They were all sitting there, each version of me occupying the seats, gripping the poles, even leaning against the doors. Some wore the same expression of weary fatigue that I felt. Others were engrossed in books or staring at their phones but they were all unmistakably me. My breath hitched. Was this some elaborate prank? Virtual reality? My mind scrambled for an explanation, but came up empty. The train jolted into motion, forcing me to grab a pole for balance. My eyes darted from one face to another, each pair of eyes, my eyes, locking onto me with varying degrees of shock or curiosity. Next stop, 23rd Street, the intercom announced, but the voice was my own. The other me's began to whisper amongst themselves, each conversation like an echo chamber of my own thoughts. Words like glitch and reality floated in the air, merging into an indecipherable murmur. One version of me, seated near the door, patted the empty seat next to her. Hesitant, I walked over and sat down. Up close, I could see the tiny details that made us identical. The same mole on the chin, the same chipped nail polish. Any idea what's going on? She asked. Her voice was as familiar as my own thoughts. I was hoping you would know, I said. A heavy silence followed, punctuated only by the screech of the subway against the rails. 23rd Street, exit for Chelsea and Madison Square my voice announced through the intercom as the train pulled into the station. The doors opened, but no one moved. Who would? Stepping off this train felt like stepping off the edge of reality. The doors closed, and the train moved on. 
As the minutes ticked by, the atmosphere grew tense. Some of my clones began to pace the car. Others were in heated discussions, gesturing wildly. A few even seemed to be in tears. We were a microcosm of emotions, each one amplified by its reflection in the others. Next stop, into the line, the intercom said. That wasn't right. There should have been at least three more stops before the terminus. A collective sense of dread filled the car. The train pulled into an unlit station, the walls of which were pure black, as if they were made from darkness itself. The doors opened. On the platform stood another version of me, her eyes filled with a calm, almost serene authority. She spoke without boarding the train. This is where you get off, all of you. This is the end of the line. The other me's began to exit the train. I followed suit, stepping onto the dark platform. It was cold here, as if the very air was devoid of life. Is this... What is this place? I asked the version of me on the platform. She looked at me, her eyes like bottomless wells. It's a nowhere place between the cracks of reality, she said. And now that you're here, there's something you all need to do. And what's that? I asked. Choose. Choose what? Who gets to go back? A hushed silence descended on the platform. Go back? Go back to what? To being the only one? The only me? Only one can return, she continued. The rest will stay here, in the nowhere place. Arguments erupted around me. How do you fight for your own life against yourself? How do you prove you're the real one when everyone is a perfect copy? Then it hit me. The coat I was wearing, a new purchase just this morning, a coat none of the others wore. It was a small detail, but in a situation where everything was an echo, it made me the original. I stepped forward. I'm the one who should go back. I'm wearing a coat none of you have. It proves I'm the original. The authoritative me looked at me, her eyes softening. Very well, she said, and with a wave of her hand, the world around me started to dissolve in a swirl of colors. When I came to, I was back on the train, pulling into my regular stop. This time, the faces around me were their usual mix of strangers. Trembling, I exited the train and climbed up the stairs to the street level. As I reached the top, my phone buzzed. A message from an unknown number flashed on the screen. It read, Nice coat. It suits you well. I looked around, my eyes scanning the crowd. Then, I saw her, a few yards away, disappearing into the throng of people. Me, wearing the exact same coat, her eyes meeting mine one last time before she was swallowed by the city. Oasis Medical Center wasn't a place anyone would mistake for a retreat, despite its name. It was an old, rundown hospital built in the 60s, with updates so infrequent it was like stepping back in time. But a paycheck is a paycheck, and you take work where you can find it. I was an IT specialist by day, a position that often had me walking the endless maze of hallways to fix computers and other electronic equipment. The medical staff appreciated me, and I didn't mind the work, until I started noticing the faces. The first time it happened, I was installing a software update on one of the heart rate monitors in room 417. Leaning over, I glanced at the screen, waiting for the loading bar to fill. And there, reflected in the glass, was a face. Not my face, mind you, but a face I didn't recognize. Old, sunken eyes, hollow cheeks. A man, or what used to be one. I spun around. The room was empty, except for the patient, an elderly woman asleep in her bed. The hairs on my arms stood up. 
but I told myself it was just stress, lack of sleep, whatever. I shook it off and finished the update. The next time, I was in the surgical ward, calibrating a piece of equipment I couldn't even pronounce. I bent down to adjust a dial when I saw another face in the reflective surface of the metal tray next to me. A young girl this time, with eyes too big for her face, staring at me like I had done something wrong. I jerked back, my heart pounding against my ribs. A nurse walked by, glancing curiously at me. You okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine, I muttered, doubting the words even as I said them. This started happening more frequently. Faces in computer monitors, faces in the glass panels of medicine cabinets, faces in the reflective surfaces of surgical tools, always when I was alone, always when I least expected it. And always different. Men, women, young, old, eyes full of sadness, anger, or accusation. I couldn't ignore it any longer. I started digging through old hospital records, scouring news articles online, anything to give me some insight. What I found sent a chill down my spine. Over the years, Oasis Medical Center had an unusually high number of unexplained deaths. Patients who passed away under mysterious circumstances, with causes of death listed as inconclusive. Were these the faces I was seeing? Spirits trapped in the hospital, bound to the place where they had met their untimely end? I took my findings to management, but they dismissed me, saying that it was all hearsay and coincidences. They even hinted that if I kept it up, I would be let go. So I shut up, but I didn't stop looking. I was transferred to the night shift. Less staff, fewer questions. I spent my nights walking the dark halls, my ears straining for sounds, my eyes narrowed in concentration. I took to carrying a small pocket mirror, taking it out to glimpse reflections when I felt I was being watched. And that's when I saw her, the young girl, the one I'd seen in the surgical ward, reflected in my pocket mirror. She looked at me and pointed behind me. I turned around and there, on the computer monitor, was a series of numbers. Medical records, a date, I didn't know. I documented everything, started putting pieces together, dates matching records and news articles. It was like a grim puzzle, each face corresponding to an unexplained death, each one a silent scream, a plea for justice. But what could I do? I was no detective, no avenger of spirits. Even now, as I sit in my makeshift office, surrounded by equipment that should be devoid of anything supernatural, I know I'm not alone. The faces are still there, glimpses in the glass, flickers on the screen. Are they asking me for my help or warning me? I don't know. All I know is that I can't escape them. Even as I write this, a reflection not my own stares back at me from the monitor's glass. It watches me, studies me, and for a brief moment, I swear it smiles. So I'm left with a choice. Dig deeper, risk my job, my sanity, to give these lost souls a voice? Or turn away, leave the hospital, and hope that the faces in the glass are bound to this place, and not me. Each night, as I clock in and walk the dim corridors, I can't shake the feeling that my decision is no longer just about me. And in every reflection, I see eyes, watching, waiting, wondering what I'm going to do next. This happened in mine and my husband's first house, several months after our oldest son was born. We had lived in the house for almost four years before he was born, but had never experienced anything like this before. It's actually the only time I've ever experienced something that I would consider to be paranormal. 
My husband claims his grandma's home was haunted growing up. Either way, this experience shook the both of us in a whole new way. We had finally decided to move our son into his nursery. For the first six to seven months, he had slept in our room in his own bassinet, but we decided it was time to get him adjusted to his crib and his room. So we gathered the strength and made it happen. We had dug out the baby monitor that my mom had gotten us months prior to set up security, if you will. Granted, this was 1997, so they weren't anything fancy, but enough to help us feel better about our choice to move our son into his room. In addition to the baby monitors, we had put up one of those moving nightlights in his room, the ones where the lampshade would project the pictures onto the wall, moving ever so slowly. This one was made up of friendly sea creatures, and our son loved it. The first night that we actually slept separately from our son, we both woke up at the same time. My husband looked at me, and I looked at him, and then we listened to the monitor for a minute, but it was quiet. It didn't appear that our son had woken us up. So, what had happened? I almost just went back to sleep, calling it jitters. But my husband sort of grabbed my arm, not hard, but firm, and he whispered, What the hell? while looking straight ahead. Following his gaze, I could see that each of the four drawers to our dresser were pulled open. I turned on the light and we both hopped out of bed. It was around 2 a.m., and we weren't sure what was going on, so we didn't speak with our mouths, just with our eyes. My husband grabbed his military knife and motioned for me to follow him. I did, and he handed me another, smaller knife, which I held tightly, continuing to follow him, me against the wall, him in front of me, walking toward the baby's room, and leaving no blind spots as we did. When we got to the room, my husband opened the door swiftly, and with force, but quietly. It was just our son, fast asleep, no one else. My husband tells me to stay with the baby while he checks the house. I ask him to please call 911, and he tells me that he will as soon as he gets downstairs. He tells me he's going to shut the door, so when he does, I set the knife down, pick up my son, and sit. I was just rocking him, back and forth, staring off at the fun sea creatures dancing all over the walls. It was comforting. After sitting or rocking for a while, I started to feel a bit warmer. Not like a fever, but best described as how it feels when somebody sits really close to you. You can feel their body heat. While feeling this, I'm looking down at my son, debating if he looks or feels warm, but he looks comfortable still sleeping ever so soundly. Suddenly, a mitten on my son's left hand flies off in a way that it might if someone had ripped it off of him hastily. He wasn't moving his hands, and this hadn't woken him up, but it certainly got me up. I was now standing, breathing a bit heavier, and wondering where the heck my husband was. Moments later, my husband opens the door. It scared me at first, I just really wanted the sound of footsteps approaching to be his footsteps. When they were indeed, I was so relieved and I hugged him and I told him rapidly that we had to get out of this room. He wasn't whispering any longer, telling me, okay, let's go back to our room or even downstairs. He started to shuffle us out saying the police were going to send someone by. He said he checked everywhere in the house. No one could possibly be inside. He seemed to feel better but I was still afraid. We made our way to the family room, which was on the first floor, center of the house, really. You could see the whole area from the top of the stairs and from two of the bedroom doorways, our room and the baby's room. From where I was sitting, I could see the nightlight reflecting off my son's walls. So I watched them again. This time I was wary of the room though. I couldn't tell but wonder what the heck I had actually experienced up there but I just tried to keep my cool while waiting for the police. My husband asked me what I was staring at. I said, our son's room. Then I told him what I had felt in there. At first he sort of smiled, but then in all sincerity, he said, maybe it's a ghost. I said, excuse me? 
He didn't elaborate. Probably because of the loud knock on the front door. The police were here now, waiting for one of us to let them in. Long story short, there was no guy, no person, no nothing, at least not in our house, and not the surrounding area the officers had checked. It was a quiet night in our town. I wasn't having it though, at least not that night. I told my husband we should go get a hotel, have our parents and such search the place again tomorrow. He said he would stay at the house, but that he would send my son and I to his mom's house. By the next night, maybe it was even two nights that had passed, my husband had convinced me to come home. We were on the phone, and he told me that the home was fine. He had decided that we had just overreacted. For a bit, I guess I agreed with him. When he picked us up from his mom's house later that day, I asked him what he thought about the mitten incident the one that flew off our son's hand. He just smiled again, and I asked what he was smiling about. He just thought I had nothing to worry about. He said, think of it like a guardian angel or something. No harm has come of this thing, right? I told him he couldn't be serious, that if he thought our house was haunted, we should go now, back to his mom's. Then we somehow just sort of found a way to laugh it all off. By the time we pulled into our driveway, I was very excited to sleep in our bed, happy to be home, and I actually felt sort of silly for making such a fuss. My husband put our son down in his room and then joined me on the couch with the baby monitor. I remember laying there sort of nodding off as we watched some late night TV. Above the TV are the two bedroom doors. My peripherals are on my son's bedroom doorway but I'm only keeping it there in the event something about it changes. I was nodding in and out for a bit before I'm wide awake, sitting straight up. My husband says something like, whoa, what's wrong? But I just turn his head to the upstairs and he sees the same thing that I am. The fun sea creature light is spinning rapidly, or at least it's projecting as though it is. I tell my husband to go turn it off. Just as I do, we hear the sound of something falling. We know it came from our son's room because we heard it externally, but also through the baby monitor. He hopped up and ran upstairs. He heads into the room and he's gone for a minute. When he comes back out, the baby is in his arms and also the diaper bag. He calmly asks me to grab our bags, which were still by the door, and to follow him to the car. We get settled and he tells me that he's running in just to grab some of his overnight stuff and to lock the doors. Then he's gone. So I do. I lock the doors and turn the headlights on, just wanting to illuminate all of that darkness. My husband dashes outside. He's got a handful of stuff and without a word, he buckles in and starts to back out of the driveway. We start heading back toward his mom's house. I hadn't even asked what had happened up to this point, but about five minutes in, I had to know. He was checking to see if the baby was asleep, as though he could actually understand what we were about to talk about. It was sweet, but also a little unsettling, because he, my not scared of anything husband, was terrified. He said, we're going to stay with mom for a minute and then figure the rest out. Maybe sell the damn place. It's too small anyway. Sell the house? He just looked uncomfortable. Trying to get more out of him, but having a hard time with it, he finally said, It opened up his drawers. When I went up there, the light was going nuts, and his drawers, they were wide open. We can't stay there. And so we didn't. Sure, we got our stuff, but we never stayed there, and we didn't bring our son there anymore. In the end, we had the place blessed, handed over the keys, and haven't really looked back, other than to talk about remember when, which isn't exactly frequent. Basically, I don't miss that house. Not even a little bit. I used to work as a guide and then as a backup, and even as a field director for several wilderness therapy programs for troubled kids, 
in Arizona, Utah, and Idaho. They were all good jobs, but where I worked in Utah was in the West Desert, south of Dugway. It's possibly the ugliest and creepiest part of Utah. Tons of sketchy stuff happened to us out there. This story happened in 2005. The groups were camped in a really nice area for that part of the desert. It was called Indian Canyon. This spot was so nice, in fact, that in the late 1800s or 1900s, some enterprising pioneer family had built themselves a little homestead with a one-room cabin and a small barn and a cedar pole fence around the perimeter of that little farm. All of that, of course, now was a crumbling rotten ruin. The cabin, it seemed, had burned down well over 50 years ago, and what remained of the barn was poking out of the grass in two or three foot shards of gray wood scattered all over the nearby vicinity. This week, I was also camped in Indian Canyon, but farther down the road. I was manning the infield emergency response vehicle, or the ERV, better known as backup a new position that I helped invent when I took a list of things that had gone wrong in the field to the directors and explained that because of the horrible response time and spotty satellite phone service, the only reason we weren't shut down or the people weren't dead was because we were lucky, not because we were prepared or efficient at responding to emergencies. Now we had radios and someone listening to them 24 seven, never more than a few minutes away with a vehicle. That's how it worked in theory, anyway. One of the boys' groups was camped at the mouth of the canyon in the foothills, about two miles away from me. The other, just a mile beyond them. The girls were close, too. I was camped somewhere in the middle of the canyon, on top of a small ridge that had a little jeep track side road branching off of the main dirt road running up the canyon and the girls were just a couple of ridges over, maybe a mile away, though to drive to them might have to go back out on the main road and take a different jeep trail up to their spot, maybe a five mile trip. I was about a mile and a half below the staff training group that was being held by my then wife, Jessica. There were going to be several groups of parents coming out to visit their kids later in the week. So both the boys groups and the girls groups, all on that side of the mountain, had all elected to stay put for a few days and work on building backpacks and gathering fire sets and a lot of other primitive skills. The training group had been in the field for almost a week and they were getting ready to split up and go join the student groups for the last several days of their training. This left me with less to do than normal. I didn't have to find new sites for groups or drop anyone's water or food. Everyone was well taken care of and no one was moving for several days. I decided to build a sweat lodge next to the creek, up near where the new staff were camped. I found the perfect spot, well out of sight of the group, on a little smooth sandbar right by the water. I got to work. I harvested some long willow saplings that were bendable enough to weave a frame with and arranged them in a 10-foot circle digging down a foot and a half for each one to anchor it into the sand. I bent them into a dome at least four feet high and 10 feet across and wove the branches together with supporting crossbars until I had a structure that I probably could have stood on without breaking. I walked down to the truck, which I had hidden in some pine trees a quarter of a mile away and hauled a large bin of tarps and cowhides and plastic sheeting, along with my fire set and some other gear, up to the lodge. As I was walking back to the creek, I remember feeling like someone was following me, but when I stopped to look, I couldn't see or hear anything. It was a beautiful day for July. The morning had started out with some high, wispy cloud cover, but that had long since burned off and the noon sun was high overhead. It wasn't yet too hot, however. I was high enough in the mountains that the oppressive heat that I knew was slowly baking the kids' groups in the desert below wouldn't reach me for another couple of hours. 
I set to work placing hides first on my little domed frame. I covered those with some tarps and plastic sheeting and secured it all so that I had as close to an airtight and waterproof shelter as possible, with only a small arched opening for a door. I secured an old military poncho over the door so that once hot rocks had been placed inside of it, it could be sealed shut and the sweat ceremony could take place. I wanted it as hot as possible. There wouldn't be any children involved in this one, so we could go as hot as we wanted. I took the extra time around the base of the lodge to bury all the edges of the coverings deep in the sand. This was as sturdy a shelter structure as I had ever built. It was nice. I spent a good hour gathering sage and juniper and covered the floor of the lodge with a thick padding of the fragrant plants. I did this in part so that it was a soft place to sit for an extended time. But mostly I did it because I was intending to invite the new staff down to do a sweat ceremony later, to help some of them prepare to meet actual students for the first time. And frankly, a group of unwashed men and women who hadn't showered in a week in July, all crammed inside a sweltering homemade dome tent sweating buckets, is a smell that should not be endured without as much sage and juniper as possible. If it was really bad, which it was likely to be, I would rub some of it into my shirt and then pull it up over my nose and breathe through that. I went hunting for lava rock. I found an outcropping of some small rounded boulders, perfect for heating on a bonfire and then rolling into the lodge. And I proceeded to gather three onto a tarp. It was heavy, almost too heavy for me to sling over my back and carry, but I managed to make it back to the fire pit I had dug with all three. I left them there and went to gather more. I made this a smaller load because it's not like I was in a hurry. I could take more trips. When I got back to the fire pit, one of my rocks was gone. I just stared at the small depression in the sand where I had placed it minutes before and then looked around for signs that someone, possibly one of the staff from the group, had come and taken it. No tracks. I looked around again and spotted it by the edge of the creek, 20 feet away. I had that feeling again, like I was being watched, but I couldn't see anyone in the trees. I walked over and retrieved my stone, the heaviest one I had carried and put it back with the others. Maybe it had rolled there through flat, soft, dry sand? Unlikely. I gathered a bunch more rocks and none of them went missing. And then I built a fire. As I worked, that weird feeling came back. Only this time it felt more ominous, like it was mad at me for being there. I stood up, determined to walk out into the woods and find whoever it was. The radio, which I kept on and strapped to my belt, had been silent all day, but suddenly it crackled to life. Brian, in the boys' group, was doing evening check-in a little early so that they could do their day hike without having to stop and contact me. After we talked, I felt more normal again. I cooked some rice and beans for dinner, and as they cooled off, I piled my stones, probably 30 of them, into a cairn in the center of the fire, and then just piled on all the dry wood and brush I could gather. I took my knife out of my sheath, because that feeling was back, still worse this time. As soon as my fire became almost irresponsibly large, I saw someone moving fast through the trees, straight toward me. I tensed then relaxed. Will, a seasoned staff working in the training group with Jessica and Katie, came running down the creek. He stopped when he saw me and my sweat lodge and my 10 foot tall flames and broke into a huge grin. I thought it was a wildfire, he said. Some of the new girls are panicking. Nope, just an epic sweat lodge, I said. I was planning on inviting you all down for it when you called in, but I'll consider this your check-in. If you guys want to, you're all invited to come sweat. It'll be ready in about half an hour. Perfect, 
he said. They're just finishing up dinner. I'll go let Katie in just now and we'll be down. He turned to walk away. Hey, Will? He turned back around. Did you guys lose track of any of the new guys today? Or did one of you three come down this way? He thought for a moment and said, No, I don't think so. Why? It's nothing, I said. I just thought someone might have come looking for me when I was out gathering rocks. Some of my stuff was in a different place than I remember leaving it. That's all. He looked at me with an odd expression. Weird, he said finally. I'll ask everyone, but we've kept pretty busy today, so I don't know when someone would have had time to come down this far. It's okay, I said. Don't stress it. I was just wondering. See you in a few minutes. The other two kids' groups radioed me shortly after Will walked off. It was more like an hour before the staff group finally trudged into my sandy clearing. Some of them looked excited, and some of them looked confused at my dome of plastic and sand, and at my pile of glowing red boulders on the still blazing fire, and at the stack of blue five-gallon water jugs that I'd hauled down from the truck for the experience. We thought we were going to die in a forest fire, one of the new girls, Carol Sue, said accusingly. She looked extra smelly. I pulled some essential oils out of my possibles bag. A possibles bag is just a type of leather purse we make on the trail. We call it that to disguise the fact that we're grown men who carry around purses. Put some of this on your wrists and neck. It will help you keep a good frame of mind in the sweat. How many of you have done this before? A handful of them raised their hands. Inside of the circle of the lodge is a sacred place. We will do four sessions, going longer and longer each time. We will dedicate each session to a different part of our lives, our histories, our families, our struggles, and our choices. Try to only speak from the heart about these things. It will be very hot once we begin pouring water on the rocks, and the heat will make it very difficult to speak anyway. So only speak if it is important. Katie and Will were already rolling the superheated rocks into the lodge, using some long willow poles I had made. I gave Jess a side hug. The trainees didn't know we were married, and we had found it best not to let kids or people new to the wilderness group know because it could have become a distraction from the experience if they got caught up in our personal lives. So, side hug was all. As far as they knew, we were just co-workers. I took out a dried sage smudge and lit it on the fire and did the ritual smoke cleansing for each of them as they entered the hallowed ground. I made the last minute decision not to go into the sweat lodge. That last boys group had a student that was a little bit of trouble, and I was worried I would end up having to take an emergency radio call about a runner in the middle of someone's heartfelt speaking about their issues with their family or their past. Also, the smell. Also, something just felt off. This was a perfect spot and a perfect time for a sweat lodge ceremony, but it felt not wrong exactly, just off somehow. Instead, I whispered my choice and that maybe I would join the next session to Katie as she was the last to enter, and I sealed the door up behind them, burying the edge of the poncho in the sand like the rest of the construction. I stood by the fire for a minute or two and felt hot, so I walked in the water down the narrow stream about a hundred yards and just looked at the stars that were slowly becoming more and more visible in the darkening twilight. I stood there for at least 10 minutes, enjoying the changing sky. I heard a twig snap somewhere to my left, and the crickets went silent. There was definitely somebody away up there in the trees. I stared hard and could not see anybody at first, but there was a small dark shadow under a pine maybe 30 or 40 feet away. Too dark for this early in the evening. Was that a girl in the shadow? 
It looked like a small Native American girl with two long braids and some kind of headband. I called out to her, but she didn't move. She seemed to be glaring at me. And the longer I stood there, the worse I felt, like the warmth from the air around me was being sucked away. So I took a deep breath, and I did what I always do in the woods when something unknown scares me. I ran at it. Whoever was there took off fast, and I chased them. I lost them quickly enough, I'm not a runner, but I was sure they had been headed in the direction away from my little creekside sweat lodge. I must have gone an eighth of a mile, almost to the road, when I heard all the staff at the sweat lodge scream behind me. My blood ran cold, and I turned on my heel and sprinted back up the canyon. I almost missed the sweat lodge clearing when I came to it because nothing that I saw made sense. The fire was out, not even a glow. The sweat lodge was gone. The tarps had all been pulled and ripped off and they and the hides were flung out in a wide circle on the ground in the bushes and in the water. The frame was uprooted and folded over on its side to one side of the sandbar and all the new and experienced staff were sitting stunned in a circle on a padding of sage and juniper around a pile of cold rocks. What happened? I yelled as I ran up. After a moment, Katie answered. We were just sitting here, starting to pour water on the rocks to heat things up, and we started talking a little bit about what it means to know your personal history. The walls of the sweat lodge started shaking, and we thought you were outside trying to get in. It stopped for a minute, and Jess called your name, but you didn't answer. And we had just poured some more water on the rocks when the whole lodge went cold. Like, really cold. And it sounded like a massive windstorm blew in and ripped the whole thing off of us, frame and all, and threw it into the trees. I didn't know what to do. So I grabbed my bag and got out every flashlight I had. We started checking each other for injuries. I lied to them through my teeth and told them that it was a microburst windstorm and that they happened sometimes in Utah and that they were lucky nobody got hurt and so on. Amidst the skeptical looks from the three who knew me, I got Jessica and Will to start taking the stunned newbies back to camp. But Katie stayed. Katie, who had been with me through so many other unexplainable things out here, knew what I was doing. She could tell I wasn't saying something. The fire is out. Like, it's out cold. And it was a thousand degrees 20 minutes ago. And the rocks that were glowing hot 20 minutes ago feel like they've been sitting in the creek, she said. What are you not saying? I took a deep breath. I just tried to chase down a Native American girl who apparently can run unnaturally fast in the dark. Katie sat down hard. I looked at her, but she didn't say anything, so I continued. Today, while I was gathering rocks for the lodge, I felt like someone was watching me the whole time, and I swear I'm not making this up, but I set down that really big rock. You know, the first one you rolled into the circle? And I walked away for a few minutes. When I returned, it was over by the creek. Like someone came and moved it, but there were no tracks and it couldn't have rolled there. And then after you all went into the sweat lodge, I walked down to the creek and heard something in the trees. It took me a minute to spot her, but she was hiding in a shadow under a tree. I think I chased her for maybe 30 seconds when you all started screaming and I ran back up here. What Katie said next made me sit down too. Did she have two braids and a headband? I nodded slowly. Early this morning, like three, Jessica woke everybody up and said it was going to rain and that we needed to build a shelter. There were no clouds last night, I said. I know, said Katie. 
But she woke us all up and insisted that we needed to build a shelter and she wouldn't drop it until we all moved closer together and put up some tarps. I like to see the stars if I wake up, so I moved in close just in case, but I didn't get under a tarp. Neither did Will or Josh, and he's one of the new guys. Well, this morning, just before it got light, I had a really disturbing dream where I felt like I was awake in my sleeping bag and was staring up into the trees above me. And there was this little Native American girl with two braids and a blue-gray headband up in the tree over my face, just staring at me. I knew I was dreaming, but I couldn't move or wake up. I was only able to move when Josh, on the other side of the shelter, yelled and sat up. I thought it was just a horrible dream, until I talked to Jess about the rain last night. She admitted to me that she hadn't been worried about rain, but that she had been dead asleep when she felt somebody reach into her sleeping bag and shove her head to the side. She panicked and laid there and pretended like she was still sleeping, but they knelt over her face for a few minutes. She said she was terrified to open her eyes. When she felt them leave, she waited for a few minutes and then woke everyone else up. I was wondering why she slept in the middle of everyone. Now it makes sense. I was quiet. Katie spoke again. Before breakfast, I asked Josh why he yelled and sat up. I was grateful he did, but was curious as to why. He told me that he'd had a horrible nightmare about a little Native American girl, and when he thought he woke up, he saw her running at him. He yelled and she jumped over his head and took off, and that's when he really woke up and sat up. He was surprised that I had heard him yell. He thought he was still asleep at that point and he dreamed the yelling part. I didn't tell Jess or Josh what happened to me, and I didn't tell them about each other. But at breakfast, Will told all of us about this horrible dream he had about a little girl dying in that cabin when it burned down. We all freaked out. It's all we've been talking about today. Half of the group didn't believe us, and Carol Sue, the loud annoying one, has told everybody that we're just trying to haze the new guys. Even Josh, who's a new guy, is in on it, apparently. And then the sweat lodge thing happened. With what you just told me, I don't think any of us were dreaming. We were quiet for a long time. I think we should move camp down the road tomorrow, I finally said. I'll clean up this mess in the morning. Katie just nodded and stood up. Oh, and Katie? It's probably a good idea for everyone to be under the shelter to sleep tonight. And also, maybe don't light another fire. I'm guessing the one at your group site is out too. She sighed tiredly and walked off into the dark. I just sat there for a while and then slowly made my way back to the truck. I didn't feel like anyone was watching me anymore but that didn't stop me from sleeping in the cab with the doors locked for the rest of the week. The reason that I'm writing this now and not before is because I was only reminded of this the other day. I was driving to the store with my son, and he wanted me to listen to a song. I don't even remember the words. I just remember that the tune brought me back to a place. A place that I had tucked away in my memory in hopes of forgetting. Now, I can't get that old lady's mouth out of my head. This happened in 1987. I'm sure about the date because of the Whittier earthquake. It just so happens that at that very moment, I was painting a wall in the dining room a different color. That's when it hit. I ended up streaking paint across the wall as I ran over to hold our overly large fish tank from falling off of this stupidly flimsy stand we had it on. This took place in Hacienda Heights, California. My boyfriend at the time wasn't really welcome at my mother's house, 
because she couldn't shake this bad feeling about him. So, being young and dumb, I moved out of her house and into a place that I found down the street with him. I wish I had listened to her. It was a small one-bedroom bungalow. At first, we were getting along just fine, but it seemed like things changed as the months passed and we started fighting more and more. I thought it was odd that I, Susie Homemaker, didn't even want to make that house a home. It was just a weird vibe and it got darker the longer we stayed. As you walk in the partial glass front door, on the left, there were two white window pane doors on the built-in bookcases on both sides of a fireplace, then the dining room, and in the back was the kitchen. The bedroom was on the right. We couldn't afford a bed frame, so our full-size mattress was on the floor under the window, and that was the only thing there besides the clock. There was an uneasiness in that bedroom that I couldn't put my finger on. I felt very depressed in there. Oh, little things happened throughout the house from the moment we moved in, but we just laughed it off until it was no longer funny. It seemed like when we were at odds with each other, it intensified in a dark way. Oftentimes my boyfriend would just leave and I was alone, sometimes for days and I thought that he did it on purpose because he knew that I was scared to be there alone. At first, I was fine, not scared of anything, until one of those nights. I was sleeping, and I was jolted up by an extremely loud bang that left my ears ringing. I jumped up, and at first, I looked out the front window, thinking that it was something outside, but the streets were still. I checked the house, but there was nothing out of place. The next night it happened again, louder than before. Only this time I glanced at the clock before checking the house. It was 5 o'clock a.m. on the dot, and my room was freezing. I tried to get back to sleep, but I heard muffled wails of a woman. I literally had to lift my head from the pillow to listen, but nobody was around. The next day, my boyfriend came home, and with a few words and some hand-picked flowers, all was stupidly forgiven. I told him what had happened, but he shrugged it off, telling me that it could have been a backfire or the pipes, and I bought it. One early evening after dinner, we were going to watch TV on the couch in the living room, and I excused myself to go to the bathroom. I kept hearing him yelling out things to me, but I couldn't really make out what he was saying. I opened the door and looked at him. He turned absolutely pale, and he was crawling backwards on the couch with wide eyes. Then he leaped up and ran into the kitchen, looking around and checking the back door. He came out, saying that the door was locked from the inside. After he calmed down and I could understand him, he told me that he was talking to me in the kitchen. He asked me why I was putting a granny house dress on and was asking for snacks, and he was getting a bit upset that I didn't answer him. I had no answers. There had been a few times where we both saw what looked like a teenaged boy sitting on the front stoop, sometimes holding his head in his hands, but when we approached him it was like he was never there. I pointed out faces in the glass panes of the bookcase that looked like they were talking to us while we were watching TV. They were just reflections, but they were reflections of something that wasn't in the room. Their features were outlined by the flickering light from the TV. But after a while, the faces became more defined. In the beginning, my boyfriend thought I was making it all up, until he saw it for himself. We heard banging on the bathroom door, like somebody was banging with their fist, even when we weren't in there, and an older guy's voice saying, Ah, come on, sending us running outside a couple of times, then feeling stupid sitting outside, so we went in and stayed spooked for the rest of the day. I called the landlord to ask him if something had happened there, or if he could make it stop. But before I could even open my mouth, he was asking if I was calling to complain about something he had no control over. In the background, I heard his wife say, Is that the young couple? They want to move, do they? Well, there goes another one. 
It sounded like this had happened to them a lot before, and that really got my blood boiling. Why would they rent this place to us without even a heads up? Realizing that they would be of no immediate help, I just hung up on him. I couldn't move. I had no money, and my mother for sure wouldn't let me move back in as long as I was with my boyfriend. We lived there for at least four months when our relationship started to spin out of control. He was being forceful and demanding and drinking a lot more. One night, he asked me to pick him up, so I did. And somehow, I ended up with a broken arm because I didn't want him to drive my car drunk. I had to beg him to shift gears so that I could drive to the ER because he was tired. And after the hospital, I was exhausted and I just wanted to sleep. So I went to the bedroom while he opted to lay on the couch and watch TV. The next thing I know, he's grabbing his stuff, saying that he's not staying there anymore and walking out, leaving me there alone with a broken arm. Wow. I remember that it was a warm night, but it was raining. So I laid on the couch with only the screen door closed so that I could hear the rain. The lights went out, which freaked me out even more. So I put candles on the coffee table and one on the bookcase and sat back down on the couch. I was too afraid to sleep in the bedroom. I sat there and saw those faces and one was an old lady. She was frowning and her mouth was moving like she was trying to over enunciate to tell me something or yell at me. Her face got bigger like she was coming closer to the glass and then back. She kept waving her finger at me. Her gray hair was straight and put back with a headband. Her mouth was just going on opening and closing and the candlelight glistened on her bottom teeth. Her teeth looked a little, I don't know, long and old if that makes any sense. Then there was a middle-aged man who didn't look directly at me he looked aggravated, but not at me, more like at everything and everyone. And then a crying teenager. His face was so full of despair. I could make out the words, please, and no, no, no. And then he put his hand on his face. Looking at him brought tears to my eyes and my heart felt so very heavy. It dawned on me that this was the kid on our doorstep. I must have sat there for hours with the blankets up to my nose until the lights came back on and I finally fell asleep. The next morning, I walked down to the corner store and I called my mother, who was happy to find out that I was ready to come home. Before I handed the keys over, my mother had some words with the landlord. He told her that he had the place blessed before I moved in and that he was really hoping that it had worked. He also told my mom that he bought the place already haunted. All he knew from digging was that it was two bungalows together, but one burnt down. But the one that I was renting was the one where an old lady lived, whose grown son had come upon hard times due to his alcoholism. He lost his wife and couldn't keep a job, so he and his teenage son moved into her place with her. His son was so unstable that he found a gun in the house and ended up shooting himself in the bedroom. His grandmother had died from a heart attack not long after. He didn't know what happened to the man. Talk about a roundabout. I don't know why that tune or maybe the light reflecting off the rain on my windshield made me think about that old lady's mouth, but it did. Now I understand a little more as to why I hate reflective things in my home. My boyfriend and I are camping at the Fort Pickens campground in Pensacola, Florida. Last night was a full moon, and around 9.30 or 10, we went for a walk down to the beach with our husky to look at the ocean and check out the moonlight. We sat there for maybe an hour and just talked about life in general. But toward the end of the conversation, 
We started talking about how the ocean can play tricks on you, and how strange the energy can be sometimes. We were swapping stories about how we've seen people who we thought might not really be people before. And I understand that when you talk about things like that, it puts you in a very specific headspace. All night, I tried to justify what happened to us as a trick of our minds and us hyping ourselves up. But we both saw the same thing at the same time, and there's absolutely no way that it wasn't real. We started walking back to camp, and it was maybe a quarter mile from the beach down the little boardwalk thing to the main road. Once you get to the main road, you see the entrance to the campsite, and there's a small parking lot there, a stop sign, a picnic table, and a building that looks abandoned and out of business. This building is one story tall and doesn't have any signs out front, and I don't believe the doors and windows are shuttered, but they're definitely not accessible. I wouldn't even be able to press my face against the window and try to peek in, because it's kind of boarded up around it. I was sitting on this picnic table while Shane was standing and telling me a creepy story about something he saw in the ocean when he was 11 years old. We were there for maybe 10 minutes, and we were talking about his story. I was trying to debunk it and figure it out with him. When all of a sudden a girl comes walking out of the campsite area towards us and stops at the building. We both thought nothing of it because we had already seen two people walking that night, and we knew people were active because it was a full moon and wanted to make the most of the campsite. But this girl walks up to the abandoned building, and it looks like she's trying to peer in the windows or open the doors on the right side of the building. I almost even remember her standing on her tiptoes. She obviously doesn't get in, and then she decides to walk all the way across the length of the building, right in front of us to the left side. This is when I started to get uncomfortable, because she doesn't look at us or address us, even though we're both loudly standing there talking. And the way that she was walking, all I could see was her side or back profile in a long brown ponytail. I know it doesn't really make sense, but it's just like, how can somebody walk from right to left in front of you and you don't see the side of their face? All I saw was her hair. It's not like she had her head turned either. It just doesn't make sense. So she rounds the corner on the left side of the building and doesn't come back. At this point, I'm actually invested and I'm kind of grilling the location she went to the whole time. I don't take my eyes off of it. I don't really know how to explain this, but it didn't seem like she walked back behind the building. It seemed like she was right there, just waiting for us to do or say something. There's a little edge, like a ledge on the side of the building that looked maybe three or four inches wide, kind of like a gutter hanging off. And I swear on my life, it's like she went behind this little four inch ledge and flipped herself sideways and was just frozen watching us. Shane has this spotlight for hunting that he uses as a flashlight and he shined it on the little ledge area of the building that she went behind. We kept seeing something low to the ground on the side of this ledge and it made us think that she was just standing there doing something. So Shane shines his light in that direction and yelled, Yo, what's up? Are you good? After this, he kept his spotlight pinned where we thought she would pop out. And after a delay of four or five seconds, we literally saw her spring out of the shadow and leer forward facing right. She had her back hunched over so she wasn't standing as tall as she normally would be. I can't explain how scary it was to be sitting there watching this whole thing take place, and once we shine the flashlight, have this person's face pop out from the side of this building. It would have been less scary if she had never come out and we had circled the whole building and nobody was there. Her movement was incredibly unnatural. It was as if no human being would respond with their body language that way after having a flashlight shining on them. It was like she couldn't figure out what to do and showed herself only because we made her and then couldn't get all the parts right in the meantime. 
Almost like she was scared of getting caught for doing something wrong, not scared of us. The way she popped out, her face was turned toward us, and she had her arms kind of sprawled out, almost like a praying mantis. I know this sounds ridiculous, but there's literally no other way to explain this. The best part about this whole thing, though, is something that neither of us figured out until we talked about it later. We never saw a face. It was just smooth skin or clay colored, rounded, with no eyes or facial expressions. I want to say that I personally almost saw divots or pits where the eyes should have been, but there was nothing substantial there. We were still trying to figure out this encounter, so we weren't super quick to get scared at this point. We honestly thought that it was our minds playing tricks on us, but I think since both of us saw it, we knew that was probably unlikely. This is where the story starts to differentiate a little bit. After she pulls her body back behind the ledge, Shane turns off his flashlight when I asked him to because I felt like we were being rude. At this point, she's back behind the ledge and the light is off, and I see her extended body about three feet off the ground. It's like she's crouching and reaching at the same time. Like she was going to take an over-exaggerated step and almost tiptoe off like a cartoon character or something. She leaned forward one step to the right and then pulled herself back behind the ledge. She stands up straight and then starts walking back to the right side of the building in front of us. Shane has his flashlight on her the whole time. And now she just says, Oh, I just wanted to change without having to go all the way back. But it's like, all the way back to where? She literally just came from the campground. She could have changed right there if she was heading to the beach or something. Was she going to swim at 10.30 at night? It just didn't make any sense why she needed to change in that specific spot. The strange part is I specifically heard her talk about changing, but Shane heard her say something about having to pee. I'm not sure if one or both of us just misheard her or if Shane just assumed that's what she was doing, because that's what I thought at first too. But as she walked from the left of the building across to the right and back down the trail toward the campground, she kind of scurried away quickly, as if she was embarrassed. And the crazy thing is that I didn't see her face the entire time she did this. It was like when she walked across the first time. All I saw was her long brown ponytail. After she slowly walked down the road back toward the campsite, Shane and I were talking about how messed up that whole interaction was, and how we needed to get back to our own site. He told me that this person had a short, blonde, bob-style haircut. He couldn't believe me when I said that no, she had a long brown ponytail, because he hadn't seen that anywhere on this person. There's no way that either of us could have mistaken these two specific haircuts and colors for the other. It's almost like she was showing each of us what she wanted to. As we walk back to our campsite, we walk past a handful of good dark trees that I, as a female, would definitely have peed behind or changed behind if I needed to. This building was so far out of the way, and I would never think to go to the distant right side of it by myself late at night in order to change clothes. It just didn't make sense, the choices that she made. And trust me, we've spent enough time in the city that if we were in New York or New Orleans or Denver or wherever, and we saw somebody doing stuff like this, we probably would have just chalked it up to the person being high and just laughed it off. But this is a random, quiet family campground where everyone's super happy and peaceful. Of course we tried to justify that maybe it was just some drunk chick being sloppy and not knowing what's going on. But even that doesn't hold any weight in comparison to those body movements and that smooth face that we saw staring back at us. Nothing about this person's body movements were natural. Not when she came slinking up. Not when she didn't notice us sitting there. Not when she looked in the window. Not when she walked across the building or dipped behind the ledge or peered out or crouched down or replied to us and definitely not when she scurried off. This is one of those situations that left me with tears in my eyes. I was absolutely shaken, but I was incredulous at the same time. 
I couldn't believe that it really happened to me. It's like I almost couldn't even be scared because it had already happened and I just had to sit there and process that we really saw what we did. We talk about NPCs sometimes and joke about people making us uncomfortable and maybe not being real. And we really believe that sometimes we cross paths with angels. But this was something else entirely. This was something that seemed like a lower form or something less intelligent than us that was just pretending to be human. I feel like I should add this as a side note, but I'm Native American and I'm super familiar with all kinds of witches or bad medicine or shapeshifters. And in a lot of our stories, these are humans who are incredibly intelligent and powerful and have this human urge based on jealousy or anger or evil to target individuals and appear as another living form. I'm telling you right now that nothing about this encounter felt like that. This didn't seem like something smarter than us. It didn't seem like something with an emotional intention. It didn't seem quick or cunning like it wanted something from us. It was the exact opposite end of the spectrum. It seemed like it was mimicking or mocking human movements. I have no idea what its intentions were, or why it was here of all places, or why it presented itself to us that night. But I guess I just have to move forward with the knowledge that this definitely happened, and I don't have any answers. This happened when I was in middle school. I'm about to graduate high school. I still remember every detail to this day. When I was younger, my mother sent my siblings and I to this cute little summer camp in the mountains. It was one week in the middle of nowhere. No cell service, no quick way to reach anybody, and we were miles and miles from the nearest town. This event happened in my third year of attendance. The way these campsites were set up goes as follows. You were split up by gender and age group. Each campsite had four cabins with five raised beds in each and one lean-to for the assigned camp counselor. So in your cabin you've got four buddies that you get to know fairly well throughout the week. There's also no bathrooms at the campsites. So if you had to go, you would have to get the TP from your counselor and go into the woods. We were about 12 at the time, so we always had to go with a buddy. This one night, a girl in my cabin, who I had become pretty close with throughout the week, was just talking to me in the dark of our cabin about absolutely nothing. Just two kids who couldn't sleep, so we opted to stay up and talk until we could sleep. Eventually, she tells me she has to go to the bathroom and asks if I'll go with her. I say, yeah, no biggie. So we grab our flashlights and sandals and hike over to get some TP, and then we go back past our cabin. Ours was the farthest out, on the edge of our campsite, a good 20 feet from the other cabins, and we go a little ways into the woods. I stand on the path while she goes up into the trees to do her business. Again, we're 12. It's cold, and we're both afraid of the dark. So she asks me to keep talking to her so she doesn't freak herself out. So we're talking about nothing and I'm doing that little step dance you do when you're cold, swishing my flashlight around to see if I'd find anything cool. I almost never go to the mountains and I just wanted to know if there'd be any cool plants or animals that I could see in the distance. I stop as my light lands about 13 feet away from me. I was dead in my tracks. To this day, I don't know what else to describe this thing as other than the description of the rake from that creepypasta story. I know how childish that sounds, but it's the only comparison I had in my head. It looked freakishly lanky, extremely decrepit, pale, hairless, like a person but definitely not a person. I could only see its head, 
shoulders, and from its forearms to its fingers, it stretched out as if it was crawling down the path. It had long, spindly fingers that seemed to sharpen at the end. I really don't know if I was looking at nails and claws, or if its skin was just stretched like that. Its head was pointed slightly downward, and I would later figure that it was as if it was trying to avoid the light beam, but I could still see its eyes. Eyes that still make me shiver if I think about it too long. Large, black ones. I don't know if it was extremely dilated pupils, or if its eyes were just black, but it was like the eyes themselves bulged out of its head. I was too scared to shine my light any farther, and I could see one of its hands slowly creeping toward me. I was petrified in my spot. I didn't move my light off of it once I saw it. I didn't know what to do. I wasn't gonna just leave this girl out there if it actually was something that might have hurt her. I told her to hurry up. She asked me why my voice was shaking. I remember saying, I, I don't want you to freak out. It's probably nothing. I I'll tell you when we get back. But uh, w when you're done, just tell me. Because we're going to make a run for the cabin. Okay? That really made her move. I felt bad for scaring her, but I myself was terrified. I heard her say, done. And I just told her to run. I spun around, finally taking my light off of it and sprinted so quickly that I caught up to her in seconds. This might have been my own heartbeat pulsing in my ears, but I was sure I could hear it almost galloping behind me. We were both moving so quickly that we slipped a bit on the leaves in front of our cabin door. I remember two of the other girls waking up when the door slammed behind us as I fumbled with the hook that would lock it. I don't really know how I thought that would help though. It was a poor lock. My friend was freaking out, asking me what I saw and practically begging me to tell her I was pranking her. I couldn't say anything though, as I had begun to have one of the worst panic attacks in my life. My breathing became audibly labored and someone had to get up to get our camp counselor, which is what got me talking again. She got about halfway to the door before I said, no and that was what made everyone more freaked out. Eventually our counselor heard us and came to the cabin. Someone opened the door for her and she came in, wanting to know why I was crying so viciously and why everyone was panicked. I was able to piece together a coherent enough sentence that she got the gist. Obviously she didn't believe me, who would, but she finally gave up on trying to convince me when she offered to go with me to confirm there was nothing there, and I just kept crying harder at the thought. I slept in the lean-to with her for the rest of the week. I'll be the first to admit that I can't honestly know what I saw. I was 12, it was dark, and I was tired, with probably an overactive imagination. But I know that staring off into the dark has never struck such terror into me like that before. I know that figure that I saw, I just don't know what to call it. I still don't really know what to make of it, but I think about it every summer. Cancun was a paradise of blue skies and even bluer waters. The ocean was its own world, alive and whispering secrets through the currents. I'd spent the entire year looking forward to this snorkeling trip. My dad used to tell stories about how our ancestors were seafarers, explorers who mapped uncharted waters. I always felt a connection to the ocean that I couldn't explain like a song whose lyrics I had forgotten, but whose melody stayed with me. On the third day, armed with snorkeling gear and a waterproof camera, I took a boat trip to a secluded reef. The guide, Ricardo, assured me it was an extraordinary spot, 
a place where the sea unveiled its hidden beauty. As soon as I plunged into the water, I was in another realm. Schools of vividly colored fish danced around me. Corals stretched out like ancient cities, an underwater metropolis teeming with life. I lost track of time, mesmerized by the vibrant underworld. But as I swam farther from the other snorkelers, the scenery began to change. The water got darker, and the corals appeared older, their colors muted. I was about to turn back when something caught my eye, an object half buried in the sand below, its outlines too straight and angular to be a natural formation. Curiosity pulling me deeper, I dove down for a closer look. What I found stopped me cold. A statue, humanoid but not human, its features a surreal blend of aquatic and terrestrial elements. It looked ancient, the material worn away by countless tides. It was the plaque at its base that took my breath away, literally and figuratively. My family's last name was etched onto it, Mendoza. I blinked, half expecting the letters to rearrange themselves, to make this bizarre occurrence some kind of misreading. But they remained, a cold testament set in stone. I took photos, my hands trembling. I had to show this to someone. I had to have proof that this wasn't some sort of underwater mirage. I quickly swam back to the boat, my heart pounding in a rhythm it had never known. When I showed Ricardo the pictures, he looked puzzled and then concerned. This isn't something I've seen before, and I've been guiding tours for over a decade. You sure about the location? I nodded, pointing it out on the laminated ocean map he had on board. Ricardo scratched his head. That's not a typical spot for tourists. Too many local legends about sea spirits and forgotten gods. The fishermen avoid it. Ignoring my heightened sense of dread, I pressed him for more information. But he shook his head, reluctant to indulge in what he called superstitious nonsense. For the remainder of the trip, I couldn't get the statue and its plaque out of my mind. Who had put it there? How long had it been in the ocean? What did it mean? When I returned home, I showed the photos to my family. They were fascinated, but equally baffled. My dad, always the history buff, tried to dig into our family archives but came up empty. There were gaps in our lineage, periods where records were either incomplete or missing. Looks like our ancestors were good at keeping secrets, he mused. Weeks later, long after the trip, was a collection of photos and memories. Strange things began to happen. I found myself increasingly restless, a peculiar type of insomnia that left me tossing and turning, the sound of waves echoing in my ears even in the dead of night. Then I started to dream, visions of vast oceanscapes, of ancient rituals, of murmured incantations that seemed to flow from the statue's chiseled lips. Each morning, I would wake exhausted, like I'd been on an endless nocturnal journey. The final straw was the night I woke up to find my bed soaked, as though I'd been submerged in water. The room smelled of salt and seaweed, like a shoreline after high tide. And there on my nightstand sat a small shell, a type I had never seen before, its spirals forming a pattern eerily similar to the designs on the sunken statue's plaque. I booked a return trip to Cancun, this time alone. When I met Ricardo, I could see the unease in his eyes. You sure you want to go back there? I have to, was all I could say. As the boat neared the spot, my heart tightened in my chest. Donning my snorkeling gear, I plunged into the ocean, propelled by a force I couldn't deny. I reached the statue, its presence as unsettling as before. But now it felt like an unfinished chapter, conversation interrupted but not concluded. I took a piece of paper, a waterproof one, and a pencil from my gear. On the paper, I wrote my full name, 
then pressed it against the plaque, securing it with a small net bag usually used to collect underwater samples. Then I waited. It didn't take too long. The water around me began to churn, the sand swirling like a miniature storm. I felt a pull, not of the current, but something deeper, as if the ocean itself had gripped my soul. My vision blurred, and when it cleared, I was back on the boat, Ricardo staring down at me, his face pale as sea foam. We need to leave, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. As we sped back to shore, I looked at the photograph of the statue one last time, and then deleted it from my camera. Some mysteries, it seemed, demanded their own form of isolation, their secrets too heavy for the surface world. That night, in my hotel room, I found another shell on my pillow, identical to the first one, but this time it came with a note. Welcome home. I haven't gone snorkeling since, not because I'm afraid, but because I'm not sure what I'd be returning to. A world of coral and fish, or a lineage that stretches into the dark corners of the sea. And sometimes, when the night is still and the moon casts its glow on the water's surface, I hear whispers, voices that beckon, that plead, that promise. They call to me from depths I can't fathom, asking me to reclaim a legacy that was submerged long before I was born. And I wonder, with equal parts dread and longing, what would happen if I answered? The Transnational Express had always been a dream of mine, a cross-country train journey that zigzagged through small towns and big cities, offering panoramic views of the landscapes most people only saw in travel brochures. When work dried up and my apartment lease ended, it seemed like the universe was giving me a sign. So, with a one-way ticket and a duffel bag, I boarded the train and settled into my seat. A couple of hours into the journey, I discovered an old worn-out paperback wedged into the seat pocket in front of me. No title, no author, just a yellowed cover that looked as though it had survived a few decades. Curiosity peaked, I flipped it open and began to read. The story was engaging from the get-go, featuring a protagonist named Alex, who had an uncanny number of similarities to me. Same age, same hometown, even the same peculiar birthmark on the right wrist. The sense of deja vu was amusing at first, but then, as I turned the pages, the amusement turned to disbelief. Every minor detail, every anecdote, mirrored my life. There were episodes I hadn't shared with anyone, private moments, embarrassments, triumphs. It was as if someone had rifled through my memories and penned them down, rebranding them as fiction. I scanned the train car, suddenly paranoid, Faces stared blankly out windows or were buried in books and screens. No one paid me any attention. Yet I felt horribly exposed, as though I'd found a hidden camera in a dressing room. Forcing myself to breathe, I decided to keep reading. I needed to know how deep the rabbit hole went. The story meandered through familiar events, then veered into unfamiliar territory. Here, the narrative split from my reality. In this alternate life, Alex had never boarded the Transnational Express. Instead, he stayed in his hometown, shackled to a job he loathed, embroiled in a doomed relationship. Page by page, the story unfolded into a cautionary tale, a life filled with regret and missed opportunities. I read about Alex's downward spiral with growing unease. The climactic sense was jarring, a tragic end involving a car accident alcohol, and shattered dreams. I closed the book, my hands trembling. Was this some kind of sick joke? A warning? Restless, I roamed the train, passing through cars filled with families, solo travelers, and empty seats. When I reached the observation car, I found it deserted, 
except for an elderly woman seated by the window. She looked up as I entered, her eyes narrowing for a moment before widening in recognition. You've read the book, haven't you? She said, her voice tinged with an accent I couldn't place. What is that thing? I asked, holding up the yellowed paper back as though it were evidence in a trial. It's a glimpse, she replied. A glimpse of another path, another ending. But why me? Who wrote this? Some questions don't have answers, she said, staring past me at the blur of landscapes rushing by. Or perhaps they have too many to count. Is it a warning? I pressed, seeking some thread of sense in this woven chaos. It's a gift she said, meeting my gaze. Whether you take it as a warning or an inspiration is entirely up to you. I left the observation car, my mind a labyrinth of questions without exits. Back in my seat, I shoved the book into my duffel bag, burying it beneath clothes and toiletries. Yet it felt like it weighed a ton, pulling me toward an understanding that remained tantalizingly out of reach. The train journey continued, Stops were made, passengers disembarked, new faces appeared. But the scenery outside felt like a backdrop to the storm of thoughts inside me. Could I take this fork in the road, so vividly outlined in the pages of a nameless book? On the final day of the journey, I awoke to find the seat pocket empty. The book I had returned had vanished. I rummaged through my bag, but it was gone, as if it had never existed. No one else on the train remembered seeing it or had any knowledge of the elderly woman in the observation car. When the train pulled into the final station, I stepped onto the platform, my duffel bag slung over my shoulder. The air was different here, filled with a sense of potential, a vibrancy that felt miles away from the life I'd left behind. I hailed a cab and directed it to a local inn. As I checked in, the woman at the front desk handed me a form to fill out. New in town? She asked, her eyes friendly, her smile genuine. Yes, I said, grasping the pen and hesitating for just a moment before writing down my name. Not Alex, the name I'd been given, but a new one, a name of my choosing. As I signed, I glanced at the clock on the wall. It was the same time the accident would have happened, according to the book's narrative. The coincidence, or was it fate, sent a shiver down my spine. I collected my room key and headed upstairs. But as I turned the corner, I froze. At the far end of the hall, a door creaked open. And for a fleeting second, I thought I saw the elderly woman from the observation car step out her eyes meeting mine in a knowing glance. And then she was gone, the door clicking shut behind her. I stood there, a cold draft whispering down the corridor, caressing the birthmark on my wrist. I gripped the key in my hand, its jagged edges digging into my palm, as if urging me to unlock not just a room, but a life yet unwritten. And as I inserted the key into the lock, I wondered, would this door lead me to the story the book foretold, or to one of my own making? The lock clicked open. I stepped inside, leaving the door ajar behind me. I was never a fan of long-haul flights, hours confined in a metal tube surrounded by strangers. To pass the time, I usually toggled between in-flight movies and the digital tracker that displayed our plane's current location. On this particular international flight, I decided to check the tracker again, something to take my mind off the tightening muscles in my back. A quick glance at the screen and my eyes narrowed. We were way off course. According to the map, our plane was headed toward an island in the middle of the ocean. An island that I'm pretty sure wasn't even supposed to be there. Puzzled, I hit the call button for the flight attendant. 
When she arrived, I pointed at the screen. Is this thing accurate? I said. She leaned in to look. Oh, these trackers can be a little glitchy sometimes. Don't worry, the pilots know where we're going. Despite her reassurances, the sinking feeling in my gut persisted. I couldn't ignore the hard data staring back at me. We were heading into uncharted territory, and it seemed like I was the only one who cared. An hour passed, then two. The tracker showed us getting closer to the mysterious island, while the rest of the plane's occupants were either asleep or engrossed in their entertainment screens. I had to do something. I unbuckled my seatbelt and headed for the restroom, strategically located near the cockpit. Waiting for the perfect moment, I saw a flight attendant push a cart into the galley. I seized the opportunity, knocking softly on the cockpit door. One of the pilots opened it, a hint of annoyance in his eyes. Can I help you? I'm sorry for the interruption, I said quickly. But according to the in-flight tracker, we're heading toward an island that's not on any map? Is that a glitch or... The pilots exchanged glances. The tension in the cockpit was palpable. Come in, the second pilot said, ushering me inside. I stepped into the cockpit, the array of controls and screens glowing in the semi-darkness. The main navigation system confirmed what I'd seen on my tracker. We were off course, headed toward an anomaly. We've been trying to correct it, the first pilot said. The navigation system deviated on its own about two hours ago. Manual overrides aren't working. We're stuck on this trajectory. Shouldn't we inform the passengers? I asked, my voice tinged with urgency. And say what? That we're flying blind toward an island that doesn't exist? The second pilot shook his head. Panic is the last thing we need. For a brief moment, I contemplated rushing out, alerting everyone, forcing the issue. But the potential chaos held me back. What good would it do? Look, said the first pilot, if you have any ideas on how to fix this, we're all ears. Otherwise, please return to your seat. We're doing everything we can. Resigned, I exited the cockpit, closing the door behind me. I returned to my seat, eyes flicking back to the tracker. Closer and closer we moved toward the Phantom Island, its outline growing more distinct. The flight continued in its eerie silence, the tension in my body building with each passing minute. And then it happened. The plane began to descend. Seatbelt signs flashed on and the cabin crew prepared for landing. We were committed now, come what may. As the wheels touched down on a makeshift runway, I stared out of the window. The island was real, its terrain lush and untamed. We taxied to a stop, the engines winding down, the weight of the unknown settling over us. The cabin door opened, stairs deployed, and we stepped out, passengers and crew alike, into the island's embrace. There were no signs of human life, no structures, no reception committees, just wilderness stretching out in every direction, and an ocean whose horizon held no promise of rescue. We had landed on an uncharted island, a place that defied maps and logic, carried here by a plane that refused to obey its pilots. Where we were, why we were here, and what it meant, those questions hovered in the thick, humid air, unanswered. Days turned into weeks. Rescue never came. We adapted, survival outweighing understanding. The island became home, its inexplicable presence a riddle interwoven into the fabric of our new reality. The outside world faded into an abstraction, as distant as the stars that watched over us each night. The flight that vanished off the radar, the passengers who disappeared into thin air, the plane that went where it shouldn't, all became the stuff of headlines, then theories, then myths. But for us, it became life. A life off course, off map, on an island that didn't exist until it did.
I don't know how long I was out before I came to, strapped naked on a cold metal table in a sterile white room. My foggy brain struggled to piece together some explanation from how I went from driving home from work to this. Blurry figures moved in my peripheral vision. I tried to lift my head for a better look, but some invisible force held it locked in place. A tall, gangly creature entered my field of vision. He had a bulbous bald head with opaque black eyes and pale gray skin that seemed to glow under the harsh lights. Spindly fingers covered in some sort of black gloves or claws tapped a device it held in its equally spindly hands. I opened my mouth to speak, scream, anything, but quickly realized I was also paralyzed from the neck down. Helpless panic gripped every fiber of my being. The creature must have sensed my terror. In my mind, I heard a thin, reedy voice. Do not be frightened. We intend you no harm. We only wish to improve your species, to prepare you for what is coming. Invisible claws clamped down on my head as an excruciating pain ricocheted through my skull. It felt like my brain was being shredded and reassembled as images and concepts flashed before my eyes. Advanced technology, complex mathematics, cosmic disasters, future events. More creatures entered the room and began manipulating my limbs, injecting substances, prodding and poking me. After what felt like an eternity of tests, my overwhelmed mind gratefully slid into unconsciousness. I awoke some time later back in my car, parked in my driveway. My head throbbed as I tried to piece together if it had all been some bizarrely vivid nightmare. But the lingering pain in my temples and dried blood under my nose told me otherwise. Those creatures, whatever they were, had been inside my head, and they did something to me. In all the days that followed, the changes began. Headaches persisted no matter how many pain pills I took, but I also noticed food no longer satisfied my gnawing hunger. My vision sharpened until I could read license plates from a block away. The strange voices in my head grew louder. I started having vivid premonitions that would come true. A coworker's car crash, an election upset, even trivial things like TV scheduling changes or pop quiz questions. Somehow I could glimpse upcoming events, almost like watching a stream of the future. My body changed too. I no longer seemed to need sleep, yet woke every morning feeling fully energized. Previously sluggish thinking accelerated to lightning speed. I solved complex equations instantly and remembered entire textbooks word for word. But the toll was immense migraines that sometimes left me writhing, incapacitated on the floor for hours. At work, I predicted a system failure before it happened, saving us millions. My bosses said I was brilliant. Little did they know alien abductors did something to transform me into a superhuman freak. Part of me wanted to tell the world, to find meaning in my violation. But how could I without sounding insane? The voices in my head had grown to a constant chaotic chorus only I could hear. They whispered horrors, crashes, explosions, suffering and death on global scales. I caught glimpses of creatures and spacecraft hidden behind the thin veil that previously concealed them. The experiments performed on me clearly ruptured the flimsy illusion, separating our ordinary reality from levels beyond. I tried drowning the voices out with music, drugs, anything I could think of, but they only intensified. Soon they were screaming, pleading with me to act before the coming cataclysm. I wasn't sure if I was tapping into some real truth or simply going mad. Maybe I already was. The final straw came after a week of ceaseless migraines and zero sleep. In the mirror, my eyes appeared blackened from burst blood vessels. My gums bled spontaneously, and my fingers trembled uncontrollably. 
How long until whatever alien substance they pumped me with finally killed me? That night, as I rocked and muttered to myself, a booming voice cut through the others, commanding me, Go to the cave. Our technology can save you and your planet, but time grows short. Somehow I knew exactly the cave it meant, one I had played in as a child on family camping trips. I tore out of my house and sped recklessly into the hills until I came to that familiar rocky outcropping. A perfect full moon illuminated the small black mouth of the cave's entrance. I stumbled inside, not even questioning my surreal actions, lured by a promise of relief from the unrelenting torment. Deeper, I crawled until the narrow walls opened into a large cavern with a glowing blue light at its center. Mesmerized, I stepped toward it. The angry chorus in my head became a single high-pitched drone the closer I came to that glow. I realized my mistake too late. I had walked right into their trap. The force that seized control of my body was even greater than during the first abduction. I was a puppet, compelled by some external power to march stiffly toward that pulsing light, compelled to become something far from human. Just as my hand reached for the hypnotic light, instinct took over. I wrenched back control of my body and let out a primal scream of rage at the creatures, who thought they could dictate my fate. With the last of my energy, I ripped a sharp stone from the cavern wall and plunged it into my chest, collapsing as hot blood gushed. I lie gasping on the cold cave floor, life ebbing away. But at least I would die as myself, and not their specimen. As my vision faded, I heard their frustrated screams fade to silence. I can only pray my small act of defiance delayed their apocalypse just a while longer, so someone else might find a way to avoid the grim future, preordained for our race. A future I glimpsed in my final moments. Our planet harvested, and humanity mutated into some cold new form. But perhaps we still have time to forge another path. Perhaps. It started as a hobby setting up a high-powered telescope in my backyard on clear nights and gazing deep into our galaxy. As an amateur astronomer, I loved picking out familiar constellations and nebulae, tracking the trajectories of planets and asteroids, and pondering the mysteries of black holes. On rare occasions, I'd even spot a comet streaking past or catch sight of the gold-hued rings of Saturn. My telescope opened up the secrets of the cosmos, right from my suburban home. But everything changed that cloudless night in June, when I first picked up the signal. I was scanning the telescope slowly along the dusty swath of the Milky Way, marveling as always at the millions of stars packed densely together like grains of glittering sand. I lingered on a binary star system intriguingly called Zeta Reticuli, before panning upward. That's when a rapid flash of light from a dimmer part of the sky caught my eye. I quickly focused the telescope on that patch of the night. It took me a moment to spot the source. Not a star, but some unidentified object beyond our solar system, sending out a deliberate sequence of pulses. My heart began pounding. I grabbed my notebook and pen and frantically scribbled down the sequence. Three short pulses. Three long pulses. Three short. Pause. Repeat. It was clearly a patterned signal, which meant it must have some kind of meaning. My mind raced through the possibilities. A monitoring program from some secret government space agency? A research craft sent out by extraterrestrial beings? Or even a message? A signal intentionally beamed across light years of space? 
In the weeks that followed, I became obsessed with deciphering that cryptic message from the void. Nights when the sky was overcast left me restless and irritable as I yearned to train my telescope on that now familiar region. On clear nights, I diligently recorded each repetition of the pulsing sequence, searching for possible variations. After completing pages of data, an eerie realization struck me. The sequence was expressing binary code. The short pulses represented ones, and the long pulses symbolized zeros. The message began to take legible shape, translating roughly to, hello, we come in peace, we seek contact. Contact. They, whoever, whatever they were out there, sought to make contact with our planet. A shudder passed through me, equal parts exhilaration and dread. What forces had I unwittingly contacted in the dark oceans of space? And did humanity truly stand ready for this moment? I continued watching the signal, deciphering new messages as they came. They spoke of a distant civilization from a planet in the Zeta Reticuli system, long ago ravaged by war and climate disaster. The messages alluded to their immense scientific knowledge and expressed hope we could work together to build an interstellar utopia. But underneath the lofty utopian dreams, an unsettling undercurrent emerged. They urged us to join the Federation and embrace universal law. Ominous references to colonization appeared, along with hints that resistant civilizations could be pacified. I became convinced there was a veiled threat beneath their promise of peace. This growing unease festered in my mind, magnified by lack of sleep and constant anxiety. I stopped leaving the house, rarely ate or bathed, entirely consumed by the messages streaming nightly from light years away. I was unable to share my discovery with anyone else. It sounded far too insane. Until one sweltering midnight, when the messages took an urgent new turn, no longer encoded, but spelled out in plain ominous letters. We come, prepare and submit. Adrenaline spiked through my system. They were coming, for us, soon. I shut down the telescope and gathered all my notebooks filled with inscrutable figures and frantic scribble translations. In a manic whirlwind, I destroyed my hard drives, sabotaged my equipment, and burned all the papers out behind my shed. I hoped desperately it would be enough to sever the connection, shut out their intrusion into our small world, delay their sinister arrival for a few fleeting days. But I can feel their presence now, ominous and heavy, seeping into the very atmosphere of our vulnerable planet. Sometimes I still catch the coded signals winking slyly at me from familiar constellations, taunting me that I was too weak to shield us from what's to come. In my most hopeless moments, staring up at the indifferent sky, I wonder if humanity will look upon this year as our last before oblivion arrived, silently, from the stars. At first, I brushed off the odd series of coincidences as just that, coincidence. But deep down, I sensed each one was an orchestrated breadcrumb, luring me towards something bigger. It all started with the lottery ticket. I never play the lottery, but on some whim, I bought a scratcher at the gas station one night. Amazingly, I won $500, not a fortune, but probably the most I'd ever won gambling. I decided to splurge on a fancy steak dinner. When I arrived at the restaurant that night, they had no record of my reservation. Annoyed, I turned to leave just as another couple was exiting. They kindly offered me their table, saying that they had suddenly fallen ill. I thanked my lucky stars. 
Halfway through my meal, nature called. In the bathroom, the motion sensor sink turned on as I walked by. Oddly, the faucet sputtered and a tiny object shot out of the drain right at my feet. A gold ring with a cryptic symbol etched in black. Even odder, it somehow fit my ring finger perfectly. Just then, the bathroom door swung open and a gruff voice ordered me back to my table immediately. I pocketed the ring and complied. Later, when I asked my server about the ring symbol, his smile wavered momentarily before he leaned in and whispered, You've been chosen. Follow the signs. Before I could ask what he meant, he hurried off. I chuckled, assuming he was messing with me. Over the next week, that ring symbol seemed to pop up everywhere, etched into a subway pillar, engraved on a mailbox, even tattooed on the wrist of a barista handing me my morning coffee. Each time I spotted it, a strange tingling would spread up my arm from the ring on my finger. That weekend, another string of improbabilities led me to book an impromptu trip to Nevada. On the flight there, my seatmate made small talk asking where I was heading. When I told him the name of my hotel, he raised an eyebrow and said I should explore a certain unmarked dirt road near the property. Just look for three cacti clustered together, he said. I did find that strange road out in the desert behind the hotel. After miles of empty wilderness, I came across what looked like an abandoned shed. Suddenly my vision blurred the same strange tingling shooting down my arm from the ring. Without thinking, I approached the shed and the door swung open on its own. A narrow staircase spiraled down into inky darkness. Every nerve told me to flee, yet I found myself descending step by step into the void. The temperature dropped sharply. Strange mechanical hums and echoing voices drifted up. At the bottom, the stairs opened into a massive domed chamber. Catwalks crisscrossed the space high above my head. Figures in white lab coats scurried about, attending to large cylindrical chambers covered in warning symbols and containing something alive. Creatures I couldn't fully glimpse, but that seemed only half formed, not of this earth. I should have turned and run. Instead, I crept forward along the perimeter of the vast chamber. That's when I saw it in the center, a mammoth disc-like craft resting silently on a raised platform. Access panels on its smooth metal hull were open, exposing a maze of alien circuitry and pulsating with light. Human scientists hovered around it, studying and making notes. One inserted a long robotic arm into the craft's inner workings. My blood turned to ice. This was no abandoned shed. It was a secret government site for reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology. All those seeming coincidences had drawn me here. But why? Just then, alarms screeched to life, pulsing red lights flooding the facility. A panicked voice over the intercom shouted, Protocol Omega initiated. The scientists scattered as security teams stormed through the side doors, spotting me as the intruder. I turned and ran wildly back the way I came. I raced blindly through deserted hallways, footsteps echoing close behind. Up ahead loomed a massive vault door marked Hangar B. It creaked open just enough for me to slip through before slamming shut. The lock spun with a heavy, final clunk. I found myself on a vast tarmac, filled with even more mammoth alien craft, all surrounded by heavily armed soldiers. One began rising with a metallic groan, rotors kicking up debris. Before I could react, some unseen force pulled me toward the craft. A beam of light enveloped me, lifting me up effortlessly into its belly. As the hatch sealed below, I knew I was trapped in the clutches of something far beyond my comprehension. The ring still tingled familiarly, almost mockingly, reminding me this had been the plan all along. I was the chosen one, but for what sinister purpose? 
The craft accelerated skyward, the G-forces pressing me to the cold metal floor. Slowly, the planet's curve became visible out the thick glass windows. I shut my eyes, sending a silent prayer for anyone left behind on that fragile blue marble, drifting farther and farther into the distance below me. Wherever I was going, I knew Earth and humanity were now lifetimes behind me. The lights went out at exactly 8.17 p.m. One moment, my living room was bathed in the glow of the evening news. The next, pitch black as the TV blinked off. Oh, great, I muttered, fumbling for my phone to use its flashlight. Power outages were common enough in the rural town of Haven, especially on muggy summer nights like this, when everyone's AC was cranked up high. I flicked on my phone's flashlight and did a quick sweep of the house. Yep, everything was dead. Lights, appliances, the ambient whir of electronics. Even the street lights outside were dark, leaving the neighborhood shrouded in an eerie dusk. A chorus of neighbors shouting queries and complaints echoed down the street. My wife and I joined in, hollering from the front porch to see if anyone knew what had happened. The unanimous verdict was a substation malfunction. An inconvenience for sure, but nothing we small town folk couldn't handle with a little patience. I headed back inside to light some candles. As I turned to shut the front door, a flicker in the sky gave me pause. I peered out. Was that a plane flying overhead? But no, it was too large and silent, more like a drifting cloud backlit by moonlight. Except. The moon wasn't out tonight. The hair on the back of my neck prickled as I craned my head to follow the object's path. It wasn't alone, either. Two more huge, amorphous shapes drifted into view, emanating an otherworldly green glow. They were definitely not clouds. A primal unease stirred in my gut, whispering, get away, telling me I did not want to know the nature of those shapes in the sky. Honey, my wife called from the kitchen. Could you bring in some more candles? I lingered a moment longer, uneasy gaze fixed overhead. The shapes continued their silent traverse, showing no signs of stopping over our small town. Some kind of military aircraft, maybe? But what were they doing out here in the boonies? Did you hear me? My wife appeared behind me, her voice sharper. What are you looking at? I, I don't know, I stammered, pulling my eyes away. Weird lights in the sky. M military planes, I guess. Her eyes narrowed as she scanned the horizon. I don't see anything. A lame joke about my eyesight was on the tip of my tongue when a thunder's boom rent the quiet night open. We slapped our hands over our ears ducking instinctively as the windows rattled. Car alarms whooped a chaotic chorus down the street. Dogs howled, and alarmed neighbors stumbled into their yards. What the hell was that? My wife shouted over the din. Through the open door, we gaped as an enormous green fireball roared overhead, arcing toward the woods at the edge of town. It disappeared behind the trees with an earth-shaking crash leaving silence and swirling ashes in its wake. For the space of a few racing heartbeats, no one moved. Then our neighbors began shouting questions back and forth, asking if anyone had seen what had happened, if everyone was okay. I shook myself from my shocked stupor. I'm calling 911, I announced, reaching again for my phone. But when I tried to turn it on, the screen stayed black. I smacked it against my hand a few times, to no avail. Power's still out, my phone's dead. Can I borrow yours? It's dead too, my wife said. What did we just see? A meteor, maybe? Some space junk? I said. I peered uneasily up at the night sky, 
but it was now empty of any unexplained lights. Only a wispy trail of smoke snaked above the trees, marking the object's landing site. As I wondered aloud who might go to investigate, the streetlight suddenly flashed back on. A cheer went up from the growing crowd of residents now congregating on porches and sidewalks, glad to have light and power again after the disturbance. My phone vibrated in my hand as it rebooted. Before I could access anything, it began pinging and buzzing with emergency notifications from the county. I quickly scanned the flood of headlines demanding people stay inside and lock their doors and windows. Local emergency services were being overwhelmed by panicked calls, and law enforcement was struggling to maintain order in neighboring towns amid chaotic reports of strange lights in the sky and unidentified crashes. Officials were advising everyone to remain calm and stay put until the situation could be sorted out. Easier said than done, as panic was already rippling through our small community. More meteors and unidentified objects continued streaking overhead every couple of minutes, adding to the confusion and fear. Against official recommendations, some neighbors were hunkering down in their basements, while others were piling into cars and peeling out to flee town. I wanted desperately to believe there was some rational explanation, that this was all just a cosmic coincidence of space debris falling at once. But an increasingly insistent voice deep inside whispered that this was only the beginning of something far more sinister. My worst suspicions were confirmed minutes later, when a bone-rattling roar echoed from the woods, like the shriek of a gigantic metal beast. The ground vibrated beneath our feet, as the trees themselves seemed to shudder and recoil from whatever was approaching. From the billowing smoke, lumbered an enormous tripedal machine, easily five stories tall, its massive metal hull wreathed in a menacing aura. Searing red lights flashed from its joints as it strode into town, swiveling a lone eye to survey the panicked prey before it. There was nowhere to run, nowhere to hide from the merciless gaze of the alien invaders. I stood frozen, mesmerized by abject terror as the machine raised one colossal limb and took aim down the street. The gate was rusted, the fence overgrown but the foreboding air around the old military base remained palpable. I had heard stories, of course, urban legends of secret experiments and concealed truths, but those tales didn't deter me. Armed with a camera and the boundless optimism of an explorer, I pushed through the rotting barriers. The base lay like a fossilized relic, caught between the past and an uncertain decay. Buildings stood emptied of life, yet filled with the ghosts of classified actions. Most doors were locked or jammed, but one yielded as if inviting me into its secrets. It was an underground bunker, a dark descent into subterranean chambers. I flicked on my flashlight, illuminating corridors lined with locked metal cabinets and old office furniture. Then something caught my eye a file cabinet standing slightly ajar, its lock apparently defeated by time or previous intruders. Curiosity pulled me closer. The first few folders were mundane, predictable stuff, budget reports and duty rosters. But then I found it, a file marked with a symbol I had never seen, but instantly understood as being not of this world. It was as if the very sight of it instilled the symbol's meaning into my brain. Alliance. My hands shook as I leafed through the documents. What they revealed was a narrative so outrageous, yet so meticulously detailed, that disbelief turned into dread. This was no conspiracy theory. This was an actual alliance between high-ranking government officials and an alien civilization identified only by the same strange symbol. 
The file outlined joint projects, exchanges of technology and information, plans for public disclosure, and contingencies for keeping it all under wraps. Dates spanned decades, and some even projected into the future. Upcoming rendezvous, expected technological handovers, even a long-term agenda for the slow integration of the two civilizations. What really seized my attention was the handwritten notes scribbled in the margins, desperate warnings from what seemed like a dissenting officer. We don't know their true objectives, one note read. We are fools playing with fire, declared another. As I flipped through the last pages, I realized the documents became increasingly recent. The most chilling entry was the last, a single sentence typed and underlined. Final phase initiation imminent. A shiver crawled up my spine. I looked around, suddenly conscious of the enclosing darkness, of how deep underground I was, of how alone I felt. The air thickened, and for the first time I considered that I might not be alone at all. Just then, a noise echoed through the bunker, a mechanical hum gradually intensifying. My flashlight flickered, then died, plunging me into oppressive darkness. I fumbled to get it back on, heart racing, but it seemed drained of power. In that darkness, I felt a presence, not human, yet undeniably sentient, surrounding and analyzing me. Curiosity is both your strength and your downfall, a voice resonated in my mind. I recognized the form of telepathic communication, a cold stream of thoughts invading my consciousness. You have discovered a truth not meant for your kind, not yet. The weight of those words left me paralyzed. I felt my thoughts being sifted, evaluated, my actions weighed for their potential ripple effects. And as quickly as it came, the presence receded, fading into the depths of the hidden chambers around me. I found myself alone in the dark, the mechanical hum slowly receding, replaced by an unsettling silence. By some miracle, or perhaps an alien override, my flashlight flickered back to life. I left the file where I found it, hastily exiting the bunker and I fled the military base, my every step shadowed by an eerie sense of being watched. Days turned to weeks, and no one came looking for me. Life resumed its old rhythm, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being a marked man, of knowing too much, yet understanding too little. Recently, I've noticed them, people who don't quite fit in, whose gaze lingers a little bit too long who vanish when I look again. They're always there, on the periphery of my life, never intervening, but always observing. And each night as I try to sleep, the last thought that crosses my mind is that single haunting sentence, final phase initiation imminent. I still don't know what it means or when it will happen, but the unsettling realization lingers. I am now a small, involuntary part of this looming final phase, whatever it is. And so I wait, wondering when the true cost of my curiosity will reveal itself. It started as a hobby, rigging up old ham radio equipment in my attic to scan obscure frequencies on clear nights. Most often I'd only pick up static and garbled voices cutting in and out. But one cold February night, a new signal came through, crystal clear. A sequence of musical tones, almost like a synthesized choir chanting. It repeated every few minutes strong and purposeful. I recorded hours of it, transfixed. This was no random signal. It carried something meaningful, 
a clear message of some kind. I digitized the audio and ran it through decoding software to analyze the patterns. After days of work, a set of geographic coordinates emerged. To my shock, they pinpointed a remote spot less than 20 miles from my house. The signal had to be coming from there. The next morning, I hiked out to the coordinates located deep in the woods. I nearly dismissed it as just a prank when the alleged source came into view. A small ramshackle cabin stood tucked away off the trail. Was someone just broadcasting weird signals from their backwoods home? Curiosity propelled me forward, but nearing the cabin, things seemed off. Strange dish antennas, rolls of wire and other electronics cluttered the perimeter instead of firewood or tools. The windows emitted a faint blue glow. Apprehension swelled within me, but I had to see who or what was in there. I crept onto the porch and peered inside. Complex machines and panels covered every surface, flashing and beeping as abstract images raced across monitors. And working intently at a console was something I could barely comprehend. A tall, spindly being with huge, opaque eyes and pale blue skin. It took me a moment to accept that it was real and not human. I must have made a gasp because the creature's head jerked up to look right at me. I was too shocked to even panic as it moved swiftly to the door. It opened it halfway, studying me cautiously with those impenetrable black eyes. You should not be here, it finally said in a strangely resonant voice. But if you have decoded my broadcast, perhaps you can understand my situation. Please come in. Part of me wanted to bolt from this bizarre situation, but my curiosity won out. I slowly entered what I now realized was a spaceship in the guise of a cabin. The alien sat me down and offered fluid in a curious metal vessel. As I sipped the sweet libation, it began its tale. Its name was unpronounceable in my tongue, so I just called it Zarin. Many cycles ago, Zarin served as researcher on an exploratory vessel. Its crew had strict orders to covertly observe developing worlds without contact. But one day they encountered a grievous distress signal from Earth. Against protocols, they intercepted a primitive capsule hurtling through space. Inside were two distressed Earth creatures. While the creatures were safely returned, the unauthorized rescue led to disaster. Accused of dangerous cultural contamination, Zarin was exiled on this very planet, its actions sought to aid. Its crew abandoned it here over a century ago by Earth time. Zarin had been surviving and hiding, ceaselessly monitoring human airwaves to understand its caretaker's mysterious culture. My mind reeled taking all this in. Of all the backyard hobbyists to pick up its covert signal, Zarin was intrigued that I alone seemed drawn to make contact. It confessed that it had slowly been going mad from isolation and longed to make amends by using its knowledge to aid humanity. But first, it required help adapting to society. I knew then why that strange broadcast had called me so powerfully. A higher purpose had drawn me straight to this extraordinary refugee. Doing so came with great risk. Even interacting this far could be seen as treason by its people. But how could I turn away? After swearing to secrecy, I helped Zarin slowly integrate into the world. It learned English, adopted a human disguise, and made breakthroughs in science using its advanced knowledge while living anonymously among us. My relationship to this alien will forever remain hidden, but I know humanity has gained immeasurably from Zarin's presence, even if they remain oblivious. And this remarkable being can finally share its culture's wisdom after lifetimes of silence. The radio hobby that connected us across light years of separation was no accident. I was meant to help this alien in exile find a belonging in its newfound home. Within its tale, I see hope that our differences need not divide us. 
that the greatest rewards come from opening our minds to possibility. Zarin gave me the universe by showing me how to more fully inhabit this single fleeting life for however long our unlikely friendship can preserve. These events occurred two summers ago in the Grand Teton area. My boyfriend at the time, now husband, let's call him Harry, was an avid outdoorsman and also served in the military. I was an ecology major and wanted to spend more time outdoors, so he decided to take me on my first backpacking trip, just the two of us. For those who aren't familiar, the Grand Tetons are well known for their wildlife specifically grizzly bears. My only experience with bears up to this point was watching a little black bear cross the road from the safety of my car. Seeing grizzly country signs around every corner wasn't doing much to calm my nerves. The first incident. My boyfriend looked like Indiana Jones, machete hanging from his belt large knives attached to each side of his pack, bear spray strapped to his waist. You get the picture. The beginning of our 25 mile journey was all uphill. When in bear country, you're supposed to make noise so as to not startle the wildlife by accidentally sneaking up on it. As you can imagine, going up a steep hill while carrying a 40 pound pack makes it a little difficult to make conversation. We were an hour in and almost at the top of the ascent. I noticed that the woods had gone completely silent, save for the rushing stream that was to our left of the trail. Silent woods are never a good sign. This usually indicates that predators are nearby. At this point, I was in front of my boyfriend and we were about to crest the hill. For the past 20 minutes, we hadn't said a word to each other, having been too tired to speak. We noticed the silence at the same time and gave each other knowing glances. I came up over the top of the hill and immediately froze. Sitting not 10 feet in front of me in the middle of the trail was a grizzly bear. My husband wasn't aware yet, as he was behind me, so I did the first thing I could think of. While still in my frozen stance, I managed to take my arm and start flinging it wildly behind me, trying to get Harry's attention. I was too terrified to speak. The bear went from sitting to all fours, not looking away from us once. Harry quickly swung me around so that I was behind him, and he just started yelling. Being in the military, he knows how to yell. The grizzly wasn't quite phased as it started to walk slowly toward us. At this point, I was on the verge of passing out from terror. This bear was about five feet in front of us when we heard a loud crack coming from the woods to our right. The bear heard it too, and he bolted toward the stream. A second crack boomed again, this time much closer than before. My boyfriend said, it's probably just some falling branches, but we both knew that wasn't the case. At this point, we were walking quickly up the trail in an attempt to create some distance from the grizzly and those strange noises. I felt the hairs on the back of my neck stand straight up, and at the same moment, my boyfriend stopped moving in front of me. He turned around to look at me, and I turned around to look behind me. To this day, we're not sure what we saw. Back where we had been standing was a large black-brown mass. It looked to be three times bigger than the already large grizzly that we had seen just a few moments before. Its back was facing us, and then it stood on its hind legs. 
It looked similar to a bear, but something about the shape was just off. At this point, it was probably stupid to run away, but that is exactly what we did. We were aware of heavy footsteps behind us, but neither of us looked back. The footsteps eventually faded. At this point, I was a mess. My boyfriend was doing his best to console me. Honey, this is extremely unusual. The bears usually stay away from humans. We're going to be okay. I'm sure that won't happen again. That was enough to convince me to continue on the backpack. Not another hour later though, we reached a clearing where we decided to take a rest and have a snack. About a minute after we had sat down, I noticed bushes moving in a line toward the clearing, toward us. Out of the brush comes this adolescent grizzly who looks just as spooked as I'm sure we did, but he came straight for us. My husband, being the crazy nut that he is, decided to charge back at the bear while screaming, bear spray at the ready. That did the trick and the bear ran off. All I could think was just my luck, but that wasn't even close to what happened the second night. Night two. Before we began our backpack, we had to let the ranger station know which trails and route we planned to take. With this information, they usually send a ranger on horseback at some point during the backpack to check on you, just to make sure everything is okay. There weren't many approved trails left for us to choose from, and it was just our luck that they were the most difficult. Apparently, over the three days that we were on those trails, we had been the sole hikers. We didn't see a single other person once we were en route. However, I guess we missed the ranger who came to check on us. We had been following hoof prints the entire second day, and we hadn't seen any the day before. I had some foot problems, so we spent valuable daylight trying to adjust my boots, laces, and socks to compensate for the pain. When we started on the trail again, we had maybe an hour or two of daylight left, and in the woods, it gets dark fast. I was exhausted. It was now dark out, and Harry was the only one with a working headlamp, as mine wouldn't even turn on for some reason. We needed to find somewhere to set up camp, as we still needed to eat. It was freezing, and the wind was blowing. It was creating a howling sound as it rushed through the trees, which made it difficult to hear Harry or discern any other sounds coming from the woods. After another hour of hiking through the dark, we found a clearing. Well, it was more like a bowl. It looked to be about 200 meters in diameter, with the sides being about 10 meters down from the trail to the bottom of the clearing. This place was strange. We both felt it, though he didn't tell me how freaked he was until after we had left. There was no moonlight, so all we had was the illumination from his headlamp, our small camp stove, and the flashlight that I had fished from my pack. Half of the trees were dead or fallen, but just in the bowl. The vegetation everywhere else was very dense. To help alleviate my anxiousness, he started playing some music out of his portable speaker. This didn't help much, as it just echoed off the trees, creating a dissonance of sounds. He also thought that it would ward off any predators nearby. This is when we knew our anxiety was not paranoia. The silence was back. There hadn't been a single bird chirp since we arrived at the clearing. It also may have had to do with the obnoxious music, but because of our previous experience, we decided to turn off the music and head into the tent. Aside from everything else, it was freezing. As soon as we were situated in our sleeping bags, we heard deep cracks and thuds, 
echoing from beyond the tree line. Falling trees? There had been a lot of wildfires and very little rain this season. Thud. We both froze. That sound wasn't an echo. It came from inside the clearing, and it was definitely not a falling tree. Thud. It came from right outside our tent. We both stopped breathing. Harry's hand found mine, and we clung to each other, paralyzed. Something dragged across the outside of our tent, making an indent as it went along. It was thin, almost like a finger. What is it? I whispered, shaking. I don't know. It shouldn't be a person. We're the only ones on this side of the mountain. I was trying my hardest to stifle sobs, trying to listen to what was outside. I could hear steps, but I couldn't decipher what it was. The steps stopped, and then the whole side of the tent was slowly pushed inward. At this point, whatever was outside knew we were inside, so I shined my flashlight at the side of the tent. What I saw made my blood run cold. Pressed into the tent wall was the shape of a human face. I could make out the nose, an open mouth. Each time they breathed, it made the tent around their mouth billow in and out. Harry said, F that, and pulled a Glock from his sleeping bag. He cocked it and the sound shattered the silence. The face pulled back, and we heard fast footsteps heading toward the edge of the clearing. We didn't leave the tent till the sun was shining the next morning. The first thing we noticed was the smell of urine. We came out of the tent and looked around. Whoever it was had peed on our coals that we had left on the fire, leaving a disgusting stench of evaporated pee. Footprints surrounded our tent, circling around it multiple times. Muddy handprints decorated the outside of our tent. At least, we think it was mud. The takeaway? Wildlife is not the most dangerous thing in the backcountry. When I was a kid, I lived in Clinton, Tennessee. Both parents worked full time, so I was often sent over to stay with my grandparents, who had a plot of land in the vicinity of, but not right in, Mossheim, near Greenville. Both of them had been in East Tennessee for their whole lives, and that area for a good many years. They had been established at their home for some decades before this story, and remained there a good time after. Recently, I had reason to return to that area in Tennessee after having spent the majority of my adult life in Minnesota. Being in and around the area, driving the same roads, made me reminiscent about my lazy summer days tucked away at my grandparents, learning to shoot on the same 22 with which Grandpa had taught Mom, feeding fish at a neighbor's stocked pond, or spotting deer and bear with binoculars from the back porch. When I relayed this to my mom, she in turn told me a story about a time that I scared my grandpa half to death, then lied about hanging out with Bigfoot. At first I had no idea what she was on about. Then I remembered exactly what actually happened with startling clarity. New context given by the experience adulthood provides. And no, this is not about Bigfoot or a cryptid. Before we start, some information about my grandparents' land. Their house was on a small hill surrounded by a grass lawn. The lawn gave way to a smallish hayfield and then the wood line. Those woods lasted for a good half mile to either side of the home and a good several miles to the back. 
I hated the hayfield because it was too pokey to play in, but I liked to hang out in a creek that ran behind it. To get there, I would walk to the edge of the property, just in the wood line, to avoid the hay. While at my grandparents, the only rules were that I stayed where I could see the house, so the house could see me. I was to take a whistle with me anywhere that I went. I didn't take the whistle, seeing it as a badge of my regrettably young age, and the best part of the creek was out of sight of the house. That was the only stretch where it got deeper than my knees, and thus the only part where I could swim. Naturally, I spent much of my time in that water splashing around, skipping stones, and being a kid. One day, I was playing in the creek when I noticed someone. It was a man, a stranger, on the bank watching me. He had long hair, a beard, and pale skin so dirty that it was stained. I couldn't tell his age and simply thought of him as old. I have no better guess now, as he clearly went through long years of hard living. He wore no shirt, no pants, only a wrap of dirty cloth around his waist that I thought of at the time as a Moses dress, thanks to some illustrated Bible stories. Around his neck, there were multiple necklaces made from knotted tatters of cloth, fiber, and string. In those knots were various pieces of bones, flowers, a bit of dark glass, things like that. When I first saw him there by the creek, I was terrified, terrified, frozen still. The man, however, was smiling. He gestured from his squat with an outstretched arm, fingers down, in kind of a wave. I didn't react, startled and reeling. Then he splashed at me, still smiling. He did it again. I splashed back, and soon we were playing. We both threw water at each other. He jumped into the creek and stomped around with me, laughing all the while. He threw rocks into the water, and so did I. I pushed him, he pushed me back. We carried on for some minutes until my grandma called for me. With her voice, a switch had turned off. The man stopped in his tracks, gaze fixed back toward the house. Then, as my grandma kept on hollering, he looked to me. He crept back to his side of the creek, barely disturbing the water, then slid into the brush, completely silent the whole way, holding my gaze. Once he was out of sight, I waited in the water until my grandma found me. She wanted to know if I was alone, and I said no. She became very tense, asking who was with me while looking around. I didn't answer. I didn't know how. Seeing no one, she pulled me back to the house without any more words, grip like iron the whole time. At the house, the real inquisition began. I didn't really have new words, the event and this reaction overwhelming my ability to explain. Such silence further irked my grandma, and I was swiftly placed in a corner, held without bail, awaiting patriarchal judgment. Around an hour later, my grandpa came home from work. He was told about my churlishness and was ready to set into me again with talking. I told him about the man, hairy and old, dressed like Moses, about how we played and he disappeared. I remember that they digested this for a few minutes before sending me to my room, and I was happy to go, and happier still that Grandpa didn't yell like he usually did when I misbehaved. Later, I was brought out for dinner. I ate in the kitchen with Grandma, but Grandpa called me to the back porch. He was on the swinging bench, looking out over the hayfield turned red by the setting sun. He had kicked off his boots and put them next to his shotgun. I knew that that was odd for the gun to be out of the closet. Previously, we had used it to shoot bottles. Some I would throw into the air like they were clay pigeons. These escapades were accompanied with speeches about how the gun was dangerous and only for adults to use. He went through my story again, his tone deadly serious. Eventually, he asked me how hairy the man was really. I told him very, thinking that this was the right answer. He asked where, 
and I told him everywhere like a bear. He ruminated on this and I grew more nervous, worried that I was in trouble or causing trouble, just wanting the trouble, whatever it was, to end. So when he finally asked me to swear in the name of Christ and on my mother that I was telling the truth about everything, I said that I had been joking. He finally yelled then and sent me back to my room. The family memory became that I had hid by the creek and made up a tale about Bigfoot. At the time, everybody was upset with me, and I was forbidden from going back to the creek or anywhere out of sight. The enforcement of this rule, like the others, was lackluster. Even so, for a time, I didn't go there. In my memory, I stayed away for a very long time, but I'm sure it was only a few days that hiatus feeling interminable to my elementary-aged self. When I did start going back to the crick, I took a bucket of toys and a thick stick plucked from the woodlands on the way. I think I was conflicted about what to do if the man came back, imagining either impressing him with my toy collection or clubbing him, or both in turn. When he did show back up, he appeared next to me as I dozed under a tree on my side of the crick. I was once again gripped with terror. He was not smiling, his face expressionless as he lurked beside me, having watched for who knows how long before I smelled him. I scrambled away, leaving behind my stick and toys. Coming to my feet a yard out, I stood in the sun while the man watched me from the shade. Eventually, he crouched and started to look through my bucket. I remember becoming indignant as he examined my toys one by one, only to toss them into the dirt. It became too much and I started to lecture the man, telling him how he got me in trouble and he was a weirdo and he stank. At some point, he stopped looking through my things and calmly watched my tirade. Face still neutral, eyes analytic. Once I had concluded my lecture, I sat back under the tree to pout. I remember the man made a noise, a grinding kind of snort, and when I looked over at him, he was chuckling while he inspected the last few figures in my bucket. I wanted to laugh too, but I was more determined to stay sullen. Once everything was out of the bucket, he put one figure, Ghidorah, back into the bucket. He then stood to his hunched fullest, took the bucket by its handle, began to make his way back into the woods. I stayed by the tree until he turned, said something, not a word that I knew then or know now, and gestured with a forward sweep of his hand. At first I didn't comply, despite knowing that he wanted me to follow. After a few moments, he yipped, clicked his teeth, and gestured again more emphatically. With this further prompt, I did get up and come along the man making approving noises and putting on his smile again. We went into the woods. The man led, but he was naturally quicker and quieter, making it hard for me to keep up. Eventually, he would stop where he lost me, knocking on trees with sticks and whistling arrhythmically so that I might find him in the vegetation. He never came back for me, opting instead to guide me forward with the noises. I became lost, having only a vague sense of my grandparents' place behind me. After some time, maybe 15 minutes, we came to a bald. The man had me wait there, indicated by patting the ground, before going into the tree line alone. He returned from a different direction, pulling a sled. It was made from half of a discarded plastic drum and lined with small pelts and smooth bark. On the back half, there rested the fly-covered carcasses of squirrels, possums, and other critters savaged into anonymity. On the pulling end, woven pouches were tied into place on it by the same eclectic cordage that made the man's necklace. He put my bucket on the sled and tossed Ghidorah in a pouch. He then called me closer with a glottal noise and a beckoning wave. I saw the sled's pouches held many odds and ends, dried salamanders, mushrooms, metal bits, glass fragments. From one, the man pulled a square, 
made from bound together sticks just big enough to slip over my wrist. From another he pulled a piece of fool's gold and a small shard of geode crusted with a bit of purple crystal. These he handed to me with an air of busyness and a few more utterings of nonsense. He then patted the ground for me to sit again. I did so without much bewilderment, understanding that we had traded the same as exchanging Pokemon cards at Rhesus. I did not much miss Ghidorah anyway, as he was a bad guy. The bucket was a loss. In retrospect, I think Ghidorah was chosen because its dull gold scales resembled something valuable. The bucket for its obvious ability to hold things. The man came back lapping his thigh. I did this readily. During the hike back, I tried to keep up and pay attention. I did so moderately well, having to be whistled over a few times. I did notice that our path was not straight. The man led me one way and then another, making turns unneeded by the lay of the land. We eventually came out by the creek, but from a different approach than we had left it. I could hear my grandma calling for me again, not from up on the hill, from far out in the field. The man would not cross the creek, but pushed me to do so. I did, but not to go to my grandma. Instead, I crept back to the house and around the opposite side. There I laid in the shrubs by our front door, pretending to sleep when I was found. I swore that I had been there the whole time. When I was sent back to my room, I placed my fool's gold, crystal, and charm in my bedside table for safekeeping. The next day, I went back into the creek to pick up my toys. The man was not there. However, throughout that summer, he did visit me again, to sit under the tree or throw rocks at the water or yammer softly to himself. I would bring snacks and candy to share, and he would likewise give me stringy dried meat, which I ought not to have eaten, or honeysuckle blossoms, which I would still eat, take in from my old bucket. He seldom visited long and never splashed and whooped like the first time he did on that first meeting. At this point, you might be wondering why I've posted this to Backwoods Creepy and not Backwoods Weird but Wholesome, I guess. Well, that's because there are two more occasions that I want to tell you about. One gruesome, one awful. The eventful one occurred near the 4th of July. I had brought two boxes of bang snaps to the creek. The man was initially wary of the little fireworks, but quickly came to appreciate their miniature pyrotechnics. He took the box I gave him gratefully, even taking the empty box, likely for the wood shavings, which are excellent tinder. During the use of the bang snaps, I had scared a turtle into the water and to the opposite bank. It sat there watching us from the far shore, if you're squeamish about animal stuff, this is probably a part you should skip. The man, after stowing the bang snaps in the bucket, noticed the turtle. With little thought, he scooped up a smooth stone and threw it with force and accuracy into the turtle. He then waded over to retrieve the slider, which struggled meekly in his grasp, one leg knocked off clean. On my side of the river, he took from the bucket a new piece of stone. One side was rounded and fit in his hand. The other came to a flinty cutting edge. Working with deft experience, the man began chopping the live turtle above its neck, pulling up on the shell top. I'll spare you the rest of the details, but the thing struggled and it was horrible to witness. The man rinsed the shell in the river and offered it to me. In wordless horror, I ran. That evening, I came back to shuffle the dead turtle into the flowering waters of the creek. The shell itself was nowhere to be found. This experience did not deter me from going to the creek, or the man from visiting again. However, sometimes he would try to call me away from the creek with thumps and whistles. I would tell him I heard him and refused to move. On some occasions, he would join me. On others, he would leave. The last time we met, we were sitting under the tree sharing cowtails. From the woods, there came whistling and the staccato knocking of a woodpecker. The man looked up and whistled back. 
there were a few more such exchanges before he stood, collected his bucket, and beckoned for me to follow. I was curious, and I felt comfortable with the man as a guide, so I did as I was asked. He took me to the bald, a direct path this time, periodically stopping to call or respond to the other in the woods. Waiting for us at the bald was a woman and a child. The woman was dressed the same as the man, topless and wrapped around the waist. She was dirty, with long hair and a wiry frame. The child was in a similar state, wearing a sack that went to their knees. The man sat on the ground and the woman joined him, sitting in his lap but leaning forward so that her elbows rested on her crossed knees. She had dark brown eyes that were fixed to me. The other child would not look up. I didn't know what to do and I didn't speak. The other kid lifted their sack to wipe at their nose. The man made a noise and drummed on the woman's back. The kid looked at them, still hanging her head, hair covering her face. The woman yammered and swatted at what I now figured was a girl lazily. The man echoing her noises, slapping skin to skin once more. At this bizarre scene, the girl stumbled toward me, stopping close enough that I could smell her and hear her wheezing breath. She was thin but not emaciated and slightly taller than me should she have straightened up. The man and woman fussed some more and the girl leaned close and pressed her cheek to mine. Her hair was in between us, greasy and cold. She made no move to embrace me, no move at all, only pressing limply against me and breathing so loud that it was all I could hear. During this time, the woman had approached. She pulled the girl back by her shoulder with one hand and delivered a flurry of slaps to the crown of the girl's head. The woman then gathered the girl's hair into one hand, using the other to sweep back her bangs. The girl was then made to look at me, face bare. One side of her jaw was bulged out, smooth skin over a lemon-shaped bump. Her mouth was twisted by this deformity, her nose faced to one side as if affixed sideways and leaked a trail of clear snot. One eye was bulged and roomy, the other startlingly regular. It looked at me, blank and dark brown. The woman gave the girl's head a little shake, spat off to the side and then cooed like a dove as she smiled at me. I fled. There was commotion behind me. I think the girl was pushed to the ground. I did not look back and they did not pursue. My flight ended at my grandparents' house, my absence unnoticed. I chose not to tell anyone what had happened, wanting to forget and not wanting to get into trouble again, not thinking about the girl, the couple, and what might have been intended for me. I spent that August inside whenever I visited my grandparents. I begged not to be taken, claiming that it was boring and lonely. Sometimes when I sat on the porch or went from the car to the house, I'd catch a snippet of a bird call on the wind or the distant tapping of wood and hurry inside. My grandma could tell something was wrong and made an effort to entertain me in town. My grandpa cared in his own way, involving me in his errands as he never had before. Eventually, school started. Classes and friends eased me away from the thoughts of the dirty man and the people in the clearing. Time did the rest. I think now that all of the people in the clearing were a family, but their features, white skin, brown eyes, brown hair, are common enough that they all could have been unrelated. They knew each other's signs and signals. They used their own words. I know that the Smokies are full of tales of feral people wild men and superstition. I also know that they are full of people living in unlikely ways in unlikely places, and that those real people call others kin, and that through the chain of human connection, even a recluse living in a rundown shack is someone's somebody. I guess I'm asking if the people in my story are somebody someone too, or if they're known, if their behavior rings any bells, belies any known intention. I figure that wherever this tale goes, 
maybe somebody will know who they are, and hopefully you won't discount this tale out of hand. Either way, now that I've remembered everything about that time period, I doubt I'll ever forget it again. In order to really convey how scared I was when this happened, I'm gonna have to back up and give you a little context. For starters, I've told the whole story to maybe a handful of my closest friends, and the only family I've ever told is my twin sister. Even then, it only came up because they initiated conversations about similar topics regarding the paranormal. If I can help it, I'd rather not talk about it in real life. But here, on the wilds of the internet though, I guess I feel a little bit safer. It's also worth noting that I've included several instances that may or may not be related. Whether or not they truly are is a matter of personal speculation, but they are all paranormal nonetheless. If I had to pinpoint where it all began, I would say it was 2008, when I stayed home alone pretty much all summer. My sisters attended the Boys and Girls Club, and my parents worked all day. I was just a 13-year-old boy then, so staying home alone was pretty much the greatest thing I could think of. All I had on the agenda every day was eating junk food, playing video games, and doing whatever small chores I was assigned. Not a bad way to spend a summer. And it wasn't. For a few weeks, anyhow. When things started, though, they started small. Every couple of days, my mom would come home pissed off when she saw both of our dogs outside. We lived in North Alabama, so summer was hot and swampy. Because of that, we tended to keep the dogs inside until they needed to be let out to do their business, but it would never be any more than about 10 minutes. I loved those dogs, so I adhered to the 10 minute rule very strictly. It was also why I was so confused to see them outside on those days. I definitely did not let them out. Sure, I can be forgetful sometimes, Maybe one or two of those times I really did just have a brain fart, but I was 100% sure that most of those times I never let those dogs out. When I told that to my mom, she looked kind of concerned. Then I started hearing things. With freshly installed hardwood floors, I was familiar with the sound of them settling when the AC kicked on. It would be one or two popping sounds, then it would stop until the AC turned off again. Rinse and repeat. Nothing crazy about that. One day, while I was binge playing old Nintendo games, I heard the board settling again. But this time, it wasn't because of the AC. And instead of one or two pops, there were several dozen moving around. They went up and down the hallway, like somebody was pacing around. I paused my game and I listened to them. Thinking maybe my mom or my stepdad were back early from work, I went out to see them and make sure the dogs were back inside so I wouldn't get chewed out again. But nobody was home. I shrugged it off as the floorboards just being particularly active that day, and I went back to playing my game once more. About an hour passed before the sounds repeated. The same quiet little footsteps. I paused my game again, and I listened harder this time. Another sound surfaced on top of the steps. It was kind of like trying to hear somebody else's phone call from across the room. You know there's a conversation going on, but you can't quite make out what it's about. I went to look again, this time going all the way across the house and into my parents' room. Still nobody. Then I thought, well, maybe the conversation was coming from outside in the neighborhood. I brought the dogs out back with me, and they went and did their business while I waited on the porch. From what I could tell, it was just another stiff, silent summer day. This particular thing happened a few more times, and it always made me feel really uneasy. It was even worse when I told my mom about it. She replied, Oh good, you hear it too. Then she went on to tell me not to tell my stepdad, 
because he was very religious and for some reason didn't believe in any of this stuff. Things settled down after summer was over and they stayed that way for a while. I had school to keep me occupied, and other than a few small instances, we had two quiet years. 2010 was the year things picked up a lot more. While my twin and my girlfriend at the time were hanging out in her room, they started messing around taking dumb pictures with digital cameras. Now my twin's room was the coldest in the house, and nobody could ever figure out why. It also used to belong to my older sister. Both times either of them moved into the room, their demeanor would change over the course of a few months. Where my older sister became more manic, throwing tantrums with growing frequency, my twin was starting to get depressed, sleeping all the time and always being fairly disconnected. While all three women in the house suffered from manic depression, bipolar disorder, and sometimes both, there was a very noticeable difference when my sisters occupied the room. And that digital camera my twin was playing around with? There was a picture on it that we didn't find for weeks after the fact that showed my girlfriend at the time and a really weird, smoky, veil-like presence in the room with them. Neither of them smoked, and the room never smelled like anything, so we weren't allowed to have candles in our room either. I'm still kicking myself for not saving that photo somewhere, because I think it might have been a good piece of evidence. On top of the apparition caught on my camera, my mother told me of an instance where footsteps walked from the kitchen and into the study where she worked on some stuff for her job. When the steps entered the room, she heard a voice whisper, ouch, very clearly into her ear. The next few experiences were things only I witnessed. They are, by and large, the more extreme parts of what I now guess to be a haunting and they started in the summer of the same year, with my first episode of sleep paralysis. I had known about the phenomenon before it happened to me. My mom was a sufferer of frequent night terrors and the occasional paralysis. I also had a friend with narcolepsy that told me about it at school. The first time it happened to me, I wasn't too unsettled. It was on a weekend, and I drifted off watching Netflix. The next thing I knew, I was wide awake, and a few episodes of the show had gone by. I reached for a bottle of water by my bed, but I found that I couldn't move at all. It was strange, and almost calm. I just kind of accepted what was happening, and I let it run its course. It eventually did. I got up, had a drink of water, went to the bathroom, and then went back to bed. A few days after the paralysis, things started moving around on their own. Another day spent home alone, I was once again playing video games and avoiding any responsibilities. As I had tried giving up soda that year, I almost always had a cup on my desk filled either with orange juice or empty. There was rarely an in-between. This cup, however, just fell over in front of my eyes. There was no slant on the desk or anything like that. Nothing other than the cup was on it. It just tipped over, like someone had smacked it over. While I thought it was odd, I set it back upright and went on with my gaming. I had settled that it was some kind of trick of gravity, which in hindsight sounds way more ridiculous than a poltergeist. This was immediately followed by the sound of a bird hitting my window, my light bulb exploding overhead, and the cup once again tipping over. Unable to rationalize it this time, I scrambled out of my room and into the kitchen, where my stepdad was eating. As I said earlier, my mom asked me not to talk to him about anything paranormal, but I was pretty shook up by what I had just seen. He asked me if I was alright. I told him that a bird had flown into my window and kind of scared the crap out of me, to which he laughed. I didn't sleep very well that night. The last and most extreme incident I had at that house happened just about a week later my second episode of a sleep paralysis. It was a Sunday morning and I could hear my family moving about the house to get ready. It didn't take me long to prepare myself, so I tended to sleep in an extra 15 minutes. As I fell back to sleep, a familiar feeling came over me. Unable to speak, I couldn't call for help. A weight on my chest made it difficult to breathe. I was incapable of moving. Thinking it would pass like last time, I just 
waited. It became evident very quickly that this was not going to be like last time. What little daylight there was coming in through the curtains turned blood red. Instead of the calm I had during the first episode, I grew very unsettled. It was dark now, and the room looked like one of those photo development rooms in terms of color. My door opened on its own. A figure stood there, just looked like a silhouette, all dark and shrouded. It wore what appeared to be a robe made of thick fur, and kept its hood drawn over. Even though my room was normally comfortable, I felt the temperature drop. I could see my own breath, and the breath of this figure. It just kept staring at me. Something about it felt evil, like it was waiting to do something awful to me. I tried to yell and make it go away. I even attempted to invoke the name of Christ, but I couldn't speak or breathe enough to do so. The blood red changed to pitch black. The figure disappeared into it, but a pair of dark red eyes pierced through me from where it stood. I then saw two numbers sort of fly at me. Thirteen and three. That's when the paralysis ended, I got up, and I went to church. I've since lost my faith and I'm no longer religious. Just what I saw that morning is still a mystery to me. But I did follow up on those two numbers that same morning in church. Psalm chapter 13, verse 3, reads in the King James Version, quote, Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Lighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Needless to say, I got chills, and I still do every time I tell the story. I have had many paranormal, seemingly extraterrestrial, glitch in the matrix and skinwalker experiences. I think one too many for one person to have. The one I am going to tell you about freaks me out to this day. There is quite a bit of detail to this story, so I will try to make it as coherent as possible. The time was 2011, my final year of high school. Now, I am a Navajo from a small reservation in New Mexico, and the nearest city is 30 miles west. I attended a public school in that city. Therefore, I had to wake up at 5 a.m. every morning to catch the bus at 6, which picked up more kids along the way, and we would arrive with just enough time to get breakfast before class at 7.25. This particular morning seemed normal. My alarm went off at 5. I showered, fixed my hair, and was ready by 5.40. I would usually give myself 10 to 15 minutes to make some breakfast and pack my lunch. I did just that and decided to have Pop-Tarts that morning. I checked the time on the stove clock and it was 5.50. I popped the tarts into the toaster and went to my room to gather my things into my backpack. As I was finished with that, I saw that my alarm clock read 5.55 and I went to grab my Pop-Tarts. The stove clock read 5.56. We had a big clock right by our front door, and it also read 5.56. I checked the time often so that I could perfectly time my walk to the bus so that it showed up just as I arrived at my bus stop. Additionally, it was a winter morning and it was dark out. The sun didn't start to come up until about seven, and I didn't want to be stuck in the cold dark for too long. Normally, when I stepped outside, there would be cars driving about, neighbors who turned on their vehicles to warm them up from a frigid winter night. But that morning, there was nobody, and that was a bit strange to me, but I didn't pay that fact any mind. Now, since it's the reservation, aka the middle of nowhere, where I lived, there wasn't much light either. Few residents had streetlights in the cluster of homes where I lived. Unfortunately, the route that I walked every day had no street lights, so the only lights I could see in the near pitch black were the ones at my back from our porch light in the north, a neighbor's porch light who lived three acres away in the southern direction, 
and the far-off lights of the city that lit the sky in the east. There were also the lights from the reservation clinic, which was about a mile south as well. I should also let you know that each home in a cluster of homes is set on an acre lot. My bus stop was two acres away. I would walk directly south to meet up with the only paved road, the highway, which met the dirt road in the east. From my home to that stop, it only took me a minute or two. When I stepped outside, nothing was astir, which, like I said, was really odd. However, I wasn't out there alone, because although it was almost pitch black, I saw the silhouette of a girl who caught the bus at the same time as I did, and at the same stop. Good, I thought, I'm not out here alone. I followed about ten feet behind her. When we neared the stop, she veered off to the cattle guard, where she always sat to wait for the bus. I always sat on the porch steps of my uncle's house when the bus hadn't arrived yet, which was only about five to ten yards from the bus stop. When I sat on those steps, I started to notice more and more things that were out of place. One of those was the fact that my uncle, an early riser who was always awake by five, who always had his lights on by the time I was catching the bus, was not awake. He wasn't out having his morning coffee as usual. No lights, no sounds from inside his house. I thought, maybe he's sleeping in today. Then the neighbor whose home was three acres away from mine, my uncle's next door neighbor, whose porch light was on, would normally have had their vehicle running, warming up by now, and their lights would be on showing that somebody was awake and probably getting ready for work. But there were no signs of anybody being awake at all, and the truck wasn't on. Well, maybe they have the day off, I thought, still waiting for the bus. The other girl's silhouette I could see from the city lights that lit the sky to the east, and she was still sitting there and waiting as well. I was a little bit unsettled, but I didn't start to feel really creeped out until I started to hear the howls and yelps from what sounded to be a pack of coyotes that seemed to be only across the main highway. Since I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I had guessed that I was waiting for about 10 minutes. Finally, I thought, okay, this is ridiculous. Where is the bus? It should have been here by now. I was on time, and it was very unlike the bus or the bus driver to pick us up more than five minutes late. I decided to wake up my uncle and ask if maybe we had missed the bus, so I knocked on his door for a good three minutes, to no avail. Then I just decided to walk over and ask the girl if she wanted to walk back to our homes together, since I was sufficiently weirded out by the events. As I neared her and where she sat, my eyesight adjusted in the darkness, and when I was within arm's reach, I saw that there was nobody there. I thought I was going crazy. My mind raced, and I felt panic and queasy in the pit of my stomach. All the creepy skinwalker and paranormal stories that I had heard over the years began to run amok in my mind. But what remains from those stories was that I was always told to never fear any of it. You should never be afraid of the evil things that lurk in the darkness, because your fear is their fuel. I decided not to panic and run home. Instead, I just walked briskly back home, still able to hear the whoops and calls from the nearby pack of coyotes and trying to figure out what was going on. When I got inside, I went to my mom's room and asked to use her cell phone. Just as she was about to hand me her cell, she took a second glance at the screen and said, It's four in the morning. What do you need my phone for? Shock took hold of my body, and all I could do was stand there with my mouth wide open as she trailed her remark with, Are you awake? Have you been sleepwalking? I have never sleptwalked in my entire life, and my reply felt forced, like I had to convince her that I was awake. I ran back to the kitchen. The clock read 4 a.m. The clock by the front door read 4 a.m. And the alarm clock in my room read 4 a.m. I don't know anything about any of these types of sleep disorders, 
But I seriously think that there's no way for me to have gone through with my usual routine the way that I did asleep. Needless to say, I was sufficiently freaked out and crawled back into bed. So freaked out I didn't even take my shoes off. I fell asleep thinking of the whole situation, and ironically I missed the bus that day. I told my third oldest sister, there are four of us and I'm the youngest, about what had happened. She was a little shocked at what she was hearing, and then she began to tell me of a dream she had before my experience. Now, her dreams we have begun to revere as visions of sorts, since she's had many of them end up coming true. Her earliest one, I remember, was when we were in elementary school, and my dad called and said that earlier in the day he was in a small airplane, and that they nearly crashed into the mountains near San Carlos, Arizona. She told us about a dream about being in an airplane, in a heavily forested area, that the plane was about to crash, but was able to land safely a few days before we got that call from our dad. Since then, she's had others, and some she tells us about, and others she doesn't. Before I tell you about the dream, I must also tell you about a weird incident that happened to said sister at my eldest sister's house. This particular incident happened the summer preceding the winter. I had a weird experience. My sister, the dream visionary, would stay over at my eldest sister's house to help babysit my nephews. They would stay up very late, and one night or morning, because it was around 2 a.m., they heard a sort of banging in the back of the house. My sister and the nephew went out to check. When they opened the door, they saw two horses, one white and one brown, kicking with their hooves and hitting their heads against the big garbage bins, which were knocking into the house. It was as if they were trying to get in, but for what, we had no clue. To add to that weirdness, my sister's house is in a housing development that has two entrances, and since it's on the reservation, those entrances have cattle guards. So how could those two horses have gotten in? Anyway, they chased the horses out of the yard and they galloped off to who knows where. Anyway, back to her dream. She said that she was asleep at my eldest sister's house and woke up to the same banging noise that those horses had been making that night in the summer. She said she got up and walked to the front window and looked out past the blinds and saw those same horses standing just inches from her on the other side of the window. Then she saw the two horses shape shift into people, an in-law and his son. They had menacing looks on their faces, and she said she felt that they were pure evil. She yelled at them to go away, and as soon as she turned away, she saw me, sleepwalking toward the back door. She went to grab me to put me back in bed, but as she got closer, she saw that the back door was wide open and that the son was beckoning me to follow him, to go outside. As I took a few steps out the door, she pulled me back inside, slammed and locked the door, and laid me back down. And that was where her dream ended. The story, however, gets creepier. After that weird time warp occurrence coupled with my sister's dream, my mom decided to take me to see a medicine man to have a prayer ceremony. He said that it was a skinwalker who was messing with our family. He said that the skinwalker intended to destroy my mom's life, but that she was too strong and that the harm it wished for her would then fall to her children, the weaker ones. And here I thought I was being pretty strong. Further, he said that the skinwalker impersonated the shadow of the girl who usually rode the bus with me and was also the one who created the sounds of the coyotes. The skinwalker created an illusion to lure me outside, and that the skinwalker was someone within the family. After the prayer ceremony, he said that I should never repeat anything that he said, or even the events that occurred. I don't think a lot of people heed that, though. I don't know if he would call it a warning or advice from the medicine man, but a lot of Navajos, if you get close enough to them, and they're not super traditional, will tell you all about scary and weird skinwalker stories of their own. They're pretty common. And even the ones that caused them to have to get a prayer or ceremony done, they'll tell those too. And this story is mine.
A little bit of background about myself. I've worked my entire adult life in the Pacific Northwest woods, over 15 years in total, with about seven years of that being for the Park Service at Olympic National Park. Many, many experiences over the years could warrant the title of creepy, but this one in particular has always stuck with me. While working for the Park Service, one of my jobs was that of a restoration carpenter. We would travel to old backcountry historical cabins, emergency shelters, homesteads, and chalets, tasked with repairing and restoring them to their original historically accurate states. This was a wonderful and demanding job. I'd spend eight days at a time living off the beaten path, usually deep in the backcountry. Sometimes we'd be flown in supplies. Sometimes we'd use llamas or mules to pack our gear all the while sleeping in thinly walled single tents, cooking over a fire or whisper light stove, using the same tools and techniques the original homesteaders had at their disposal in the late 1800s to construct and survive in this unforgiving environment. One late fall, I was assigned to work near Lake Ozette at an old homestead off the trail near the constructed boardwalk. For those unfamiliar with the area, Lake Ozette is eight miles long and three miles wide. It sits as the largest unaltered natural lake in Washington. Lake Ozette has a long and rich history of Native American culture. The Macaw Tribal Center in Nia Bay houses discoveries found in the area dating back 2,000 years, along with a local village that was well preserved over 300 years ago by a mudslide that left most of the artifacts intact. The Ozette Loop Trail, which the homestead was directly adjacent to, is approximately 9.4 miles through and through. The man-made boardwalk takes you under giant cedar groves and meanders through huge patches of chest-high salal before delivering you to Alstrom's Prairie, about two and a half miles from the trailhead. Alstrom's Prairie, a giant, soggy meadow, was once farmed by two Swedish immigrants. They constructed a small cabin and some outbuildings on the 150-acre bog. With cattle, sheep, vegetable gardens, and the help of a little Swedish ingenuity, they managed to etch out lives for themselves here over 50 years. Over time, the forest, as it always does, decided to take back what was once its own. The now decades-long abandoned farm was hardly recognizable. Our job was to beat back the encroaching forest, put new windows in the main cabin, pipe in a new stove, apply fresh paint, and fix up portions of the semi-dilapidated barn. The ultimate goal being to allow guided tours to take place sometime in the future. For about three weeks, we stayed at the OZ bunkhouse while working at Alstrom's. This was good duty for us. We weren't sleeping under the rain, our beds were warm, our hike was short, and the terrain was not difficult. We even had a TV. The bunkhouse was located near the highway and ranger station. We would hike the five-mile loop every day, bringing with us boards, tools, paint, and everything else we needed on our backs. These were full 10-plus hour days, usually starting in the morning around 7 o'clock and beginning our evening return hike back to the bunkhouse around 5. At one point during the fall, there were four of us working this project, but at the time of this event, there were only two of us remaining. Most of the hard work had already been finished. We needed to hike a few last boards into the prairie to complete a portion of the woodshed before we called the job done. I volunteered to be the pack mule for the day, my only job being to carry as many boards as I could muster in each trip to the prairie before returning to the ranger station for the next load. It was late in the season for hikers at this point, and the weather had turned. We'd be lucky to see two to three people a day going the loop. After around my fourth or fifth trip, I was pretty wiped. It was getting late in the evening now, around four o'clock, and my coworker had called it a day. I thought I could get one more trip in before it got too dark, my rationale being that the more trips I did that day, the less I'd have to do the next. 
We passed on the trail, I told him my intentions, and I continued on. I delivered the last of the boards for the day, took a look around the prairie as the sun began to tuck behind the trees, and started my hour-long hike back to the ranger station. The lighting on the boardwalk was quite low at this point, the cedars blocking most of the ambient light left by the setting sun, and made visibility quite diminished. I'm not a nervous hiker, and I failed to spook easily, having solo hiked for weeks on end in the backcountry. I've been stalked by cougars, confronted by Kodiak bears in Alaska, and I've even ran into a few hillbillies over the years. Not the good kind. As I left the prairie that evening, the hair on my neck stood on end. Goosebumps erupted on my forearms. An uneasy feeling swept over me, and suddenly I wanted to walk faster, then jog, then sprint. I didn't. Instead, I convinced myself I'd been reading too many novels before bedtime. I walked another five minutes or so, before I started to hear something faint. Something that sounded like music. Impossible, I told myself. I'm the only one out here. And I'm still at least two miles from civilization. And that civilization, in reality, was the only other soul out there, my coworker. Sure enough, though, I heard music. More specifically, a piano. It started out so faintly that I had to stop moving and actually try to hear it, the steps on the wooden boardwalk being too loud. Every time I paused, it became unmistakable, and it got louder. I stood there, sun now fully hidden behind the horizon, in total silence other than this piano. I became aware that there were no longer the sounds of other life. No birds, no insects, no wind, no rustling of leaves or underbrush. Absolutely nothing other than the piano. As if everything was being weighted down by a fog of emptiness of some kind. I've encountered this dead time before in the woods. Certain places have it, but this was different somehow. Unique to this place unique to this moment in time. I tried to focus on the keys, but I couldn't recognize the composition. Unsurprising, as I mostly listened to Metallica and Korn at the time. It was playing with a purpose. It was controlled, in tune, thoughtful. It was a song, and somehow, I felt that it was meant just for me in that moment. I started walking again, almost on cue. The music got louder. As my pace increased, so did the tempo of the keys, still in tune, never faltering. It reached a climax, the perfect combination of my haste, my dread, my heartbeat, and the tempo of this music. And then, as quickly as it had started, the piano stopped, whooshed away in the fraction of a moment. It didn't trail off, it didn't fade into extinction, it was just gone. Suddenly, everything that was absent was swept away as if by a gust of wind. The stillness was gone. The gloom, the stagnation and weight of everything was lifted. My next step on the boardwalk was once again in reality. The evening was just as absent of light as before, but it felt like life somehow was once again injected back into the forest. The woods seemed normal again. I didn't hear the piano again that night, and I haven't since. I told my coworker every detail when I reached the bunkhouse, and he showed no sign of disbelief. We didn't talk about it again until years later, when something similar happened to another Park Service employee. When I told my grandfather about what happened, as he was a retired park ranger who had worked nearby at Mora, the next station over, Without the least bit of hesitation, he asked, Did you hear the bagpipes along with it, or was it just the piano this time? It seems, as I've learned and experienced since then, that there is a lot more to that place, a lot more to the Olympics in general, than anyone really knows or is willing to admit. I 
I am a 23-year-old female, and my husband is a 23-year-old male, and recently we moved in with some roommates. They are James, male 26, Danielle, female 25, and their young daughter Sarah. We went from living in a decent-sized city to living in the middle of nowhere, about an hour away. For context, we live in the south of the U.S., so it's rural, woodsy nowhere. We're really good friends with our roommates, and husband and I knew beforehand that they had both experienced some paranormal goings-on before we made the decision to move in. To be honest, I think husband and I forgot all about the paranormal stuff just before we moved. Everything was great when we were settling, we all got along really well, and it was so amazing to be in a place where we had our own space and were on equal ground with our roomies. Then one night, about a month later, husband, James, and I are all lounging in the living room area. Sarah was asleep in her room, as it was late. We're talking about the paranormal. Around 11.30 p.m., James has to go pick up Danielle from work. She works the late shift, about a half an hour away from us. As James is getting ready to leave, he mentions skinwalkers. Now, husband and I don't use this word. For those of you who don't know, speaking aloud the word skinwalker or wendigo is sometimes believed to attract these deadly creatures to you. Husband and I had strange and horrifying experiences at the last place we lived, after one of us made the mistake of saying it aloud. So we don't say it anymore. Our code word for it is flush pedestrian, if you're curious. As soon as James said it, I gasped. He laughed it off, but right before he left, he noticed something through the blinds on the back door of the house. He mentioned that he thought there was somebody in the backyard. In truth, we don't really have a backyard, the back of the house is right up against the edge of the woods, but we just call it the backyard. Husband and I, thinking that he's messing with us, laugh it off. Quickly though, we can see from James's face that he is not. We rush to look through the blinds, and sure as heck, there's something in the trees. It was incredibly hard to see, but it was a very, very tall and thin figure, darting quickly between the trees. It kept itself completely shrouded in the black shadows, and we couldn't make out any other features. James rushes outside, thinking that it's somebody on the property. Husband and I follow, not wanting him to be alone. I stay on the porch while husband rushes down the steps to follow James as he goes behind the house. The second he leaves my eyesight, James immediately turns around and shakes his head at husband. He tells us that as soon as he got to the edge of the trees, he heard a low voice saying, turn around. I come from a pagan background. My mother is Wiccan and my husband is also pagan. As James leaves, the husband and I finish our cigarettes. I immediately set out to bless the entire house with sacred oils and blessed salts. I had already done this as soon as we had unpacked the last of our things but I felt it necessary to do again. I went so far as to bless the entire porch as well. As husband and I are doing this, James texts me that he doesn't feel safe and that something isn't right. When I ask him what he means, he writes that just a few miles up the road, a naked man came charging out of the woods and stopped at the edge of the road. When he locked eyes with James, he simply pointed at the car and kept doing so until he was no longer visible in the rearview mirror. We tried to rationalize that it could be one of many non-paranormal scenarios. We thought it might be a prank, but that didn't quite make sense. It was the beginning of a very cold winter and it was only about 20 degrees out. It would have been a lot of effort and discomfort for this man to pull a prank like this on passing drivers. Then we wondered if the man needed help or was possibly in danger, but James was sure that this man did not look at all like he was in distress. 
If he was, the man would have yelled or tried flagging down the car instead of just pointing at it. The conclusion we came to, for the time being, was that he was most likely on some substances. We don't live in the safest of places, and hard substances are very common around here. Then James texted that he had picked up Danielle, and more weird things were happening. I asked him to elaborate, but he said that he would explain it all when they both got home. As their car pulled up in the driveway, husband and I went outside to meet them, but the two of them quickly got out of the car and rushed toward the house, telling us that we all needed to get inside immediately. When inside, James explained that right before he got to Danielle's place of work, he saw something in a cow field that he can't explain. It was tall, taller than any human could possibly be, and much taller than the thing that we had already seen behind the house. From what he could tell in the dark, it was gray, and it was running, running faster than he was driving at 60 miles per hour, on all fours. And then it ran into the woods out of sight. When he was driving back with Danielle, before James could explain everything that had already happened, she got a sinking feeling in her gut and made James lock all the car doors. A literal second after James complied, the same creature he had just seen was once again sprinting alongside the car. It was much closer to the road than it had just been minutes before, but it dashed again into the trees before they could get a really good look at it. We were all a bit shaken. It was now close to 1 a.m., and none of us could explain anything that had already happened. We tried to brush it all off, and we probably could have, if it was just one thing that had transpired instead of several. We made the awful decision to go back outside for a smoke, the kind of decision that only idiots in horror movies would make, I know. And that's when things got really weird. Off to our right, there's a small strip of woods that separates our property from our landlord's property, where he lives with his daughter, son-in-law, and granddaughters. In those trees, we notice three sets of eyes. They're glowing yellow-green, and they're just staring at us. Husband asks James if it could be deer, as we do tend to see a lot of those around, but we all knew that whatever those eyes belonged to were far taller than deer could be. Then, to our left, there's more, you guessed it, woods. From that direction, in the pitch dark, I swear I heard a little girl laugh. It wasn't boisterous or loud, more like the snicker that a child makes when they're trying to suppress their laughter. Danielle and husband didn't hear it, but James did. Now we're looking at the big tree to our left that stands just before the edge of the woods, and notice that there's this big black mass behind it, as though something was crouched next to the tree. We all try to rationalize that it's just a big bundle of leaves, but I don't think any of us really believed that. James and husband both dart back inside for a moment, and when they come back out, James is holding a hatchet, and husband is holding his crossbow. Without saying anything to Danielle or I, they step off the porch and walk toward our left, where the little girl laughed. Later, they told us that they thought a child was in trouble and they wanted to help. While Danielle and I were on the porch, trying to figure out what the heck was happening, we see something a few yards away. Down the driveway, there's a huge tree in the middle of the property. Out of our peripheral, we swore that we saw something duck from behind the tree. We kept looking at the tree, and yes, there was something poking its head up from behind the trunk, pulling back very quickly as soon as it realized we were staring at it. At this point, Danielle and I wanted to get inside. We're both shivering from fear and cold, and we just wanted this night to be over. But while Danielle and I were in a match of paranormal peekaboo, husband and James had their own very weird experience. For context, I have Tourette's syndrome. This means that I say and do things completely out of my control, and some of my verbal tics are just strange sounds. Some of those sounds include blowing raspberries 
or popping my lips, which are my two most common verbal tics at the moment. As James and husband are inching closer to the trees, they both hear footsteps through the grass and leaves within the trees. Both of them were too frightened to call out to whoever they thought was in there. Then they hear shuffling. The problem is though, they each hear shuffling coming from different directions that the other doesn't hear. James was walking to the left, husband to the right. James hears shuffling coming from the right, but husband doesn't hear it. But husband hears it coming from the left and James doesn't hear it. So they turn toward each other with their weapons drawn. In their confusion, while they're facing each other, they hear someone running in the woods, full on sprinting through the trees, heading directly toward them. And then it just stops. They take a step back and watch to see if anybody comes out of the woods. No one. But then they hear something in the woods. They hear me in the woods right in front of them. They heard both of my verbal tics. But the problem was, I was standing on the porch behind them. Without turning around, husband calls to me and asks if I just had a tick. I told him no. They back away from the woods without taking their eyes off of that spot until they're close enough to sprint into the house, pulling Danielle and I with them. Inside, Danielle and I are able to tell them about the thing behind the tree. And James and husband are able to tell us about how something mimicked my tics to a T. For the rest of the night, we didn't go back outside. We would all, against our better judgment, peek through the blinds out the back door when we passed it. There was still something in the woods every single time that one of us looked. I didn't get any sleep. Come morning time, husband and I checked all the places that we had seen or heard something, and there was no sign of anyone or anything. I asked my mother what she thought it might be. In her opinion, it was likely something related to a mimic spirit a spirit that warps reality to feed on fear, but not having enough power to really hurt anybody. She said that it couldn't be a skinwalker because there were too many things happening in too many different places all at once. Skinwalkers are solitary and territorial things, so it couldn't have been multiple of them. But just one mimic could do all the things we experienced. We still hear the occasional giggle in the dark, get a bang or a knock at our back door, we still even see the thing behind the big tree in the driveway almost every night. But that night was something else. I've seen some things in my life, but never, never have I gone through about three hours of nonstop activity. I've since burned sage all throughout the house and the entire perimeter of the property, as well as using the rest of my salt and oil around the entire house. Husband and I even did a late night EVP session at all of the spots that things had happened that night, but we didn't get a single response to any of our questions. I don't know for sure if it was a mimic spirit or if I can fully rule out a skinwalker. I don't even really know if the thing was dangerous or not. But one thing's for sure, I will never forget that night. My life was always crazy, but never did I think it was this crazy. This is my story. It was a summer day in 2011. I was 10 and my dad had gotten with his ex-girlfriend. That's a story for a different time. She had two boys. One was a year younger and the other one was older. I had a little brother as well. Now that you know the family, let me give you a little bit of background to this bone chilling story. My dad was searching for a house to rent after breaking things off with my biological mother, and he found this house, and what's crazy is that my name is Ashley, and it was off of Ashland Street. It seemed to be very cheap for the area. It was in a gated community, so of course it seemed very comfortable and safe. I mean, at least you'd think so. 
I moved with my dad into this house with his ex-girlfriend and her two boys. So there were four kids all together. We'll name them Kobe, the year younger, and Jerry, the older one, and then my little brother, Brandon. I have changed their names for privacy. It was an older house, so nothing brand new was built, but it was definitely pretty cheap. I mean, for a gated, high, middle-class neighborhood. We moved in. I don't remember the exact date, but it was in the summertime. I live in Vegas, so the heat is sometimes unbearable. One day it can be 99, and the next it's 104. My dad wakes me up and is really excited about moving out and just being free. My biological mother was a freeloader and a real piece of work. My dad and I picked up all our boxes and we went to the house. Now this is the first time that I was seeing it, but of course my dad did a tour with the landlord. So I went through the place picking my bedroom and all the fun things you do when you move into a brand new house. I shared a room with my baby brother, Brandon. He was like four or five at the time, so really young. I got the room I wanted, I guess out of the three I could have picked. It was a four bedroom, three bathroom house, two upstairs and one downstairs. The first night wasn't anything out of the ordinary. We got Little Caesars pizza and watched Cops, my dad's favorite TV show. We went to bed and woke up like normal and went on about our day. Again, still really normal, nothing crazy. The second night was just as normal. It was about a week into living in the house when things started to happen. It was almost like the ghosts wanted to make sure we stayed or something. How sweet. So it was more like night eight and I was walking up the stairs. I was alone in the house and the stairs had carpet. I walked up them and I swear I kept hearing somebody walking behind me. But every time I would turn around, nothing would be there. I just kind of kept it to myself and told myself I was just paranoid for being at the new house by myself. I was the type of kid that was scared of the dark and I still get scared easily to this day. I actually hate Halloween for that very reason. But these strange things just kept happening. The first spirit sighting was Kobe's birthday. He got a new spyware truck thing where you can put a camera on the toy truck and go around the house. It's kind of like a GoPro. Well, we decided to pull a prank on Jerry, so we put the camera in his room to prank him. He was asleep, so he would wake up and freak out that there was a camera. I mean, we were all under 12, so it was really funny to us, but that's not all I caught. I know the typical white woman in a white robe thing, I get it, but it was true. All we could see was a silhouette of a young woman probably in her late 20s or early 30s, standing over him. Of course, as the two young boys were so sweet, they had me go up to check myself. So of course I went upstairs, a little spooked, but trying not to overthink it. And I went into his room. Jerry was still asleep and there was no woman in there. So I came downstairs and told myself that there's probably a glitch in the camera that just made it seem like somebody was there. So we all let it go. As some of you probably know, when you move into a house, especially an older one, the floor creaks, and you might hear bumps in the night just because the furniture is settling, but only squeaks and creaks for a day or two. We kept hearing this noise, almost like somebody was walking up and down the stairs all the time. But again, we all just put it out of our heads and said that it was the house settling. Maybe something fell. No matter what, we would try to find an explanation for the situation. But over time, it just got worse. My dad had signed an 18-month lease agreement, but we only stayed there for four. Because this is when things got absolutely crazy. I went off to school. I was in the fifth grade. I had to repeat the second grade, hence why I was in the fifth grade at 10 years old. Anyway, my school was definitely a walkable distance, so I walked to school and back home. 
I got home one day and my dad's girlfriend was at work, and so was my dad. Kobe and Jerry were at their grandma's and Brandon was still in school, so I was all alone in the house. When I walked in, it was like something out of a horror movie. Picture this. You get home from a stressful day at school, and when you open the door, it literally looks like somebody has robbed the place. The stove was on. Yes, the stove like literal fire, was on. Of course, my immediate reaction was to call my dad and tell him what was going on. As I got into the kitchen, all the cabinet doors were open and most of the plates were on the ground, shattered. There was glass everywhere, even on the carpet. Thank God we didn't have any animals at the time. My dad, of course, got home with the cops and the cops came in and did an investigation all to find out that there was no foul play, so there was nothing anybody could really do. So of course, my dad's now ex-girlfriend blames me, but I told her that I didn't do it, that I came home to this. Unfortunately, my dad played right into her crap and believed her, so I was grounded for breaking her plates and causing a fire. I was so mad, but I was 10. What was I gonna do, run away? I kept trying to convince my dad that I didn't do this, but pretty soon he wouldn't need any convincing. While we were all downstairs playing and talking one day, upstairs in my parents' bedroom, there were three loud booms, all at one after the other, just boom, boom, boom. My dad and his now ex and myself all ran up the stairs to find that my parents' bed was broken. It almost looked like somebody had jumped on it really hard and that's how it broke. The mattress was caved into the bed frame. I just looked at my dad with a cocky attitude and said, so did I do that too? My dad actually apologized to me that night, but not his girlfriend. She never liked me, but that was another story, like I said. Under the staircase, we had storage. The door to that slammed, but the AC unit was close by the door. So I had just thought that maybe somebody had left it open and the wind had pushed it shut. It wasn't a very heavy door. The next night was definitely one of the scariest nights of my life. It was around 8 p.m. and we were all settling down for the night. I had school the next morning as everybody was going to bed. It was around 10 going on 11. As I was about to sit on the bed, I heard two knocks on the door. I could see a shadowy impression of feet under the door, so when I opened it, it was confusing to see nobody there. I closed it again, thinking that it had to be one of my brothers playing a mean trick on me. Again, I scare easily, so that was their thing. I heard the knocks again, and like the first time, I opened it. But nothing was there, and I didn't hear anybody run away. I went to Kobe's room. He was fast asleep. Then I went to Jerry's room, but he was still awake. He told me he didn't knock or anything and that he'd been in his room the whole entire time, but I didn't really believe him. I had no choice to just go back to my room and try to relax. Probably about another hour went by with nothing, no knocking or anything. But just as I had closed my eyes, I heard it again. I stood right by my door for about 10 minutes until the knocking happened again, and I immediately opened the door. Absolutely nothing. And then, in the silent darkness, I heard a giggle. I looked around the corner, and there was nothing there. Everybody was asleep, and nobody would have had time to get back to their bedroom. I just went to bed. I wanted it to be over so badly. The next morning, I tried to tell my dad what was happening, but he said I was just dreaming. I looked at him and said, so was the kitchen and the fire and the bed. That was all a dream too, right? Because we're all either having some really crazy Jumanji stuff happening or there's more to it. My dad just shrugged it all off and told me to get ready for school. So I did. Probably about another week later, I ended up staying the night at a friend's house. I'll call her Emma, just again for privacy reasons. So after school, I took the bus back to Emma's house. I decided to confide in her about what had been going on. 
Her mother was a medium, so I guess she could, like, speak to the souls that hadn't crossed over or something. Or, as she would say, departed. When I came in close contact with her, she looked at me with fear in her eyes. It was like she knew what was going on before I even told her. She told me that I had a very negative soul attached to me. It was a female soul. And all I could think was maybe it was my dad's ex or even my biological mother. Two really horrible females. But she said that it wasn't anybody I knew closely. And that's when I started to piece everything together. The woman standing over the bed. The fire. The bed breaking. The knocking. The giggling. It somehow all made sense in some way. This spirit was stuck. But my question was, how did she get there in the first place? My dad picked me up the morning after, and I discussed with him what I had kind of put together. He said maybe the landlord would know more, so I told my dad to give him a call and tell him the pipe was loose or something so he could come over and have a conversation. You know, trick him, I guess. If he doesn't want to go into detail about it, he's definitely not going to over the phone. My dad agreed, and a few hours later the landlord arrived. My dad called me downstairs and we decided to go over everything with him, from the fire to the glass to the bed breaking to the woman standing over the bed. All the color drained from his face, and I immediately knew that he knew something. As we were all talking downstairs in the living room, there was this mirror on the wall in front of us over the television. We're sitting on the couch and as I looked up, I saw a lady wearing a very tall, almost like black witch hat, and she had very long gray hair. She just looked off, like I knew from somewhere, but didn't at the same time. Of course, I reacted very startled, and my dad told me to relax. Like, yeah, dad, let me just relax while all this stuff keeps happening. Why don't I just tell the ghost to make us a campfire as well? He didn't find it funny and sent me to my room. The landlord eventually left and fewer questions were answered. It was like he didn't want to say anything. Like our house almost blew up into flames and there was glass all over the kitchen. This isn't the time for secrets. Anyway, we looked up the address on a background search for properties and we only found two things that could have been connected to this haunting. The first thing was that the entire neighborhood had been built on a Native American burial ground, but that seemed a little cliché, so we kept digging. And then we found something even sadder. A young couple was there. They had lived there once. They had two children. One day, out of nowhere, the dad came home drunk. He shot his wife and two kids, and then set the house on fire and shot himself. Unfortunately, the house did burn to the ground and their remains were never found, so nobody knew who they were. It made total sense. The fire that started, the loud booms, the knocking. It was a sick memory that I'll never forget. I really hope that family rests in peace. At least the wife and the kids. I can't imagine being taken out like that by your own father and husband. Anyway... That was the haunted house on Ashland Street. I've never been back since we moved out, and I'll never go back again. So let me start by saying that my brother and I are extremely experienced desert campers, and we have lived near deserts pretty much our whole lives. I have never in my 20 years of life ever for one second believed in anything paranormal or anything to do with evil spirits. Unlike my brother, who has always sensed presences and been able to see mostly what we call jinn, also known as demons. Last night, though, Things changed for me, and it marks the last time that we'll be camping alone in the desert. We've always had the same place we like to go whenever we want to camp with minimal effort. Our day started as normal as ever, but as we got closer and closer to our destination, I saw my brother's mood completely shift. When I asked what was wrong, 
He just shrugged me off and told me to just keep driving. When we arrived, I felt completely fine, but my brother was still unusually quiet. It was around 1 p.m. at that point, and we were planning on leaving at about 12 to 1 in the morning. Because of the heat, we made the terrible decision to set up under a few trees and a source of water, which in the Middle Eastern culture where we live is where the jinns live at night. Not that I believed in that at the time, of course. However, we still set up our camp and continued on as normal. Now, my brother always says that when he feels a presence, or several in this case, he gets extremely unlucky. First, he almost dropped a box of coals on his foot. Then he spilled an entire bottle of Coke on his phone. Then he dropped it into the sand and proceeded to smash his elbow on the edge of the chair he was sitting on. His elbow is now very swollen. And last, but certainly not least, when he was looking through one of our boxes, he felt something cold and sharp right against his arm. He realized it was an unsheathed knife, which we packed with its case the previous night before. And later he said that it felt like something had pushed his hand into it, right where his veins are. All of these events consecutively occurred within a matter of a few hours, which made us both uneasy, and I, for the life of me, could not figure out why he was suddenly so unlucky. As I was starting to question his clumsiness, a random couple appeared out of nowhere, informing us that they were stuck in the sand and needed help. We drive a land cruiser and they had a Nissan Altima, so we didn't expect to encounter as many issues as we did. We first dug them out without any issues, but as we pushed them out of the sand, they got stuck again. If you know anything about dune bashing or desert camping, then you understand the physics behind how wheels get stuck in sand, and the way this Nissan was stuck was incredibly unusual. It was literally stuck somewhere with plenty of space available for grip, and later my brother said that as we were digging them out of the sand, that's when he really started to feel like an evil presence was around us. But he didn't want to say anything and ruin the trip and freak me out. We ended up having to tow them out of the sand, which again was much harder than it should have been. First, our tow strap broke off of their bumper. The tow strap cost $200 and was fine, but their bumper was slightly damaged. Then we almost got stuck ourselves in a 20 minute job that took more like 90 which again was extremely unusual, and with hindsight just the beginning of all the crap to come. When we came back to our camp, we noticed how everything around us had gotten unusually quiet. The area we were in has hundreds of birds around, and as far as we have seen, three cats who sometimes pay us a visit. But there wasn't a single noise at all, other than our fire, which was dying out unusually quickly. It had gotten dark so fast that we had to scramble to build a fire to cook our dinner before we were asked to help the couple. And I had noticed the silence, but it didn't bother me. My brother suddenly grabbed my hand as we were sitting down to eat and said with clear fear in his voice that we should get going as quickly as possible, that he didn't feel safe. To ease both of our minds, we prayed. We are both Christian, so of course, we thought it would help, but I think it accelerated everything that happened and just made whatever was there angry. We quickly finished our dinner, and me being the skeptic, I was completely fine staying there, but I wanted to humor my brother. But that's when I started getting the nagging feeling that it was time to pack up and leave. It hit me like a wave, and I was quite taken aback by the feeling. So I voiced it to my brother, and he agreed that we should pack up right away and leave. We started packing up at a normal pace, like we were just tired and wanted to go. And that's when we heard a sound very close to us, on the opposite side of the pond, which wasn't that big, that I could only describe as the sound of death itself. It seemed to go on for several minutes, and when I say that we looked at each other in absolute fear, I genuinely mean it. I was about to have a heart attack right then and there. 
At that point, after being frozen for a few minutes, and quite reasonably so, after hearing that bellowing screech so close to us, we turned on the car, drove it back so we could see better with the headlamps, and just started throwing everything into the car without much care, but with a whole lot of urgency. After the screaming, everything hit the fan. First it was the sound of twigs snapping and footsteps all around us. Then it was the shadows behind the trees. I tried everything to get those shadows to change shape. Walking around the trees and moving lights, but nothing. It looked like there were people just staring at us the whole time. You could really feel it too. We genuinely felt like we were not alone and that we weren't with friendly entities either. We also noticed that all three cats were huddled right behind our car, away from the trees. So they were not the ones snapping the twigs. At that moment, I was really hoping they were going to move so I could get us out of there safely. And thankfully, when we slowly started to reverse, they took a hint. But they looked absolutely terrified and were just staring at the trees too. It felt like whatever was there was getting closer. I've never felt anything like it. It was a gut feeling. It was just one of those natural instincts you can't ignore. Thankfully, we were able to pack up quickly. Our tent was very close to the trees though, so that was a nerve wracking experience. And while we were packing, it was still very silent. It's very normal for the birds around that area to continue making sounds until two or three in the morning. And at this point, it was about 8 p.m., so highly unusual. I personally think I was most terrified as I was driving back onto the main dirt path to leave the desert. I know cars very well. I know how they drive in the sand. And I know our car especially well, because we've had it for so long. I could instantly tell that the steering was off and completely fighting against me. This fixed itself the second we were on the highway. The sounds of twigs snapping was still all around us, and it was loud enough to be heard over the sound of the car. On the path was what seemed like every bird in the area, just standing there and staring at us until we got close enough to force them to walk, not even fly, away. At one point, my brother just grabbed my shoulder and told me very sternly to just keep looking in front of me and under no circumstances to look through his window. It was the tone of voice that told me to listen to him for the love of God. We were in a part of the desert where we had to pretty much drive through the whole of the accessible areas to get onto the highway again, and there wasn't a single person around us. The only thing we saw was a very clearly abandoned Toyota, positioned behind a small dune and hidden by the trees but was far enough from our campsite to easily rule out as the source of the original screech. The worst thing I saw as we were closing to the exit was that we saw in the middle of the path, staring directly at us, a deer. A deer. I have only seen one deer in 16 years of living here, and that was in someone's garden as a pet. It's safe to say that I was in complete shock the deer was just not moving at all until I got close enough that we could practically smell the thing before it slowly walked off the path while looking right at us. We quickly moved past the deer and again my brother, with a grasp of my shoulder and a stern voice, said to keep my eyes right on the road. I asked him later as we got onto the highway what it was that he kept seeing and he very reluctantly told me that he kept seeing large figures around us any time we went through a bend, and they were all either pointing right at us or ahead of us. I'm glad he didn't tell me at the time because I probably would have crapped myself. We still hadn't encountered anyone, but we still very clearly heard sounds all around us. And again, not the usual bird or cat, but big, unrelenting sounds. When I saw the exit, I was as happy as I have ever been. But that quickly faded when once again, we saw another deer standing right in the middle of the road, slowly walking away and looking right at us. But this time it didn't really look like a deer. 
It was more like a kangaroo mixed with a deer, and its eyes were milky. It looked rotten and horrible. I didn't much care, I just stepped on the gas, and fortunately it got out of the way in time. When you exit the desert, you can either turn right onto a long stretch of highway, or you can go left and go through a small town, then take the back streets to a parallel highway. As I was about to turn right, my brother once again, with that same tone of voice, said to go to the town. Later, he said once again that he saw a line of figures pointing ahead of us, so if we would have gone the other way, we probably wouldn't have made it home in one piece. Thankfully, as we made it farther and farther away and closer to our home, the gut feeling of being watched was going away. And of course, having never experienced something like this before, I was distraught and wanted to talk about it. My brother told me as we were going home that because we were alone, the djinn wanted to mess with us, that they wanted to scare us and most likely cause us harm. And that the way they get you into such rural places is to force you to stop and then do whatever they want, which makes sense as to why there were so many animals blocking our path. He also said that they caused bad luck, and he could feel them the second we entered the desert, which explains his clumsiness all day, and the car that got stuck in such an unusual manner. Because he's my younger brother by three years, any time he had ever told me about this sort of thing before, I always just dismissed it as him scaring himself. I can excuse the sounds we heard and the shadows we saw last night. I can excuse the gut feeling as just being scared, but I cannot excuse the two deer we saw staring right at us, and I cannot excuse the car just randomly fighting against me as I was driving. The deer completely freaked me out, as did the tone of my brother's voice. It's safe to say we're not going camping there again, and it's also safe to say that I will never dismiss my brother when it comes to this kind of thing again. I'm so thankful to God that he was there and that we made it home safely. Not Dear For my college screenwriting class, we were split into groups four students each for a group project. The assignment was to select a myth or legend to base a 10 to 15 page screenplay on. My group thought it would be interesting to choose a cryptid for the project rather than a well-known historical myth or legend. Our teacher cleared us for the idea and we started brainstorming. Of course, we didn't want to do the most well-known cryptids like the Loch Ness Monster or Bigfoot so we started looking up some lesser known ones. One of the ones that somebody pitched was known as the Knot Deer, in some cases the Night Deer. According to people's stories, it looked almost exactly like a large deer, but something felt horribly off. Only when they drove away did they realize what was specifically wrong about it. Still, even before they understood exactly what was going on, Every story mentioned the overwhelming sense of wrongness. Quoting someone else's personal account, quote, It was a deer in the way that a graveyard is a playground. You can treat it as such, I guess, but it won't feel the same. End quote. Lo and behold, after a bit of research, I found out it was located in North Carolina. Not only that, but it was just over an hour away. Just about every written or publicized story of the Knot Deer supposedly took place in Boone, North Carolina and its surrounding areas. I informed the group of what I had discovered and, being spontaneous as I am, told them I would be driving out to the location that very night. I figured I probably wouldn't come across anything, even though I was legitimately curious. At the very least, it was something interesting to do and I'd be able to accurately describe the location and ambience of the area to the main screenwriter. 
I wasn't able to convince the other three members of my group to go with me. They all had their legitimate reasons, and since I made the decision to go so suddenly, I understood why none of them wanted to go with me on the trip. Still, I had nothing else to do that night, and I had been itching for more travel ever since the entire pandemic started. I filled my roommate in on everything and asked if he wanted to go with me. At first, he told me that he would just consider it, but as I was getting ready to go, he told me that he had decided to tag along. One of his main reasons for doing so was that he felt like he had to go with me. I shrugged it off, not thinking much of what he said. After filling up my car with some extra gas and buying a couple of snacks for the road, I plugged Boone, North Carolina into my GPS, and I headed out. My roommate and I were pretty relaxed for the majority of the ride there. We joked around, listened to all sorts of music through the radio and CD player, and had some of whatever snacks we had bought earlier. Eventually, we got close to Boone. That's when we started to feel like something was off. It wasn't a feeling strong enough to make us want to turn around, but it was worth mentioning to each other. When we got into the city, it was just about what we imagined. Gas stations, car dealerships, dollar stores, and small cafes. All of them were closed at the time, with our arrival in Boone being at around 9.10 p.m., but all of them were well lit and unintimidating. My roommate told me that we should probably head back at about 9.30, and that he would let me know when that time came around. I agreed with him since I didn't want to spend too long searching for an experience. Needless to say, when we didn't come across anything by 9.30, he decided to let us keep going for another half hour. The clock in my car's dash had been broken for a while now, and I couldn't look at my phone while I was driving, so I was totally reliant on him for the time. Had I known that we were going to be driving in the area past 9.30, I probably would have mentioned it and turned around sooner. Had I done that, I would have completely missed the experience we ended up having. I'm still unsure whether or not that would have been a good thing. We ended up in Tennessee by 9.50. That's when things started to get really bad. At this point, we rarely came across any other cars on the highway. We took the first exit we saw and ended up driving along more mountainous, forested roads. This meant that there were lots of tall, dark trees, almost no streetlights, and twisting roads that forced you to slow down. My roommate said he started to feel bad about the whole situation, and I agreed wholeheartedly. Still, there was nowhere to turn, so we continued going straight, since that was really the only option for the time being. A few different times, we got a serious sense of dread, but usually that feeling disappeared by the time we got onto the next section of the road. There were a couple of times that the both of us had started to tear up, not because we were sad or upset, but because it felt so wrong to be there, like it was somewhere we were not supposed to be. The feeling of dread was very particular too, it wasn't feeling bad in the sense of depression or anxiety. The best way to describe it is just that sense of wrongness. It came in waves, not sticking around for a long time, but not going away entirely either. By this point, my GPS had stopped working entirely. Both my roommate's phone and my phone said that they had full bars, but mine simply refused to connect to anything. Luckily, his GPS still worked fine, so he plugged in the directions for home. It continued taking us down that road for a while longer. The area started to become much more forested as we went on, and the road started to twist and turn much more than it had before. Basically, we had come across the exact area where you would expect a monster to be. We started to feel really, really bad. I don't think I can express the feeling well enough with words, but it was the worst we had felt so far. But we knew something wasn't right. We both felt like we just weren't supposed to be there, and we felt like we had to get out. Since my roommate started getting truly spooked, 
That put me on edge even more, since he never gets scared by anything. There wasn't much we could do about it, though. The GPS still wanted us to follow the road, so we both awaited its next directions, eager to get on the highway back home. The sense of dread still came and went with every other segment of road that we crossed. Eventually, the GPS wanted us to turn. My roommate told me to turn right on that road. I knew he meant to turn right onto the road and follow it straight ahead, but for some reason I figured we should just turn around and backtrack. I started slowing down, and we both started to feel the absolute worst we'd ever felt. Like, things are very wrong and something was about to happen. My roommate said that my eyes were glazed over, and I kept saying something along the lines of, I just need to turn around right here, over and over. The more I said it, the quieter I got, until it was just, I just need to turn around right here. Keep in mind that I am normally a fairly loud person, and I had been loud the entire drive up until this point. I pulled off onto a gravel dip on the side of the road. Along the gravel dip was a thin chicken wire fence, shiny and silver. Back on the road behind us was a wall of dirt and rock. We were surrounded by tall, dark trees that blocked most of the night sky. Even with the headlights on, it was very difficult to see far ahead. He said very forcefully that we couldn't stop and we needed to keep going because he felt really bad, but I wasn't listening to him. I wasn't quite processing what he was saying, and for some reason, I was having a difficult time hearing him at all. After he realized he wasn't getting through to me, he broke into a literal shout and told me that we had to get out of there. We could not stop, and we could not go back that way. It took him using his road rage voice to snap me out of it and get me to speed down the road. The only word I can use to describe what I felt in that moment was absolute terror. Even as I was slowing down, I felt it get worse and worse until it was almost overwhelming. I only realized that after we had gotten out of the area and back onto the highway. As we passed through the area and started getting into the city again, the looming sense of dread started to fade away. By the time we got onto the main highway, we felt safe again. But in the moment that I pulled off onto the gravel dip on the road, where I had almost stopped the car entirely, that was the most terrifying experience I've ever had in my life. I would bet my life savings that had we turned around, we would have seen something that we never wanted to. Both of us admitted to tearing up as we drove off from that spot. I was much more shaken up than my roommate was, and it took me a little while to fully process what had actually happened. I think it's safe to say that even though I didn't explicitly see anything for myself, I found exactly what I was looking for.